I'm calling to order this uh, hearing. This is a public hearing of the Committee of the Whole. I am Phil Mendelson, Chairman of the Council and Chair of the Committee of the Whole. Today is Friday, May 9th, 2014. The time is 1028. In the morning, we are in room 500 of the Council Chambers of the Johnny Wilson Building. Uh, today's hearing concerns the uh, budget for the uh, next fiscal year and uh, also uh, some um, reorganization, if you will, of the budget for the current fiscal year. More particularly, what we have before us at today's hearing is Bill 20-749, the Fiscal Year 2015 Budget Request Act of 2014, Bill 20-750, the Fiscal Year 2015 Budget Support Act of 2014, and Bill 20-751, the Fiscal Year 2014 Revised Budget Request Emergency Adjustment Act of 2014. Uh, today's hearing is on the Mayor's proposed budget for fiscal year 2015, which begins on October 1st of this year. More specifically, the hearing is on Bills 20-749, the, the Budget Request Act, which comprises the budget itself. That's the Budget Request Act, or BRA. And then on the Board Budget Support Act, or BSA, uh, the Budget Support Act consists of new law and amendments of existing law that are necessary or relevant to support or implement the budget. For example, uh, providing an agency with grant-making authority or establishing a special fund to account for a particular revenue source. The Mayor submitted these acts to the Council on April 3rd. Along with the Fiscal Year 2015 Budget, that's the Budget Request Act and the Budget Support Act, the Mayor also submitted Bill 20-751, the Fiscal Year 2014 Revised Budget Request Emergency Adjustment Act of 2014, which uh, we often refer to uh, that kind of legislation as a supplemental budget, this being the Fiscal Year 2014 Supplemental. The, uh, I believe that uh, today's hearing is the last hearing that um, the Council is having with regard to the proposed budget. Um, the Council is scheduled to vote on the Fiscal Year 2015 Budget Request Act on May 28th. In fact, uh, first reading on all of these bills on May 28th. In past years, the District Charter and the Home Rule Act provided that the Budget Request Act would receive only one vote, unlike other permanent acts, which require two votes, and that's because in past years the Budget Request Act has been just that, a request to Congress to appropriate our dollars. However, this is the first year of budget development in which we are operating under the Budget Autonomy Act, which was approved by voters on April 23rd last year and became effective January 1st this year. And under the Budget Autonomy Act, the budget must receive two votes, just like all regular acts of the Council. The second vote must, must take place within 70 days of the Mayor's transmittal, and we have scheduled that for June 11th. So first reading on May 28th and second reading on June 11th. I am sure that many who are here or who are watching this hearing are aware that there is currently lit litigation pending in the U.S. District Court regarding the Budget Autonomy Act. Um, the reason why we have gone to court with regard to this is because uh, the executive and the chief financial officer have questioned whether the Budget Autonomy Act is valid law. We, the council, believes that it is, and uh, we are compelled to comply with the law as it was adopted. Uh, we, are, we feel strongly enough in our arguments and that we're certainly willing to test our arguments, which is why we went into court uh, seeking a declaratory judgment. Um, we expect that we will win in, in the litigation and will proceed with the schedule of May 28th and June 11th for first and second readings. If we lose, we will have a single vote on the Budget Request Act, uh, which is required under the old law to occur within 56 days of its transmittal. That is no later than May 29th, which means that our May 28th schedule works. Um, all of the parties in the litigation are in agreement as to the importance of settling the matter early enough so that we have enough time to use whichever procedure the court decides is correct. Although, again, the council feels strongly that the Budget Autonomy Act was uh, appropriately or properly adopted and enacted. Um, the, regardless of for one reading, two readings, whatever, the council's role in reviewing, reviewing the mayor's budget uh, this year is no different than it's been in past years. That is, in the weeks since the mayor transmitted the budget, the various council committees have held numerous hearings 
on the budgets of agencies under their purview. The committees began with this on, I believe it was April 7th, and are concluding this week. The committees are now drafting their reports on the budget, and they will be marking up those reports next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. The schedule for those markups is available in the Council's Office of the Budget Director, which is on this floor, the fifth floor. And also that schedule for the markups is posted on the Council's website. I do expect, if the past is any indication, that there will be some rescheduling of those markups, but they will all occur next week. After all the committee budget reports have been adopted, and prior to the Council's votes on the Budget Request Act and Budget Support Act, Council members will meet informally in a work session to discuss the committee's budget recommendations, and that meeting, as has been our practice over the last several years, will be televised in accordance with uh, our open meeting law. Uh, the budget that was submitted to us by the mayor and which is before us is based on the Office of the Chief Financial Officer's revenue estimate dated February 27, 2014. I might note that's one of the reasons why we want budget autonomy, because the fiscal year starts in October and the budget's based on the uh, estimates from February. The proposed operating budget for fiscal year 2015 is $12.6 billion in gross funds and the mayor's proposed capital budget is $1.375 billion. That's for next year. Uh, I want to note some big picture aspects of the proposed budget legislation that are of concern. Most of these observations are points that I have made, uh, that I made when the budget was formally presented to us at our April 7th hearing. Uh, and now that we've had the benefit of several weeks reviewing the proposed fiscal year 2015 budget, I am even more certain uh, that the Council's work to safeguard the public fisc will require bold steps and creative, uh, uh, though responsible, policy making. And although I said several concerns, I think they're basically two. First, the fiscal year two th uh, 2014, the current year supplemental budget, would roll forward $105 million to fiscal year 2015 in order to balance the 2015 budget. In other words, revenues certified for fiscal year 2015, revenues that we expect to receive in 2015, are not by themselves sufficient to fund all of the proposed fiscal year 2015 spending. Without setting aside some current year revenues, that's the $105 million that's being rolled forward from 2014 to 2015. Uh, essentially, that's um, a structurally imbalanced, unbalanced budget. Um, this would not be the first time that the district has taken such a step, but I don't believe that this practice is wise. I don't believe it is prudent. It is based on the optimism that our revenues will continue to grow, and in the current economic climate, that may be correct. However, it doesn't change the fact that the budget for fiscal year 2015 <laughs> requires more money than is actually going to be brought in in 2015 and in that way is not balanced. Um, inflating a fiscal year's revenues uh, by using previous year's revenues may create a time bomb in future years as the increase in the district's revenues is compressed and may not be adequate to cover the natural costs of inflation. And this leads to my second area of concern. As noted in the Chief Financial Officer's certification letter that accompanied the budget when we received it April 3rd, the financial plan, that's the four-year plan, is balanced on the assumption that the fiscal year 2016 spending on non-personal services, such as government programs, contracts, and subsidies, will actually be 8% less than they will be in fiscal year 2015. Uh, I don't believe we've ever seen that to be the case uh, in um, a growing economy. And um, there is no comprehensive plan uh, identified in the budget that will allow the district to provide the same or better services with fewer resources, nor is there any corresponding drop in services identified in the budget. Uh, this is simply an assumption that the district can continue to provide the same services as it has been and as it's proposed to do in 2015, uh, but with a negative growth rate in the costs for contracts, supplies, and material, subsidies, and so forth. Since a negative growth rate is, some, is, is an odd thing to see in a financial plan, especially given that the district's revenues are not projected to fall, 
I am concerned about the practicality of this assumption. I should say I'm concerned about the prudence of this assumption. If the financial plan is to be a reasonable guide to future expenditures, it must be based on achievable savings and an honest assessment of how much it costs to provide services. Similarly, in the capital budget, uh, we have to be honest with ourselves and with the public about how reasonable our expectations are. As council members are aware, the district is bound by a 12% debt cap, the purpose of which is to ensure that we spend within our means when making capital investments. And I might note in that regard that when the legislation was adopted uh, that uh, put in place the 12% debt cap, initially it was proposed at 11%. 11% or 12% is still considerably higher than what we see in other jurisdictions, but we understand that we have a great deal of deferred maintenance and that in addition, uh, the district is unique being a city, county, and state. Um, under the proposed capital investment plan, our debt in fiscal year 2018 will peak at 11.989% of operating expenditures. That is a 0.011% uh, below the debt cap. I mean, that is hair thin. This means, in effect, that we have no flexibility in the debt cap for new projects or initiatives unless we look at reducing some of the proposed borrowing under the uh, capital improvement plan. And in order to stay under the debt cap, our capital spending will drop precipitously. This is in the financial plan. In order to stay within that 12% cap, which we are at within 0.011% of the cap in 2018, um, thereafter, capital spending will have to drop precipitously, uh, I should say beginning in 2018. Uh, from $1.375 billion proposed borrowing or spending, I, I should say proposed spending, in fiscal year 2015. I'll repeat that number, $1.375 billion capital spending this coming year, dropping to $761 million. My math is a little rough, but my guess is that's about a 40% drop uh, in order to stay within the cap in fiscal year 2018. Uh, meanwhile, in fiscal year 2018, we will be spending just under $860 million in interest payments. That's debt service. Um, we will be spending, according to this plan, more on debt service than we would be on the operating budget of some of our major agencies. For instance, we would spend more in debt service in 2018 under the mayor's proposed budget, spending more in 2018 on interest than we will be protecting public safety through the budget of the Metropolitan Police Department. Uh, another way to look at it is that we will be spending more in 2018 than we will be able to spend on actual capital projects that year. Capital spending will be less than the debt service for all of the borrowing that we have done for capital. This is very troublesome. I look forward to uh, working, uh, let me just say, and this is the predicate in my view for the council having to look um, quite seriously at the budget for th that we have before us and seeing whether there are some changes that we will have to make that may not be pleasant to make, but if we want to continue with uh, being fiscally sound and in fact improving our financial strength, then I think that we have to um, really uh, adhere to uh, wise financial practice, both in terms of our capital improvement plan and our borrowing and in our um, forecasting of spending in the out years. I look forward to working with all members to create a budget that reflects the shared priorities of the council, the mayor, and that is in the best interests of the city. In the next two and a half weeks, council members will be working to resolve these issues, the issues that have been identified. After the committees mark up the budgets next week for the agencies under their purview, the council will meet uh, informally the following week. We'll meet May 28th to uh, 
adopt on first reading a budget and June 11th, the second reading to transmit the budget to the mayor for his signature at that time. It is my intent um, to revise this budget in a way that allows us to provide the many services that our residents expect without overextending our finances. We've learned the hard way that expenditures must be based on available resources and not based on hopes for future windfalls. Um, I'm going to call on other colleagues who are here uh, five minutes for opening statements. Uh, Mr. Grasso, and then uh, thank you Bonds. very much, Chairman Mendelson. I don't have an opening statement. Thank you, Councilmember Bonds. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I don't really have an opening statement, but I am here to um, hear from our witnesses and get an idea of what they think our budget really should be looking like um, in today's modern world. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Bonds. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask witnesses to come forward four at a time. Uh, they'll be on a four-minute clock, and that doesn't mean that when the four minutes are up, you then get to wind down for another minute, uh, because we have 49 witnesses, 48 before we get to the executive. And I appreciate, Mr. Goulet, that you are here to hear the testimony. Uh, Nancy Shia, if she is here, Shia, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing. Uh, Bruce McCaig, if you'd come forward, Cosby Hunt. Mr. Hunt here. Uh, Mr. McCaig is representative of this neighborhood. He has a face, talking pictures. And Mr. Hunt is manager of teaching and learning, Center for Inspired Teaching. Mary Levy, if you'd come forward. Uh, and uh, Jenny Reed, if Ms. Reed is here, if you'd come forward. Uh, and she is policy director at the DC Fiscal Policy Institute. Uh, if I'm good, I'll repeat this a number of times throughout the hearing. There's a black box with three colored uh, lights on top of it. That will count down the time. Again, you have four minutes each. I believe uh, it will turn to yellow when you have one minute left. There might be one chime, and then there will be several chimes when your time is up. I have no idea if you all agree with each other. It's just more efficient to have you up four at a time. Mr. McCaig, we'll begin with you. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. A little better, sorry. My name is still Bruce McKegg. I'm still a visual artist. I teach over at Georgetown University, and I'm a curator at large in our city. I'm here today to offer my support for the DC Humanities Council and the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. I'm currently privileged to be uh, running three public art projects in our city, all in near southeast, collectively known as This Place Has a Voice. Uh, geographically, we're looking at from the Navy Yard over to the stadium, uh, from the New River Walk uh, up towards um, Pennsylvania, more or less. The grant from the Humanities Council enabled us to engage a local historian. So thanks to her research, we've been able to layer some of the materials we're coming up with with their uh, cultural backgrounds. There's a team of artists that are producing uh, Diverse works, there are sculptors, videographers, photographers, writers, drawers, installation and performance artists. Uh, producing works that we'll begin sharing with the public at the end of this month, there is a cube in Canal Park that's equipped with AV equipment. We'll start nightly projections um, as a new permanent feature in our city. Uh, the website, of course, uh, is another conduit to access this, as well as sculptures that will be placed permanently on 10 selected street poles uh, throughout that same area. I thought that uh, that's kind of the global picture there. Uh, collecting these oral histories, artifacts, photographs, uh, and passing them along. Uh, what I wanted to share with you uh, this morning was two very short examples of works that are happening thanks to this funding. Uh, working with Mara Cherkasky, the historian, one of the components to this work is called Then and Now. She's uncovered some 280 historical photographs within those streets, and I'm currently going back to those locations and photographing the way they look today. The goal is to construct a virtual map that will allow people to travel geographically, bird's eye view to street view through those streets, sometimes interior view, sometimes exterior. 
but also to be able to scroll and travel through time in the, that area, seeing how it's developed since 1799 when the Navy Yard first decided to settle there. Um, an example of work from there, Half and N Street, southeast in August of 1951, was Max's Market, a single story corner convenience store. If you walk to Half and N Street today, you're standing in front of the entrance to the new baseball stadium. So we have a lot of works that are coming out of that in photography. The other example I wanted to share with you this morning, I was privileged to take a walk with Mr. James Stoddard. He's lived in that neighborhood for 70 years. And as we stood at one point on a grassy patch, he was reminiscing about that's where on Sundays the community would gather bringing tables and food and sharing their stories. And after he reminisced, he paused and then added, I've never told anyone that before. And it's funding through the DC Humanities Council and the DC Commission on Arts Humanities that allows us artists to be out in these neighborhoods uncovering these cultural nuggets, finding ways to package and distribute them back into the communities that gave them to us. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. McKay. Uh, Mr. Hunt? Good morning, Chairman Mendelson and members of the DC City Council. Thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of the work of the Office of Planning, specifically the Historic Preservation Office. My name is Cosby Hunt, and I am the manager of teaching and learning for Center for Inspired Teaching. I'm also a resident of Ward 5. Center for Inspired Teaching has received grants from the Humanities Council of Washington, DC, which is funded in part by the Historic Preservation Office. The Historic Preservation Office provides valuable funding for the Council's DC Community Heritage Project, which helps residents research, document, and educate the public on the rich cultural history of our city. Bruce knows it well. In recent years, the Humanities Council has provided support for several of Center for Inspired Teaching's innovative programs to bring inquiry-based instruction to classrooms across DC. The Humanities Council recently funded a youth documentary project at the Inspired Teaching Demonstration Public Charter School, in which students worked with local filmmakers to tell stories through documentary filmmaking. The piece, which premiered at the Phillips Collection as part of the Young Artists Exhibition, allowed teachers and students alike to explore new technologies and tools to tell community stories. The Humanities Council has also supported Inspired Teaching's programs at the high school level through the Who's a Washingtonian grant, one part of the Humanity Council's efforts to foster conversation and connection between residents of Washington, D.C. The funding the Historic Preservation Office provides to the Humanities Council allows organizations like Center for Inspired Teaching to relate the history and culture of every neighborhood and to make that history accessible to future generations. The support of the Humanities Council makes it possible for Center for Inspired Teaching to create student-centered projects that challenge students to think creatively and independently about real world problems and solutions. Through these efforts, the Humanities Council and Center for Inspired Teaching are enabling students to build their imaginations as well as their intellects, both of which students will need to thrive in the 21st century. Center for Inspired Teaching is proud to partner with the DC Humanities Council, and I will be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hunt. Ms. Levy, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Mary Levy, and uh, I would like to thank the chairman for having the political courage to tell us all things that we don't want to hear, but that we very much need to know. Uh, I uh, have spent the last 30 years or so studying the DCPS budget. I'm an education finance lawyer by trade, and I've been a principal architect uh, working with council staff, DC and DCPS officials, and the community on the Uniform for Student Funding formula, which is set every year uh, in uh, the Budget Support Act. Uh, this year, the proposed changes to the formula are based largely on the adequacy study that was commissioned by the Deputy Mayor for Education. Uh, and was released in December of 2013. Uh, because of my work in education finance, I'm 
very familiar with adequacy studies. Uh, this one is just fine. Uh, it was well done. It was competently done by people who have a lot of experience in that area and who, in fact, did the work in Maryland for the Thornton Commission. Uh, I endorse its recommendations. Uh, it has been subject to some criticism for what it did not do, which was to resolve the tensions between the Charter and DCPS advocates as to whether both sectors should be funded uh, equally and similarly for students with similar characteristics. Uh, the study could not do that because the data were not available. Uh, and I do hope that we will follow up. The formula still needs a lot of work, uh, but we need to follow up by getting the data so that we can resolve this tension. Uh, I am also happy to say that the, I think that the proposed formula changes in the BSA uh, are the best that, that the executive could have done in the time available. Uh, we need to pick up where that's left off in the next budget cycle. Uh, I do hope uh, that you will do whatever you can do uh, for the use of the at-risk funds by DCPS. Uh, the, the formula is fine, but they were supposed to put the money into at-risk education. They stayed within the 10% cap on use for administration, which is good, but the money mostly went into middle schools for all students. And this is going to create a big problem next year because if they start dedicating the money to at-risk students, according to the statute, proportionately, either they're going to have to take money away from schools who already have it in the middle grades, or the council is going to have to come up with a great deal of extra money so that we can uh, have the at-risk funding that we need. I have big problems with the budget as a whole, but I presented those, the DCPS budget, I presented those to the Education Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Levy. Uh, Ms. Reed? Chairman Mendelson, Councilmember Grasso, Councilmember Bonds, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jenny Reed, and I'm the Policy Director at the DC Fiscal Policy Institute. I'm here today to testify on some of the proposed tax changes in the fiscal year 15 budget. First, I would like to express our support of the mayor's proposal to create a new tax bracket for middle incomes and to maintain the top bracket, a top rate on incomes over $350,000. Second, I want to ask that the council fund two important tax changes in the fiscal year 15 budget that were recommended by the tax commission but are not included in the mayor's budget. Uh, they're instead on the um, budget wish list. The first is the expansion of the earned income tax credit for childless workers. Equal to 40% of the federal credit, DC's EITC is one of the highest in the country. However, the federal EITC for childless workers, which the district's EITC is based on, is small in both size and scope. This means DC's credit for these workers is even smaller. Uh, the maximum credit a childless worker can receive is $195, and it's not available to someone working full-time at the minimum wage. For a program that is intended to boost the wages of the working poor, this is a serious flaw. The Commission recommended expanding uh, both the maximum benefit a childless worker could receive and the range of incomes that could qualify. The result would provide substantial tax relief to a group of low-wage workers who currently face relatively high taxes. A childless worker employed 30 hours per week at the new $11.50 minimum wage would qualify for an EITC of $450, which would eliminate 90% of his or her taxes. This would also make D.C. the first state to create an EITC for childless adults that goes beyond the federal credit, continuing D.C.'s national leadership in making work pay. 
The second item is an increase of the standard deduction, which is available to all residents but provides the greatest benefits to families and individuals with low and moderate incomes. Yet the DC deduction is far lower than the federal standard deduction and similar deductions in many states. This means the DC income tax does not do as much to shield low-income families from taxes as the feds and other states do. Raising the DC standard deduction to match the federal deduction would exempt many working poor families from owing DC income tax, increase the effectiveness of our earned income tax credit, and provide substantial tax benefits to low and moderate income working families with incomes above the poverty level. For example, a family of three earning $30,000 a year, adopting the federal deduction would cut their tax liability by nearly one third. After applying the earned income tax credit, that same family would receive a refund of about $440 with the federal standard deduction, as opposed to a refund of $146 under current law. Lastly, I want to express some concern over the mayor's proposal to eliminate property taxes for certain elderly homeowners. While DCFBI agrees that the district should provide property tax assistance to low and moderate income residents struggling to keep pace with the rising cost of living in DC, as we've testified before, we have concerns about the structure of this proposal. For example, a 70-year-old resident who has lived in DC for 15 years would get no help, while a 70-year-old resident who has lived in DC for 20 years would qualify for complete tax elimination. And the bill would provide no assistance to renters, even though half of all low-income seniors are renters, and they are more likely than senior owners to have high-cost high cost housing burdens. For these reasons, we believe the, propose, the proper approach would be to expand the income eligibility for Schedule H from the current $50,000 to the $60,000 level in the Senior Citizen Property Tax Relief Act. In addition, the Council could revise the Schedule H formula to enhance benefits specifically for senior renters and homeowners. This would ensure that all low-income seniors get the help they need and it would target greater assistance on those facing the greatest challenges. Thank you for the opportunity to offer testimony. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, each of you, for your testimony. Mr. Grasso, do you have any questions? Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you for testifying. Also, um, Ms. Levy, I'm, you know, I'm concerned about your, your warning for next year, and I've thought about it a lot, and I don't know, you know, I feel like they were in a bit of a pickle there at DCPS in order to get something done in a way that would be most effective, um, whereas I think their time constraints didn't allow them to do it the way that we would like them to do it in compliance directly with the law. I don't know how we remedy that in the budget, you know, because I wouldn't want to replace our, you know, knowledge over their knowledge on where that's best spent and how it's best spent. But I guess the best thing we could do is try to get assurances from them as we move forward that they're going to be in better compliance with the law moving forward. That does run right up into the problem you're talking about, where then other schools that shouldn't have gotten this money are going to see bigger drops. Do you see a solution here? I mean... I, I haven't worked on one <clears throat> uh, just because our, our budget time is right. so short. And I think that it is very hard for the council to deal with it. Uh, I, I disagree about DCPS time constraints. They knew this was coming. Uh, they didn't consult with anybody as to, or anybody outside, uh, as to how they could distribute this money. There were other ways that the money could have been distributed. But uh, I, I agree that we've got a real problem yeah. now. Yeah. I mean, I think they, they knew something would be coming. I'm not sure they were aware of how much would be coming and all of that until closer to the time of the budget. So that, I mean, I think that would be their argument. But look, I, I want to be solution oriented on this. And so we have, a, you know, six months or so here to figure out before the next real budget process starts in <coughs> November, October. And we need to figure that out. So I'm ha I'd love to work with you on coming up with a solution to moving forward on this, okay? Yes, I, I would be pleased to work with your staff. Great. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Grasso. Councilmember Bonds, do you have any questions? No, I have no questions of the witnesses. Thank you very much for your testimony. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Uh, did Nancy Shear, did she arrive? Uh, David Bardeen, if you want to come forward. Is uh, Caitlin Peter here from the Realtors? And there's somebody else from the Realtors, um, Ed Wood, is he here? Okay, I'm gonna 
skip the friendship place folks for a moment. Uh, Harry Wingo in the chamber, if you'd come forward. And uh, Nishama Maslinski, Senior Advocacy Advocate so others might eat. All right, sorry I butchered your last name. We'll begin with you, Mr. Bardeen. Chairman Mendelson, Council Member Grosso, Council Member Bonds, other members of the Council. I'm here to testify in favor of adding to the Budget Support Act in order that you can save the taxpayers' money by making government more efficient, more transparent, more effective in two areas. One involves the University of the District of Columbia. The other involves green infrastructure and sustainable D.C. As to UDC, I have three points. First, please convert the subsidy appropriation, the operating appropriation, to a non-lapsing status. Lapsing at the end of the fiscal year is wasteful, destructive, encourages behaviors which are not desirable in a university and in a enterprise funds such as UDC. If you have any questions, please ask me. That is the most important and practical thing I can suggest to you. Second, student outcomes. What I'm advocating is to the extent the university has information on student outcomes, that be posted on their website so we can see it, everybody can see it, share comments with them and with you and with the public at large. To the extent they lack information, feel they need more than they should post on their website what they're planning to do about it or if they have a resource problem, how they're going to handle it. At the moment, student outcome data, as far as I can find, is on their website only for two components. The workforce development component of the community college, but not the rest of it, and the school of law. So that seems to me a very clear Objective. Finally, transparency of their finances. Please direct the university to post on its website the audited financials. KPMG audited financials in fiscal 2013 are not on their website or any other website, nor are the financials for 2012. And please order the university to post on the website monthly analyses comparing the budgeted amounts to the actual expenditures. If you direct that, I think somehow the university and the agency financial officer and the downtown CFO will figure out how to get it done. Turning to green infrastructure and sustainable DC. The Urban Forestry Administration in DDOT is going to take on a new expanded job in the fiscal year 2015, which everybody is for. In addition to street trees, they're going to work on the larger number of trees that are other city-owned properties of the Department of General Services, public school trees, park and rec trees. There are many more of those. They're going to spend the funds you appropriate in 2015, but at the moment their statutory authority doesn't cover that. So please expand the statutory authority to match what they want to do and everybody agrees. I'd like to see greater cooperation between D.C. Water, DDOT, and DDOE on green infrastructure. Each one is for it, but each one regulates other people and in effect impedes it. If we could be more efficient, it will cost us less money to do what we need to do. Related to that, turns out there is a technical working group, which is supposed to meet monthly in DDOE to do that kind of coordination or help do that kind of coordination. And I just learned about it from Martin Wentworth uh, last week. When I wrote the testimony, I thought it was a no-brainer to let the public sit in and watch and hear the discussions I learned from DDOE in the last couple of days. I think that should be con confidential. I'm not really ready to push that issue for legislation today, although perhaps your committee report could suggest doing it. But I feel strongly that the minutes of that meeting, I should not have to go by Freedom of Information Act to get them. I think we should direct them to make it available. And Mr. Chairman, I point out to you I'm surprised to learn that the chairman of the Council of the District of Columbia appoints one of the 14 members of that 
committee. So if you actually have an appointee, you might be able to learn a lot from that. And if not, maybe it's something we're talking about. Finally, we have a Mr. problem. Mr. Dean, your time's expired. Okay. Well, the final point is down in my test. Yes, we have definition, it. Which involves the Office of Planning as well as DDOE. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Ms. Uh, Peter. Good morning. My name is Caitlin Peter, and I am speaking on behalf of the District of Columbia Association of Realtors, representing nearly 2,400 realtors, property managers, title attorneys, and other real estate professionals licensed in D.C. We will also be following up with more comprehensive written testimony. First and foremost, I would like to voice DCAR's immense support for an item on the wish list, restoration of $501,000 in funding to the Real Estate Guarantee and Education Fund. The Real Estate Guarantee Fund is a consumer protection fund created by the D.C. Council to protect the district citizens from unlawful conduct in real estate transactions. It allows individuals who obtain a judgment, such as fraud or misrepresentation, against a real estate licensee, apply for payment of any outstanding judgment the licensee is unable to pay. In addition, a percentage of the fund may be used for educational programs that improve the competency of real estate licensees and licensure applicants for the public's benefit. Very regrettably, since the 2009 budget, at least three and a quarter million dollars have been taken out of the Real Estate Guarantee Fund and moved into the general fund. As a result, taxing supplemental assessments were imposed for years on the district's nearly 8,000 real estate licensees to replenish the monies. To the best of my knowledge, these supplemental assessments are still being collected. Even worse, if a licensee fails to pay this fee, their license will be suspended. Overall, the millions of dollars taken out of the Guarantee Fund jeopardize innocent consumers. Restoring $501,000 into the Guarantee Fund would be an excellent way for the district government to start giving back the money thousands of licensees paid to protect D.C. residents. DCAR would also like to use this opportunity to praise another item on the wish list, reducing the district's extraordinarily high real estate deed and recordation and transfer taxes. The efficient transfer of real property is at the heart of the district's real estate. D.C.'s recordation and transfer taxes are currently among the highest in the nation, and in a market where lending is still extremely stringent, a barrier for home ownerships. Particularly for residents of more moderate means, even a few thousands of dollars in recordation taxes can be very difficult to save up for. Recordation and transfer taxes also negatively impact sellers. The concern is not everyone who owns a home has made tons of money on it. Our members see sellers having to come to the settlement table with cash they simply don't have because their property values decreased or worse, they are still underwater. This can unnecessarily tie up housing stock and prevent potentially affordable housing units from coming onto the market. Bottom line, the higher the closing costs, the less D.C. residents that can afford to purchase a home. We understand that there are many competing interests before you. We nonetheless strongly urge you to restore the $501,000 in funding to the Real Estate Guarantee Fund, which in our opinion is reasonable in light of the millions of dollars that were removed. We also highly appreciate the council considering lowering recordation and transfer taxes and would certainly like to work on options to decrease them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Peter. Uh, Mr. Uh, Wingo. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson, uh, Council Member Bonds, and Council Member Grosso. I'm Harry Wingo. I'm the President and CEO of the D.C. Chamber of Commerce, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of uh, the business community for the opportunity to testify today about the budget. And I just wanted to underscore a couple points of things that we think uh, are, would be great to put into the budget and things that we also are, are concerned about. Uh, and I'll, at the top of my list, as typical, uh, are taxes and fees. The current proposed rate of 9.4% uh, is great that it's a tax break, but unfortunately I think it's uh, kind of counterbalanced or zeroed out by the uh, combined reporting to a single uh, weighted sales factor. Reducing the rate as proposed on the contingency list to 8.9% would have a bigger impact on the business um, community. As reported recently last week um, in the Washington Business Journal, the D.C. Uh, taxes, franchise tax is still too high. Uh, ultimately, we'd love to see us get down closer to uh, parity uh, with Maryland and Virginia 
but we think 8.9% as a reduction would be a very important. This would send a signal uh, that Washington, D.C. is more attractive for businesses. Other property tax uh, provisions that we uh, support would be the commercial property tax provision on item 4, uh, deed recordation and transfer taxes in item number 11, and small business technical assistance, item number 17. Uh, on the small business technical assistance, there's $700,000 to fund the small business uh, technical assistance program, and the program has been a long-time supporter uh, of such funding. We also support provisions that would provide relief to working families. Funding for the following tax incentives are on the mayor's priority list. Uh, items 2, 14, 15, and 20, which go to earn income tax credit, uh, going to 487 for childless workers, uh, increasing the personal exemption from 1775 to 2215, and then also increasing the standard uh, deduction and also the provisions on the estate tax threshold. One thing I'd like to underscore is that if further tax changes are recommended by the um, are recommended by the tax commission, or if they are desired by the council, we hope that those would be put in as uh, standalone legislation, uh, and that we could address it through hearing. Even in this budget submission, we have seen changes from the recommendations by the tax commission, and full and complete public discussion should be have, had on those issues, uh, especially those that go to tax changes. As far as programs that need funding, uh, we definitely support uh, the business portal, uh, having a single place uh, for businesses to be able to, uh, to form themselves and also obtain permits and licensings. Uh, having that type of online presence can be very helpful. We are opposed to uh, the Alternative Fuel Vehicle Conversion Act provisions on diesel fuel, and also uh, public, the Public Space Rental Amendment Act of 2014 that would have an impact on sidewalk cafes. Also, uh, Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I agree with you on unbridled increases in spending, and that's a matter of concern. And uh, the D.C. Chamber is a voice for business in Washington, D.C., and we look forward to the opportunity uh, to work with you on, on these types of provisions. But again, I'd like to underscore that really addressing uh, taxes and fees and making sure we keep that down so that we can improve the business uh, climate is of the utmost importance. Thank you, sir. And also be less submitting uh, more complete test or but further testimony uh, on the, for the record. Thank you, Mr. Wingo. Um, Ms. Um, Mazdansky? Good morning, Chairperson Mendelson, members of the Council. My name is Nahama Maslyansky. I'm the Senior Advocacy Advisor at SUM, also known as So Others Might Eat. SUM is an interfaith and nonprofit organization that for 43 years has provided comprehensive services, including housing, to district residents who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. I'll be reading only the main points of my written testimony. We want to thank you all for your support for affordable housing and for adding some funding in FY14 for programs that avert and reduce homelessness for single persons as well as families. Some supports the mayor's addition in the DHS budget of a million dollars to the emergency rental assistance program for both individuals and for families. We agree with our colleagues that increases are needed also in the rapid rehousing program for both individuals and families to reduce shelter usage. We also appreciate the mayor's addition of $4.68 million <coughs> to house homeless veterans. However, a wide variety of homeless persons is desperately in need of housing. At the least $366,000 loss in federal funding for the DHS Permanent Supportive Housing Program for Families should be replaced with local funds. The need for affordable housing is driving people into homelessness and is trapping them there. Accordingly, we request an increase in the DCHA subsidy of $2.5 million for tenant-based local rent supplement program and an additional $2 million for project or sponsor-based LRSP. The Housing Production Trust Fund in DHCD has been an important tool to address the affordable housing crisis in the district. It's extremely important that it be given a reliable and substantial funding floor. We concur with the CNHED and ICH Permanent Supportive Housing Committee that at least $100 million be committed each year to the trust fund and an increase therefore is needed this year. With regard to the homeless service continuum in DHS, we continue be, to be concerned about the budget impact of extremely high usage of the system, families and individuals this past winter. First, the proposed budget for the continuum for families indicates a loss of $598,000 in federal funds. 
Second, our understanding is that it is possible that $9 million in carryover federal funds in FY14 that are helping now to pay for homeless families might not be available next year. We think it prudent to add to the DHS budget to avert the possibility that there will be insufficient funds for essential services for homeless individuals and families. We support the Mayor's proposed $500,000 increase to the Interim Disability Assistance Program, or IDA. As you know, IDA helps residents who are disabled and unemployable to avoid more costly crisis services such as emergency rooms and shelters. Uh, we provide in our written testimony a, a wonderful example of how the increase last year that you provided to IDA helped Ms. B to be, stop being homeless. Um, to help other people who are applying for SSI succeed in being approved for their benefits and increase the reimbursement rate, we re request a $580,000 investment in the SOAR program. Um, the case managers at some who have been trained in that program have an approval rating of about 95 percent. We also support an increase in TANF benefits, um, the increase in, proposed increase in TANF benefits, such as the phase-in of COLA. Thank you so much for your, allowing me to testify today. Uh, thank you, uh, each of you, for your, um, for your testimony. Um, I had two questions for Mr. Wingo. Could you say a little bit more about the Alternative Fuel Vehicle Conversion Act? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. So our concerns on this, uh, while this provision uh, helps defray the cost of converting to alternative fuels, it also seeks to eliminate the registration of petroleum diesel vehicles after December 31st, uh, 2017. The reason we don't support this proposal um, is where the prohibi prohibition continues, we suggest uh, the, problem with, the problem with this is that it, uh, not only would commercial fleets be barred from registering, but also passenger vehicles like turbo diesels, which are significantly more fuel efficient uh, than their unleaded counterparts would be impacted. And there's concern about businesses uh, that rely on diesel and have full fleets. And so uh, some of the impact as far as moving businesses out, if they have to move their fleets uh, to other jurisdictions uh, because of, of these requirements. And there are, there are also issues uh, with um, the life of the vehicles as far as the tax sense and the cost of converting and just really the impact on businesses uh, that rely on diesel within the district. Is there any jurisdiction you know of that um, bans the res reg registration of petroleum diesel vehicles? Uh, we can find out off the top top of mind. Uh, I'm not sure of any others, but I would say that on the uh, uh, another thing that we're concerned about is how this accelerates vis-a-vis -vis the federal uh, requirements, and then this would be uh, much earlier as far as the date as well. What is the Public Space Rental Amendment Act? Uh, is that raising the fees? Yes, that would be raising the fees. Uh, I have more detail on on that as well, uh, but the concern there would be how uh, how important having uh, sidewalk cafes uh, are uh, to just the um, uh, the city is you know, we're doing well in that sector as far as uh, you know restaurants and hospitality and then just the city is um, you know really attractive for um, tourists and then also other jurisdictions who come into the city it's a great place uh, to uh, have you know have a meal uh, play and for recreation and particularly now that the weather's getting better and it really goes to some of the details for example uh, we increase the cost for small businesses to attract customers, uh, we see by 66%. There's a prorated annual fee based on months of use, um, would be, that would be repealed. Unenclosed sidewalk cafes would pay uh, $8.30 per square foot, and that's up from the current rate of $5. Enclosed sidewalk cafes would pay $16.60 uh, per square foot, and that's up from the current rate of $10. And then uh, violations would lead to a fine of $1,000. That's a $700 increase from uh, the $300 fine right now. And, and again, um, we, we would just encourage a broader uh, view of what um, you know the, the investment uh, that our restaurants are having and just the, the bigger picture for the community and how it improves life in the city and just makes it a really a nice, you know, DC is such a nice place to live and do business. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Krause, thank do you, you have any, any questions? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I just want to follow up on the uh, alternative fuel uh, section. In fact, uh, that section was included in a bill that was introduced earlier this year by the mayor. And we've had testimony on that uh, pretty extensively 
Um, and I believe that the Committee on Finance and Revenue, when they marked up that section of the bill, they took that out. Um, so I can't imagine that this is going to continue to go forward. We um, recognize that this was overly restrictive and also outdated uh, in its approach. The fact of the matter is that clean diesel today is not the same as diesel was years ago. And the way this section is written, it would actually allow those old diesel cars to continue to be on the road and prohibit new ones like the one I just purchased uh, two weeks ago um, that is clean diesel. So I can promise you that we will not be um, moving forward with that section uh, as recommended by the committee and hopefully uh, as we move forward with the Budget Support Act, we can take that out. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bardeen, can you please uh, just take a minute of my time to finish your testimony? The, one of the goals of Sustainable D.C. is to use 75 percent of the landscape to capture rainwater for filtration or reuse. That what they mean by filtration or reuse has never been defined. Talking to the senior staff, they agree privately and in the public meeting that it should be defined. I think we need to give them the prod from this committee, committee from this council, to work on it. I think we're going to have a transition in the mayoralty, and whoever she or he is, I'd like to see sustainable D.C. defined as well as possible. And after they define it, and there's a controversy, which the executive branch should first deal with, then have some kind of tracking mechanism to say how well are we doing toward that 75 percent goal so that this council and succeeding councils can see over a period of years. That's my thought. I think they need a prod. I think everybody in the executive branch realizes it's a good idea, but it could be zero priority and wait for years if we don't give them that prod. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your testimony on UDC as well. Uh, those are good suggestions. So thank, thank you. you all very much for your testimony. Thank you, Council. Councilor Bonds for questions. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Bardeen, I appreciate your, um, um, your comments because I think, like you, that we need to be able to track what we're doing as a government in this modern time. So thank you very much for reminding us of that and how important it is. Thank you very much. Um, I really don't have any uh, questions, um, Chairman, of the panel. Um, I think their testimony speaks for itself, and I appreciate it, and um, I'm, I'm listening very intensely to what you you feel we should be doing in, in our government now and how this budget might impact um, the community. So thank you very much to each panelist. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Uh, Jean Michael Gerard, and I apologize if I've mispronounced your name. For, uh, he is the uh, Executive Director of Friendship Place. Sally Craig, Co-President of the Board at Friendship Place. Okay. What about Alan Banks and Brian Kurtz? Okay, if they could come forward. Alan Banks, who's uh, a peer at Friendship Place. Brian Kurtz, who's a volunteer at Friendship Place. And is uh, Lachelle Rivers here? Why don't you come forward? I know I mispronounced your name, and I apologize. It's quite all right. <laughs> Thank you. When you're ready. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify. I'm Jean-Michel Giraud, the Executive Director of Friendship Place and a member of the District's Interagency Council on Homelessness. Friendship Place has become a regional homeless services provider serving over 1,200 persons with street outreach, case management, medical and psychiatric services, shelter, and permanent housing in Washington, and with job placement and veteran services, including homelessness prevention and rapid rehousing in the D.C. metropolitan area. Friendship Place is a unique blend of public-private partnerships that allows us to have a lasting impact on homelessness by developing practical, permanent solutions. We seek to empower people to rebuild their lives and are working to end homelessness in Washington, D.C. 
We value our partnership with the city and within this framework, we would like to offer suggestions to enhance the current service delivery to people experiencing homelessness in Washington. First, Friendship Place's Aim Higher program has been providing job placement and housing services since June 2011. We have placed 244 participants in jobs and assisted 240 in finding or stabilizing living situations they pay for with no public assistance. This program is completely privately funded and addresses the needs of participants with a wide array of qualifications. Housing is secured through a network of partnering landlords with an initial subsidy of one month's rent on average. We have trained 15 local nonprofits in our model and have placed people in jobs for them and for the DC Department of Employment Services. We are recommending that the district fund job placement programs in the future instead of focusing primarily on vocational training. Although we understand that some participants need this kind of support, the great majority of the people seeking services from AIM Hire do not. They already have job skills and employment histories. We do not think that the system should give them a message that they need to be taught how to work simply because they have become homeless. Rather, they are telling us their need for help is immediate and they are in very precarious situations and do not feel they need to spend an extended amount of time in training classrooms. We are urging the city to assess its funding in this area and to position its resources where they can make the greatest difference for our neighbors without homes. Second, we are pleased to hear that the city is developing its rapid rehousing program for single adults. Our own experience with homelessness prevention and rehousing in our privately funded direct housing program has shown that we are able to assist a large number of participants using this approach. Direct housing has placed 123 people in 77 households and served over 40 children since April 2013. Rapid rehousing adds flexibility to the homeless services system and constitutes an empowering message for participants, namely they know that the system recognizes the fact that they are still resilient enough to rebuild with a limited amount of time. We have joined the Way Home campaign and support its goals. We are also pleased that the city is responding to the crisis brought about by last winter's uh, extreme pressure on the family side of the service delivery. Long-term planning and referrals to adequate needs-based services will allow the city to meet its goal in this area. We urge you to find solutions that meet people's needs at the, the uh, appropriate level. Thank you for giving me time to testify. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Banks. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the council, good morning to you all, and thank you for your time this morning. My name is Alan Banks. I'm volunteer coordinator of community engagement at Friendship Place. While writing this, I struggled to come up with words, and I came to the conclusion that there are most likely very few words that you have not heard before. So I decided to give you some names, names like George, Jeff, Shelley, Terry, Harold, Allen, and Ayana. These are just a few of the people that have been helped so greatly by the organization I speak for today, Friendship Place. Names like Jean-Michel, Ben, Tanya, Christine, Katie, Giddy, Jill, and Jermaine. These are just a few of the people I have met and worked with since coming in contact with the organization I speak for today, Friendship Place. These are people that are not only working with their brains, but also with their hearts to fight homelessness. I am one of the people in America that never saw homelessness coming. I spent years working in the field of federal law enforcement and diplomatic security, working with four different agencies, including the Secret Service, helping to protect two presidents. I had a very high income, a nice home, even a boat. My homelessness was caused by mental illness, major depression due to chemical imbalance. This disease got worse and worse over the years, taking from me all that I had, my family, my home, and finally my ability to work. I lost it all and became homeless. 
I was homeless for six years, both on the streets of Washington and in the shelters. I know what it feels like to time and time again need and ask for help and be told time and time again, we can't help you. Friendship Place saved my life. They helped me when no other organization would or could. I want to thank you today for funding the Permanent Supportive Housing Program. This program, which is in part administered through Friendship Place, not only saved my life, it changed my life. Friendship Place got me an apartment in one week. Since that time, I've become a different person. Through Friendship Place, I've become a strong advocate, and I am now able to give back and help like I was helped. I will be serving on the Friendship Place Board of Directors, and I am the new coordinator for community engagement, working with the Speakers Bureau and the Peer Leadership Program. Find, from my heart, I am asking you to continue funding organizations like Friendship Place that are doing this good work and getting resor results. Organizations like this one not only walk, talking the talk, they're walking the, the walk. I thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you, Mr. Banks. Uh, Mr. Kurtz. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for giving me this chance to testify in favor of funding for job placement programs like AIM Hire at Friendship Place. I firmly believe such multidimensional programs are a critical component of alleviating homelessness here in the district. I am Brian Kurtz, a longtime constituent of Ward 3, and I serve as an AIM Hire job placement volunteer. My career has been with several international development agencies managing various economic job creation and training programs. To my pleasant surprise, I've found the levels of professionalism, creativity, and enthusiasm at Friendship Place to match or exceed that of the other organizations where I have served. But what makes the AIM Hire job placement program so effective and satisfying to support is the intense results-oriented drive of its five staff members, other volunteers, and our participants to do two key things. First, we quickly identify the strengths of our job seekers as well as the barriers they face. And then second, we do whatever it takes to get them into sustainable jobs and appropriate housing as fast as possible without delaying their progress first by requiring them to undergo additional training. The AIM Hire model is unique and goes an extra mile in two additional ways. First, we place people into jobs and appropriate housing simultaneously to avoid the classic vicious cycle where a homeless individual can't get a job without a place to live and yet can't get a place to live without a job. Second, we're also able to deliver personalized wraparound services to address any barriers that may be standing in the way of employment, such as helping get a criminal record legitimately expunged, finally finding, a child, finding child care, addressing urgent health issues, negotiating a lease, or renewing a long expired professional certification as examples. The success of this innovative service model is evidenced by the numbers. Last year, AIM Hired placed 116 people into real jobs and secured stable housing for 113 of them. To reiterate in closing, my main point today is that at no point in this successful model do we force our job seekers to suspend their full-time employment search activities by requiring them to first participate in a training program. Our clients wish to get employed and housed as fast as possible, and most of them do not need additional training. While skill, job skill training and certification can be very helpful, I would urge you to provide funding for effective job placement programs like AIM Hire and to include appropriate flexibility when doing so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Rivers. Yes, can I be heard? Can you hear me now? Okay, I got to scoot up. Um, basically, I'm going to come in and represent those on not just low income, but the housing situation in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm going to be speaking freely and from paper because I woke up this morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, to bed bugs. This is a, an apartment that costs 1100 a month. 
which has mice, roaches, bed bugs, you name it, it has it. It doesn't go according to your income. No matter how little you make, how much you make, you have to pay high rent that goes up to 1400 a month. And it's ridiculous when I have to deal with, especially when you're a clean person, a neat freak, you know, that sort of thing. So my basic thing is I have a college degree. I am a single mother that can no longer work due to my brain surgery, and I have epilepsy. However, I have refused to let that stop me when it's trying to, I've tried to open my own 501c3 organization, which didn't work out, and I wrote my own book on the shelf, but it ain't selling. So um, my truly focus is my son's education and to be able to afford school for him. He's 14 years old. I'm having him bust his butt by taking English in UDC. He's an advanced help at Howard University, as well as advanced math courses in high school. I have incredible relationships with the school and his teachers. However, with the cost of living in the capital of the United States, how can a low-income mother send their child to college? He took his SSATs when he was 10 years old to get into Sidwell, and I knew I could not afford that. For that's like 30000 a year. However, due to the smartness he has and how regular classes bore him, I pray for some type of scholarship. He is on an Iowa 529 account that I can no longer contribute to, and now I'm to the point of being ready to march on D.C. grounds for affordable living, for the district, pan the district parents like myself can afford, cannot afford to send their children to school. I mean, for the future, I see that right now in the capital of the United States, the rent goes up to 6000 a month. And that's ridiculous. I had a house, and um, I've been on the affordable housing waiting list for over 11 years since I've been back in the district. Nothing is moving. I have plenty of papers. I go there every year to update, being in D.C. Village at one time, bouncing around. I'm not going to know D.C. General. I, if I have to sacrifice more than what I make a year, more than half of what I make a year from SSDI just to put a roof over our head, to keep him focused in school, then so be it. I was 22 years old and didn't know what I was doing when I bought my house. I was too ill to keep it. However, that did not stop me from having him read books at age two and in school by age three. I have asked Ms. Muriel Bowser for help with cost of rent. I have papers still from last year from speaking to her on that panel, emailed and so forth. I've seen nothing. I am a part of Housing for All CNHED, the Coalition of Nonprofit Housing Economic Development. And so many low income in the district are trying to come together and help each other find affordable housing to help their children and grandchildren on. There are over 70,000 people on the waiting list for housing help in the district. And with all the construction happening, you have to make at least $50,000 to be considered to live in decency. And even making that much causes you to live from paycheck to paycheck with all the amenities that come with paying your rent. I simply ask that some people pay attention to those that are mentally ill, homeless on the street, and so forth. Those with low income, not everybody was born with low income. Sometimes you raise to the top and you fall, and you need help getting back to that top. You know, and if it comes to your children, children come first. You know, they're the future. you got to be able to... Get them at least into college. You can't afford rent. You gotta. It's a sacrifice. You gotta sacrifice one for the other. Thank, thank you, Ms. Rivers. Thank you each of you for your testimony. Uh, I don't have any questions. I do know uh, Friendship Place uh, does a lot of good work. Thank um, you. I've interacted with uh, with you all for a number of years since I was an ANC commissioner, which was a couple decades ago. Mr. Grasso, do you have any questions? I just want to thank you all for coming down and testifying. I don't have any questions. Councilmember Bonds, do you have any questions? No, no questions, um, Chairman, but thank you very, very much. And um, um, from what I hear about Friendship Place, you do a phenomenal job. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe we can help you and your son with your educational goals. Thank you. We'd like to do that. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, is Lisa Mallory here? Um, she's CEO of DC Building Industry. If you'd come forward, uh, Sean Cahill is president, D.C. Building Industry Association. Uh, Scott uh, Schenklin, Schenkelberg, who is president, Miriam's Kitchen, is he here? And 
and uh, Kurt Runge, who's Advocacy Director of Miriam's Kitchen. We'll start with you, Ms. Mallory. Again, just a reminder, there's that little black box on the table, and uh, it counts down the four minutes. The yellow light comes on with, I think, a little beep when there's a minute left. Please be mindful of the time. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson, members and staff of the Committee on the Whole. I'm Lisa Maria Mallory, and I'm the CEO of the D.C. Building Industry Association. It is a pleasure to be here today to testify on Bill 20750, the Fiscal Year 2015 Budget Support Act of 2014. I joined DCBIA as a CEO earlier this year, and I am excited to advance DCBIA by increasing the membership's value proposition and to represent the interests of our current membership of developers, owners, contractors, brokers, engineers, architects, lawyers, and others to continue to promote real estate development in the District of Columbia. At the outset, I would also like to congratulate the Mayor's proposed fiscal year 2015 budget as it achieves balance without adding new taxes, yet it maintains the district's general fund, and it supports initiatives that promote future growth of the district. However, there are a few additional provisions that give us pause and need reconsideration. One of my strategic priorities at DCBIA is to work closely with the DC government to ensure that the regulatory hurdles facing our members are greatly reduced. The first step in that process is following through on the recommendations that are set forth coming in a final report from the Business Regulatory Reform Task Force. The mayor has taken the first step by including funding for one of the initiatives announced by the task force, and that is the One City Business Portal, which will allow developers and residents to sign on to and get building permits, licenses, certificates of occupancies, and other important documents approved by eight different agencies in one online portal. This is just the first step in improving the regulatory process, but we are extremely encouraged to see the funding for this initiative. As you know, the fiscal year 2015 proposed budget includes several critical tax reductions as part of its revised revenue contingency priority list. We commend the mayor for recognizing the importance of these tax reductions by including them on the list. Three of them are especially important to the real estate development community as they have been part of the proposed budget over the last several years, but they have yet to make it into the final budget. The three reductions are the provision to reduce the commercial property real, uh, the commercial property tax rate even further from 9.4% to 8.9%. To reduce the commercial property tax rate on the first three million assessed of assessed value from $1.65 to $1.55 per $100 of assessed value. And lastly and finally, to reduce the deed recordation and transfer tax from 1.45% to 1.4%. We respectfully request that these three items be moved from the contingency priority list to the final budget so they can be enacted without further delay. Lowering the cost for developers lowers the cost for tenants. Each of these recommendations will help the entire business community by lowering the cost to occupy a building, which helps not only developers incentivize leasing opportunities, but it also eases the high costs for tenants that serve residents, visitors, and workers alike. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Ms. Mallory. Uh, Mr. Cahill? I have a hunch I was supposed to call you in a different order based on your testimony, but I called based on the witness list. My apologies. Fine, thank you. That's fine. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson and members and staff of the Committee of, of the Whole. I'm Sean Cahill. I'm the Senior Vice President of Property Group Development here in Washington, D.C. It's a pleasure to be here as the President of DCBIA. Uh, the District of Columbia Building Industry Association to testify on Bill 20-750, Fiscal Year 2015 Budget Support Act of 2014. As you know, DCBIA is a very broad and very deep network of nearly 500 organizations and over 2,000 committed and focused real estate development professionals. Today, I'm joined by Lisa, who started in January as our new Chief Executive Officer. We are excited by the breadth of both private and public sector experience she brings to DCBIA 
and our recent in, uh, visits to introduce DCBIA's new leadership to all of the council members uh, to help remind this esteemed body that DCBIA continues to serve as a resource for the city and its future. It is our goal to continue to work with you to retain and grow business in the District of Columbia and to share our real estate development expertise with you. To begin, the proposed fiscal year 2015 budget before us is yet another balanced budget proposal that does not raise taxes, yet it advances the health and vibrancy of our fine city. We commend the mayor for this proposed budget, and we also applaud the council for continuing to vote on balanced budgets that continue to grow the district. As you know, establishing a predictable, predictable budget with excellent district government services through agencies such as DDOT, DCRA, and DDOE, and others is critical to ensuring that large, complex projects are delivered on time, on budget, and add to the economic and social vita vitality of the city. At 646,000 residents, the district's population is at its highest level since the 1970s, and we are projected to grow. The numerous, large, complex, multi-year, multi-million dollar development projects planned or underway in the city, such as Capitol Crossing, City Center DC, McMillan Reservoir, Poplar Point, and others, just to name a few, will support the district residents, visitors, and workers alike. These large projects require strategic government investment and, su and support to ensure that they are not delayed or deterred. All of us were excited to see the city finally break ground on Skyland Town Center in Southeast after 30 years of delay and deferrals. But the spring groundbreaking was also a reminder that the city and the private sector must always look closely, work closely together through all phases of development to ensure that these comp complex projects are not severely delayed. At this time, I'd like to highlight a, uh, a few proposals in the fiscal year 2015 budget that need attention as they could potentially hamper the trajectory of the growth occurring in the real estate development in the District of Columbia at a time when we are also witnessing some fragile uh, uh, circumstances in the leasing with the district's uh, district uh, office uh, market. As you more, know, more than a year ago, Mayor Gray created a tax revision commission to review and find strategies to update and create new tax methods for the district. We are pleased that a few of them are reflected in the fiscal year 2015 proposed budget, including reducing fr franchise taxes from 9.975% to 9.4%, moving combined reporting to a single weighted sales factor by removing calculations for payroll and property and exempting investment funds from franchise property tax. However, while we are pleased with the inclusion of these recommendations, we would also like to ensure that real estate investment trusts, REITs, are also exempted as part of the investment funds from franchise tax to promote and encourage REITs to be in the District of Columbia as a crucial residential development incentive. The franchise tax exemptions recommendations come from New York City's best practices, which include REITs, yet REITs are currently excluded in this tax exemption in the proposed fiscal year 2015 budget. Mr. Cahill, your time's expired. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schenkelberg? Yes. Uh, good morning. Excuse me. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson, Councilmember Grasso, uh, Councilmember Bonds, or Bonds, excuse me. My name is Scott Schenkelberg. I am the President and CEO of Miriam's Kitchen, and today I will be testifying regarding the Way Home Campaign and Miriam's Kitchen's budget recommendations. Miriam's Kitchen's mission is to end chronic homelessness in the District of Columbia. That's why our organization supports the Way Home Campaign. It's a campaign to end chronic homelessness in D.C. by 2017. We welcome the opportunity to highlight several recommendations that we believe will help put D.C. on track to ending chronic homelessness and homelessness more broadly. First, we want to ask the Council to continue to fund and accelerate the Interagency Council on Homelessness PSH Plan. We want to commend the D.C. Council for unanimously voting to support the D.C. Interagency Council on Homelessness' plan 
to end chronic homelessness by creating 2,700 units of permanent supportive housing. This plan has yearly goals that, if funded, will ensure that people are no longer homeless for years. This year, the plan calls for new funding of 609 units of permanent supportive housing. Miriam's Kitchen urges the DC Council to fund and accelerate the ICH PSH plan to end chronic homelessness by 2017. We also recommend that policy and system changes are made to ensure that housing created by the plan reaches people who have been homeless the longest and are the most vulnerable. Ending chronic homelessness is urgent and it makes sense. At Miriam's Kitchen, we know that this is true, not only because the research says so, because we see it every day with the guests in our dining room. The majority of people we serve are chronically homeless, meaning they have been homeless for years and have serious illness. Many are in their 50s, which could be considered elderly given the average life expectancy for people who are chronically homeless is 62 years old. Unfortunately, we see some of our guests pass away prematurely without the dignity of a home. For our guests, housing is health care. Investing in permanent supportive housing for individuals and families is the right thing to do, but it's also a cost-effective thing to do. The research is abundantly clear that PSH costs the same or much less than letting people remain chronically homeless. The ambulance that was at Miriam's Kitchen this week, which is not an uncommon occurrence, we see firsthand our guests cycle in and out of the ER or the psychiatric hospital only to be discharged to the street. Our guests are concerned about survival, not thinking about seeing the dentist regularly or treating chronic health conditions. As a result, wounds fester and conditions grow more severe. Williams Kitchen is working with private health care providers such as MedStar and George Washington Hospital to identify chronically homeless men and women who are the most frequent users of their emergency medical services. A small but per significant percentage of households who are chronically homeless are families. In these instances, one year of shelter could pay for approximately two years of permanent supportive housing. PSH using Housing First Model is the right thing to do. It saves the city resources. It clearly works. Over 90% of people who enter housing remain in housing two years later. Finally, the homeless service system needs to be more efficient and effective. Investment in PSH will save taxpayer resources only if housing resources are targeted effectively. To do this, we recommend that the district expand its coordinated entry system to place in, in order to place and ensure people who have been homeless the longest and are the most vulnerable are prioritized for housing. Now, Kurt Rungi, the Advocacy Director at Miriam's Kitchen, will go into our recommendations in more detail. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and members of the committee. My name is Kurt Rungi, and I'm the Advocacy Director at Miriam's Kitchen. Today I'll be summarizing my testimony, um, but I also want to say that we support the recommendations not only of The Way Home, but of other uh, colleagues who are here who are testifying uh, regarding affordable housing and addressing homelessness more broadly. First, we recommend an investment of $250,000 to expand a coordinated entry system for single adults who are homeless. And if you uh, look at our written testimony, there's a graphic here um, uh, provided that shows what it's like for someone who is homeless and just trying to get the housing and services that they need. Uh, initially for people, it's like navigating a maze. Uh, people who end up getting to housing aren't necessarily the people who, it, who need it the most, and uh, some people never really get there. What coordinated entry does is it matches housing and services to people who are homeless based off their needs. And it makes it easier for people who are homeless to get the housing and services they need to get out of homelessness uh, more quickly. Right now, uh, this is something that the federal government requires, but it's something that is only operating um, with the resources of nonprofits. Um, there's no government resources or staff to expand it to really serve everyone who is homeless. So we recommend funding to staff this system up. But uh, Part of the problem, though, the thing that really is needed to end homelessness is housing. And this system's not going to work if the housing and services aren't in place. There are three particular types of housing that are needed. One, permanent supportive housing, which is just for a small 
portion of the homeless population who have been homeless for years. Um, rapid rehousing and just affordable housing or one-time assistance. This is why we recommend that the Council fully fund the ICH PSH plan to end chronic homelessness, especially $5.4 million for the DHS Permanent Supportive Housing Program. Now, that $5.4 million would both uh, meet the goals of the, the plan for this year, but also uh, meet the entire need of families who, who need permanent supportive housing next year. We also recommend investments in the housing programs like local rent supplement program and housing production trust fund to produce affordable housing. Next, we recommend an investment of $1.5 million in rapid rehousing for individuals. And Friendship Place told you a little bit about how that program works uh, with uh, the people that they serve. And actually, just the other day, I was talking to one of our guests in our dining room who's been homeless for a year, and she is in her late 50s. She works part-time. And she really just needs someone to help her find an affordable unit. Uh, it's just her living by herself, um, affordable unit, and uh, maybe help to increase that part-time to full-time uh, wage. So she really needs something like rapid rehousing. And uh, that's not available here in the district for individuals. Uh, it's uh, incredible that the, the um, homeless shelter system right now doesn't really know who's homeless, what services they need to get out of homelessness, and really this coordinated entry system and all these things work together to match people to those right services and uh, resources that they need. Um, and the, the shelter system could be changed uh, if we um, found housing for some of those people who have been homeless the longest. Then finally, uh, we recommend that there be $580,000 invested in Social Security application assistance, which would help, uh, as Nahama uh, mentioned in her testimony, uh, people apply for Social Security and get it on the first time successfully. Right now, it's 15% uh, success uh, getting um, Social Security on the first, but on the first time uh, without assistance, and at places across the country um, that use this model, they're over 90% successful. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, each of you, for your testimony. Um, these figures, I guess I'll pick on Mr. Rungi. These uh, figures, um, like the $580,000 in Social Security application assistance? Yes which is to fund um, outreach workers. How did you come up with that amount? That's a good question. So um, back in the um, fall, or even going back further, uh, last budget season, the mayor um, recommended, uh, he put on his uh, wish list or contingency list, um, social security application assistance that was never funded. Um, and. Uh, we have an interest in seeing that happen because we see a lot of our guests having trouble getting Social Security on the first time. But my question is how um, you calculated the 580000 yes. So what we did was um, uh, we uh, reached out to uh, a technical assistance provider who helps uh, states across the, the country um, implement this SOAR model, and in particular one in Tennessee that uses this model to basically um, map out what it would look like. And we have a more detailed proposal that I can um, give you that shows exactly where all that money would go and what that it would be used for. But um, to, to just summarize, um, talking to these experts, uh, it would include staff who, on the front end, homeless outreach workers, are helping people apply for Social Security. But it also, um, one thing we lack right now in DHS is a person who, uh, when people who are getting interim disability assistance, who've already applied for Social Security, getting those people connected to pro bono legal assistance, making relationships with lawyers, um, is a, a gap that we have. And we think that this application assistance would I didn't improve, ask, improve I, IDA. I don't mean to also, cut you off, but mm -hmm, sure. we have a lot of witnesses and yes, therefore yes. not a lot of time. I wasn't asking you about the program. I was asking you how you came up with the money. Okay. And I heard you say that you looked at ten, you looked at elsewhere and you saw Tennessee, for example, mm -hmm. and using yes. their model and you have more detailed information. That's yes. how you came up with it. 
Uh, I have no other questions for y'all. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Grasso. Mm -hmm. I just appreciate everyone. <coughs> I don't have any questions. Obviously, I've met with you guys, um, Kurt, and know exactly where you are, and uh, certainly support mm -hmm. it. So, okay, uh, hopefully, we can get it done in this budget. So, thank you. Okay. Councilmember Bonds, questions? No questions, um, Chairman. But thank you all very much, and I love the design of the models. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you again, each of you. Uh, Bob Bremer, incoming board chair, Humanities Council of Washington, D.C. <coughs> Is Mr. Bremer here? Uh, David Schwartzman, D.C. Statehood Green Party. Uh, Ed Wood, D.C. Association of Realtors. Is Mr. Wood here? Uh, Robert Warren, Director of People for Fairness Coalition. Is Mr. Warren here? Uh, Nassim Mushri, Staff Attorney, Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless. Uh, Kate Coventry with the D.C. Fiscal Policy Institute. Is Ms. Coventry here? <clears throat> uh, Mr. Bremer, when you're ready. Yes. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and members of the D.C. Council. Thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of the work being carried out by the Office of Planning, specifically the Historic Preservation Office and the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities. My name is Bob Bremner. I'm the incoming board chair for the Humanities Council of Washington, D.C. I'm also a resident of Ward 3. I'm here along with a number of Humanity Council grantees to thank you for your past support of our D.C. government partners and comment on our plans for future cooperation with them. As the official State Humanities Council, our organization receives critical funding from the D.C. government. Our partnership with the Historic Preservation Office includes a grant of $83,000, and our partnership with the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities includes funding of $170,000. We use that funding for programs and grants that increase the understanding of humanities in the city, including history, ethics, literature, language, jurisprudence, philosophy, comparative religion. Most of the funding from these two sources is spread throughout the city in the form of grants to community-based organizations. We all know that we are at a time of great change in our city. It is urgent that we document the voices and the history of our residents today in an effort to reflect on the rapid changes taking place in all our neighborhoods. I cannot stress enough that supporting DC's many community-based organizations is the framework for doing that. And that is where the grant programs of the HPO and the DC CAH come in. The Humanities Council and the Historic Preservation Office partner together to provide a series of workshops, grants, and symposia on historic preservation projects across the city. Some 120 community heritage project grants have helped individuals and groups preserve their stories and document their histories, all of which live on permanently on the Humanity Council's DC Digital Museum. The Council and the HPO offer workshops in various city locations to assist those interested in preserving the histories of their neighborhoods and their houses. Of major significance is our joint effort with the, with the HPO to celebrate the 225th anniversary of the founding of the District of Columbia in 2016. As you know, the program is called A People's History, and its goal is to document the history of every one of the 127 DC neighborhoods. We're approaching the halfway mark toward that goal, but to make sure that we reach it, we are requesting that the City Council support an increase in the HBO's funding for the Humanities Council from $83,000 last year to $100,000 this year. The Humanities Council is particularly grateful for its partnership with the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, which consists of a series of targeted grant programs supporting humanities-related programs across the city. The Here's a, Who is a Washingtonian grant focuses on projects that bring different groups of residents together for discussions or programs on topics common to all DC residents, such as sustainability, economic development, and promoting community-based organizations. Our Soul of the City grants 
assist community-based organizations that develop young leaders through hands-on service-oriented experiences combined with training in communication and critical thinking. The Commemoration and Remembrance Grant Program targets groups to carry out celebrations of underappreciated events, individuals, and places that have played a significant role in DC's history. Based on our, pro our, our positive experience with these programs, we have been discussing a substantial increase in funding from the DCCAH for 2015. We're proposing an increase, a substantial increase from 170,000 to 500,000. This is a very substantial increase would be directed at expanding our current funding of grant programs, doubling their size to, uh, to include project planning and, and the possibility of multi-year grants to expand the visibility and impact of those programs and to assure that all awards receive adequate funding. Such an expansion would take advantage of our existing grant making infrastructure and our 34 years of experience in working with hundreds of medium and small size community-based organizations all across the city. Thank you, Mr. Bremer. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Schwartzman? Yes, um, I'm David Schwartzman. I'm testifying on behalf of the D.C. State and Green Party. I'm going to begin with a reminder of some of the realities that should be confronted in the D.C. budget. Uh, D.C. has one of the highest levels of income inequality in the country. The average income of the top 5% of district households is 54 times the income of the bottom 20%. Uh, compared to the 50 states, D.C. has the highest income inequality. Uh, the income benefit level for TANF recipients is now 27% of the f federal poverty level. This simple fact goes far in explaining why ch the child poverty rate in D.C. is at such a high uh, shocking level, more than 30% for black children, a human rights violation for which our own local elected government bears its share of responsibility for tolerating far too long. Remember, our district government gave its firm commitment to address its human rights violations when it became the first human rights city in the U.S. in December 2008. The majority of our residents have been subject far too long to urban structural adjustment policies framed by the Federal City Council and implemented by a local government, which privilege the top 1% income wealth bracket over the interests of the majority. Uh, the pioneer in these policies was the Inter International Monetary Fund, Who's recent, uh, which has recently changed its mind. The IMF now favors progressive tax policies to reduce income inequality. It's high time a local good government does the same. And of course, I think most of you know already that our uh, tax structure for residents is regressive abo above the highest rate paid by uh, families earning about fifty to sixty thousand it steadily goes down to multi-millionaires who pay about six percent uh, comparable to the poorest residents okay now um, we are a long-term member of the fair budget coalition and as so we strongly support the coalition's budget recommendations for f uh, additional funding for low-income programs over and above the mayor's proposed budget. These recs total $65 million, and many of them have already been mentioned. Uh, and the complete list would be in my, uh, my testimony I convey to you. Uh, in, addition, in addition, we all we urge you to fund $50 million to improve and preserve public housing as called for by Empower DC. Uh, we also, of course, strongly urge a living wage uh, for all workers, including tip workers, uh, $15 an hour would be a good target. And we support the fair budget position on taxes and revenue, make the tax system more progressive by reducing taxes paid by low-income residents and increasing taxes for the D.C.'s highest uh, income uh, and by raising the top rates. Uh, and I'm going to conclude now with uh, the following. Uh, the council can make essential repairs to the tax code that the mayor 
relegated to its wish list, roughly 30 million, and also boost the low-income budget by at least 150 million. Uh, we can do this by passing the nine and a half percent and 10 percent tax hikes for the top and uh, plus eliminate exemptions for professional services such as the multi-millionaire law firms. Uh, and this should be targeted to low-income programs and tax relief for the majority of the residents. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schwartzman. Ms. Uh, Moshiri? Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Nassim Moshiri. I'm a staff attorney at the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless. The Legal Clinic envisions and since 1987 has worked towards a just and inclusive community for all residents of the District of Columbia, where housing is a human right and where every individual and family has equal access to the resources they need to thrive. It's everyone's job to end homelessness because homelessness affects every facet of a person's life and everyone in our community, whether we're presently housed or without a home. We want to thank you for your commitment to tackling homelessness this year as a council-wide and district-wide problem. Here's why that approach is so fundamental. Housing equals jobs. Many people believe that the key to ending homelessness is increasing the income of homeless households. But we believe that the key to ending joblessness is increasing access to affordable housing. Increasing the minimum wage was a great start, but it would have to be raised to $28 an hour for a mother with two children to afford a two-bedroom apartment in D.C. It is incredibly difficult to get or keep a job when you don't have a stable home, particularly when you cannot store belongings in shelter or are forced to reapply for a bed each day, as both families and individuals experience this winter. In addition, a growing body of research suggests that providing housing assistance to low-income families will help them get and keep jobs. Housing also equals economic development and revenue. The creation of affordable housing stimulates the economy. Rental subsidies decrease vacancy rates, and housing production creates construction and other jobs opportunities that will hopefully be available to currently jobless D.C. residents. With increased job opportunities and wages comes increased tax revenues. Housing equals health. In shelters and on the street, people experience countless barriers to maintaining good physical and mental health, from lacking proper nutrition to having their medication stolen to contracting illnesses in shelter because of the close quarters. In D.C., where our HIV infection rate is officially characterized as an epidemic, people with HIV AIDS are hit particularly hard by homelessness, and studies show that mortality rates decrease by 80 percent when people with AIDS are provided housing. People who are homeless are disproportionately represented among the highest users of costly hospital-based acute care, and placing people who are homeless in affordable housing can lead to improved health, reduced hospital use, and decreased health care costs. For children in particular, housing is often the most critical health intervention. According to Children's Health Watch, a safe, decent, affordable home is like a vaccine. It literally keeps children healthy. Housing equals safety. We recently and horrifically witnessed Relisha, Woods dis Re I'm sorry, Relisha Rudd's disappearance, and people experiencing homelessness are more vulnerable to abuse and victimization than those in housing. With nearly a third of homeless families living uh, having a history of domestic violence, but with very few of those families located in secure, confidential shelters, housing can be the difference between escaping domestic violence and continuing to suffer from it. Secure housing placements also reduce recidivism for ex-offenders and make it far easier for parole officers and supportive service providers to monitor and track the activities of those on parole. The greater the housing stability of ex-offenders, the lower the risk of reoffending. The fewer community supports, the more likely a person will reoffend. Housing equals education. The absence of stable housing has an enormous impact on educational outcomes. There are over 4,000 homeless children in D.C.'s public and charter schools this year, reflecting a 60 percent increase in the last five years. When families can't even access shelter for half the year, let alone housing, it's nearly impossible for parents to ensure their kids get to school each day, they get enough sleep, that they have adequate food and nutrition to be able to concentrate on their studies. Family economic hardship is a primary predictor for poor health and academic performance. In fact, poverty had actually been shown to change brain development in children, resulting in significant cognitive and behavioral problems. Housing equals child welfare. Many of the legal clinic's clients who are homeless are forced to separate from their kids, placing them temporarily with different family members or friends so they can have a safe place to sleep. It's estimated that 30 percent of children in foster care in the United States could be reunited with their families if they just had adequate housing. It's time to make a meaningful investment in affordable housing programs that can help end homelessness now. Now it's also the time to ensure year-round access to emergency shelter for all D.C. residents who need it, because allowing anyone to stay on the street will cost us much more in the long run. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Moshri. Okay. Uh, Ms. Coventry? You may have to pull that closer.
Thank you. Ch Chairman Mendelson and Council Member Bombs, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Kate Coventry and I'm a policy analyst with the DC Fiscal Policy Institute. DCFPI engages in research and public education on the fiscal and economic health of the District of Columbia with a particular emphasis on how families impact, how policies impact low and moderate income families. I'm here to, today to testify on family and individual homelessness and what the district can do to improve its homelessness response. Helping Families Home, a roadmap for the district. 25 nonprofit organizations, including DCFPI, have released Helping Families Home, a roadmap for the district, a community report laying out the actions the district must take from now until next spring to put DC on a path to a system that serves families appropriately with the goal of quickly connecting families with the right services, including shelter if needed, when they need it, regardless of the time of year. This unfortunately hasn't been the case in DC for the past several years. Families have been able to enter shelter only when it's cold. Shelter conditions have been deplorable, and many families have been in shelter far too long. The unexpectedly harsh winter we faced this year brought the crisis of family homelessness system into sharp focus. No one wants to repeat the crisis when some families were placed in recreation centers, which the courts found could lead to irreparable harm to children, and only on nights when it was below 32 degrees. Yet without sufficient planning and funding, the likelihood is high that the crisis will be repeated next year. And in order to avoid this and lay the foundation for a high quality family homelessness system, the report lays out key goals and the steps needed to achieve those goals, some of which are already in progress. The roadmap fo focuses on five key areas. Safe and adequate emergency shelters for families when they need it. Families with no safe housing should be able to access shelter year-round. They should not be forced out when the weather gets above 32 degrees, and they should be sheltered in safe and decent settings. As the district develops a new emergency shelter system, improvements at DC General in both the facility and services are needed to ensure the well-being of vulnerable families with children. Second area, a system that quickly connects families with the right services to limit their stay in shelter. We should build the capacity needed to assess families, match them with resources, and move them out of shelter within 30 days. This can improve the family's well-being and reduce the risk that shelters will be filled beyond capacity. The third area is a robust set of tools to meet the unique needs of each homelessness family. We need strong prevention and diversion programs to help families avoid needing shelter. We need to strengthen rapid rehousing, the main tool we use to move families out of shelter quickly. And we need to take a closer look on how to better meet the needs of DC's youth-headed households that represent a large share of homeless families. The fourth area is affordable housing for families. Efforts to move out families out of shelter must be coupled with investments in long-term affordable housing. The fifth area is improved data on performance budgeting and spending. There's too little information available both for the public and for policymakers on these key issues. Importantly, the roadmap identifies the funding needed in FY 2014 and 2015 to achieve these goals. When all resources available in FY 2014 are considered, the FY 2015 budget for homeless families represents a decrease of 11 million or 20% from the FY 2014 adjusted budget. But we can't let the huge increase in the number of homeless families shelter out of the needs of individuals who are also facing the crisis of homelessness. Far too many individuals are homeless in the district and many of them have been homeless for years. As a member of the Way Home Campaign, DC Fiscal Policy Institute uh, supports the budget asks outlined by Kurt Runge in the previous panel. Finally, DCFPI recommends that funding be added to the FY 2015 budget to continue the work of the CCNV task force. On any given night, nearly 20% of DC's homeless individuals stay in that building. In light of these, effort, of these numbers, efforts to help the district's homeless individuals must include a plan for CCNV. It would be helpful for fun to have funding for professional data analysis and modeling assistance. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Sir, I don't know who you are. Okay, I didn't hear you respond when I called your name. No, you never Sorry. called my name. We called you. Uh, actually, I did. Please proceed. Oh, thank you. Once again, my name is Robert Warren. I'm uh, current director of People Friends Coalition. We're an advocacy group who has been advocating for a process for individuals to end their homelessness and jobs in the District of Columbia for the last six years now. And as a lifetime district resident, you know, I'm really proud to live in a city that I can go from being homelessness to having a place to live to now through an organization called MANA to be able to actually maybe become a homeowner in the District of Columbia. But with that said, I'm also very sad that over the last six years as we've been advocating for a process for people in their homelessness and jobless in the city, 
and their housing roles that uh, this city council and you know the mayor has just been not here in district residence far as putting forth policies and a plan to address the housing crisis in the city. And for me, I come to the conclusion, I don't know if the leadership cares or if the leadership is really concerned about low income district residents in the city because of the policies or the lack of policies that they have put forth and the lack of planning that have come forth from the leadership. So with that said, you know, I, I think the budget reflects that, that train of thought that some district residents really don't matter, that some district residents we're not going to help, we're going to let die out on the streets of Washington, D.C. We're going to let stay warehouse and shelters, and we're just going to act like we don't see those individuals. We're not going to, we're not going to ask uh, realtors or builders to contribute their fair amount to provide affordable housing. We're not going to ask that high income, income residents pay a little more so low income residents can have some place affordable to live. We're not going to ask that anybody that's living out here that can contribute something to the process contribute something to the process. And so, I mean, we're going to keep fighting, and hopefully, you know, the leadership of the city will realize we had a one-city summit, and district residents said their number one issue was affordable housing, but nothing comes from the leadership to address the district residents. They act like they don't hear. They only hear the guys who come in with the bags of money. That's the only people they hear. That's the only people they listen to. That's the only people that have a voice. And so I don't know when it's going to stop, Mr. Chairman. But hopefully, you know, it will stop with you. Because the mayor, he doesn't believe that people deserve uh, a right to housing. He doesn't believe that. He believes that certain people need to earn enough money and get that housing. And I hope that you don't, I hope you don't believe that, Mr. Chairman. I really do. And I hope you know, some leadership will come from you and you'll come forth with a plan to address the housing crisis in the District of Columbia. You'll come forth with implement policies that will truly address the housing crisis in the District of Columbia. Because right now, I see nothing from nobody. I hear talk of $10 billion, what is it, a billion dollars over 10 years, which is a drop in the bucket, truly for the people who are dying in the city. And just one last thing I'd just like to say to you, you know, Mr. Minson, uh, uh, I believe, you know, when, we first, when I first visited you and met you, you know, you seemed very unknowledgeable of people, low-income people in the city, as far as their housing, the housing crisis they're in. And I, I believe that, you know, you had enough time to really be knowledgeable now and to come forth with some plan that's actually going to address this crisis that we're in in this city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Uh, several of you did not give us a statement. Uh, if you want us to have it for the record, please do so. Mr. Schwartzman, Mr. Warren, Ms. Coventry, we don't have your statement. If we got it. It wasn't circulated. Um, uh, Ms. Um, Moshiri, I, I did a quick uh, addition of the last page of your testimony. That adds up to $38 million. Um, are you confident that if we were to fully fund all that, that it would be spent well? Yes. <laughs> are we spending the money well now? Um, I think that there could be some improvements to the way some of the programs are run, but I, I think that um, especially for uh, the local rent supplement program, permanent supportive housing program, um, uh, Yes, I think that that money would go a long way. Those are those programs are working really well. They've served uh, thousands of DC residents um, well, and they should be serving thousands of more DC residents. You do realize that this competes against other priorities, such as the Education Committee trying to find money to fully fund the um, at-risk wait for um, for kids that are 
generally free and reduced lunch that uh, we believe in order for them to have the best chance of succeeding in schools that, uh, that we need additional resources in those schools. I think that shortfall is about $30 million. Where are we to find all this money? Um, I mean, I, I look to you and the rest of the council members to, to try to find the money. I think increasing revenues is a good way to start. I think it's a shame that uh, these programs that serve the, the same population of people and uh, have to compete against one another because, I mean, you're right in that, uh, you know, that is an equally important priority, but um, housing is is key to making sure that kids have access to adequate nutrition and, and are in school. And, and I think that um, the, the money for these programs can't, that they can't be in competition. We have to find the revenue somewhere else. We have to uh, make these priorities for uh, the district. And, and like we do for other things, we have to just find the money somewhere. Um, but I, I look to our city leaders to do that. I'm reminded of a colleague who likes to point out the uh, growth in our revenues over the last 10 years, which I think is basically the budget since 2000, I know it's a little bit more than 10 years, I believe has basically doubled, which is to say that we've probably over the last 14 years found about four, um, $5 billion. That's a lot of money. And um, I'm not sure the answer is to just simply increase revenues when we've seen significant revenue growth. Well, I'm not familiar with every program and agency in the district, and I'm sure there are cost savings somewhere to be made. Um, I just don't think those savings should be made in the human services um, programs. Councilor Bonds, do you have any questions? Um, no questions, but um, I, I really appreciate the testimony that you've provided, um, particularly as it relates to our social services and. Um, uh, I, for one, am not interested in any cuts in our social services, so. Um, and we'll be looking for some resources that can address some of these um, glaring issues that have been around for a uh, number of years. Thank you. And the um, humanities community doesn't have to worry. Um, we so very much appreciate those projects that you do. Um, I'm just very curious, how did we come up with um, 127 neighborhoods? That's quite a lot of neighborhoods in our little square area. <laughs> there are a lot. There are. Uh, our insignia uh, has all of the different neighborhoods in different colors, and it's quite a crazy quilt. Um, that's basically material that we were provided by the HBO. Okay, all right, thank you. And thank you, um, Mr. Um, Mr. Warren. Um, very passionate um, presentation. Appreciate it very, very much. It, it's, it, it puts um, people square at the center of our budget, and we thank you very much. And Mr. Salzman, always nice to see you. I know where you are. You know where I am with you. Okay, thank you all very, very much. Uh, Thank I, had, you. I had one other question for Mr. Bremer. In, in your testimony, you spoke to re working with the, um, the um, let me see, um, I think it was the Commission on Arts and, to increase the funding from 170 to 500,000. But then you also said, um, we are requesting the City Council support an increase in the DCHPO's funding in the Humanities Council from 83000 to 100000 Is that increase, it's very small, is that in the budget or are you asking that that's on top of the budget? No, I believe that's in the budget. You believe that's in the budget. Okay. Thank, thank you each of you for your testimony. Ms. Coventry, you seem to think that you'd given us your testimony. Will you double, double check? check? Thank you again, each of you. Uh, Dan Wedderburn, who's with uh, DC for Democracy. I'm going to uh, come back to AOBA in a second. Uh, Brian Adams, is Mr. Adams here? Uh, Michael Weinsick, who's president of Weinsick and Associates Architects and Planners, is he here? 
Uh, ben Roberts, who is pastor, founder of United Methodist Church. And then I'll come back to Aoba. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, Mr. Uh, Wedderburn, we'll begin with you. Okay. Um, Good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, Councilmember Anita Bonds. Uh, I'm especially pleased to testify in, before you for the first time. Um, uh, my name is Dan Wedderburn. <clears throat> I chair the Government Reform Committee of D.C. for Democracy. D.C. for Democracy is a leading, non-aligned, progressive organization in the district with over 500 members. Three long-standing myths about D.C. were dispelled by tax experts invited by the Tax Commission to present their findings. The first myth is that D.C. has a progressive tax system. When all taxes are included, income, property, sales tax, uh, the, the, the facts are D.C. has a regressive system. Data from the Chief Financial Office shows this too. A second myth is that D.C. residents pay far higher overall taxes than the surrounding areas in Virginia and Maryland. Residents here pay lower overall taxes. The third myth is that D.C. businesses pay far higher taxes than our neighbors. The reality is no significant differences exist. Moreover, fully two-thirds of D.C. businesses don't even pay the 9.975% business franchise tax rate. Further, Maryland owners of D.C. businesses receive a 100% credit on their return. Another long-standing myth, really a fear, is that D.C. with the highest 8.95% tax rate on individual incomes will cause the wealthy to move to Virginia. No data at all exists to support this. Since this rate went into effect, CFO data show property values continue to rise rapidly in our wealthy areas, including Foxhall, Spring Valley, Wesley Heights, Georgetown, and Forest Hills. Nor is there evidence of an increase in for sale properties there. Maintaining this tax rate instead of reducing it means households with taxable incomes of $1 million will pay about $1,950 additional. Taxable income note is much less than total income. Those with taxable income of $1.5 million will pay about $3,450 more. Who at such income levels and beyond will move to Virginia with its suburban sprawl and seven-day-a-week traffic gridlock? The district ranks third among the largest cities in terms of income equality. This is the truly great issue of our time. In a city where elected officials and candidates all claim to be progressives, none can claim this mantle by supporting the massive shift in wealth that's well underway. It is a huge threat to government by and for the people. If D.C. is to become the great city we aspire to, nothing is more important than to focus on ways to substantially reduce the burden on the poor, low-income earners, and most of all, our thousands of at-risk youth. This should be a top priority in fiscal 15. The Tax Commission has made sound recommend many sound recommendations that should be adopted, uh, and I, I, I kind of skip over. Uh, I just want to say, uh, uh, that, uh, well, finally, D.C. for Democracy pr proposes funds be provided for year-round housing for the homeless and to provide expanded tutoring and mental health programs, especially for at-risk children. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wedderburn. Mr. Adams? 
Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson and Council Member Anita Barnes. My name is Brian Adams. As always, I am honored to be testifying before you on this day. I am a longtime Jubilee housing resident in Ward 1. If my name seems familiar, it is that I am also a longtime advocate for affordable housing on behalf of the Housing Production Trust Fund. On April 19, 2004, I sat in front of you all for the first time to ask for more funding for the Housing Production Trust Fund. Ten years later, and over a dozen testimonies, I am still here asking for the same thing. When we at Jubilee Housing joined the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing Economic Development, that's when I became aware of the trust fund and what it could do. The Housing Production Trust Fund helped to renovate my apartment. If it was not for the trust fund, that would have never been achieved. Our apartment building will, be, will have been condemned and I will have need to find somewhere else to live. So I became friends of the fund and continue since then to protect and defend on behalf of the Housing Production Trust Fund before all of you. I am a testament to what the Trust Fund had done and continue to do for so many others as well. During my tenure of testifying to all of you over the years, I have witnessed the Trust Fund going up and down like a yo-yo. This needs to stop. The, the, there need, there need to be a way to stabilize funding for the Housing Industry Trust Fund permanently. I, along with the coalition, support the BSA language committing one half of all unrestricted surplus dollars to the Housing Industry Trust Fund once savings obligations are met. This is greatly needed. That is why we believe a minimum of $100 million every year is a start to make sure funding is allocated to projects that are in the pipeline and for projects for future development of affordable units. I believe the surplus money is the right way to get there. If it had not been for the support of the Housing Industry Trust Fund and the local rental subsidy program, I don't know where I would be today. One helped to create, the other helped to subsidize. Both are great housing tools. Mayor Gray talked about 10,000 affordable units by the year 2020. How can that happen while investing in the trust fund? It would be impossible. So many people in our beloved city need a place to live that they can afford. Whether they are homeless, disabled, families, and our seniors, everyone should have an opportunity to have a place called home. I know we can do this. I know it can happen. And I believe it can be done. But if I didn't, I would not have given 10 years of my life and continue to advocate today on behalf of the Housing Industry Trust Fund. Thanks to all of you for allowing me to testify here today. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Um, Mr. Weinsick. Uh, thank you, Chairman Mendelson and uh, members of council. Um, my name is Michael Winsick. I'm president of Winsick and Associates Architects and Planners. Um, we specialize in multifamily housing and do three to 5,000 units of affordable housing a year, um, the largest percentage of which is in Washington, D.C. Um, as such, I'm uh, visiting between three and 10 projects within the district, um, affordable housing projects within the district every uh, month and looking at existing conditions and trying to determine how um, they can be improved. Um, so therefore, we, we're seeing exactly what's, what's out there. Um, and we are here to, in, to uh, speak in support of the uh, Housing Production Trust Fund and look for an increase to the Housing Production Trust Fund. Um, being an architect, I think the pictures are, or drawings are worth a lot more than words. Um, and so I gave you a package. Pictures one through six are existing conditions of recently visited projects and occupied units. As you can see, the first unit is full of water damage. People live 
in this apartment. In this, in this property, in multiple units, the kitchens have uh, buckets under the sinks, and you have to take the bucket to the toilet to empty it. Um, picture two is an occupied unit as well. In this unit, the gas line had failed. They were told to use the neighbor's kitchen. Um, you can see also that the windows are failed, and so this is a winter picture, and they've covered it with plywood. Um, another example of an existing condition, the floors are missing here, and that's actually asbestos mastic that's exposed. People live in this, these conditions, and I think most people in the city don't realize what the conditions of affordable housing in the district are today. The next picture, uh, number four, is just a typical corridor in one of the, the high-rise buildings we go into and how dark and dangerous they are with muggings happening um, regularly. The picture five is where a resident had actually pulled out a cord and the whole um, device pulled out of the wall. Very dangerous. And then finally, an existing condition under a building where the pipes are all broken and raw sewage is going into the, uh, into the crawl space and you smell it throughout the property. Then four pictures of existing properties that the Housing Production Trust Fund helped change. The first one is NCVA. You can see it before and after picture. It's a uh, uh, affordable senior project on uh, 14th. The second one is Parkview Towers, which was uh, changed from 260 units to 319 affordable units. Um, and you can see what, what we can do with that. Um, the third one is on Senior Romero, which was on the front page of the Washington Post um, metro section yesterday. And then finally, um, a property that's mixed income um, where 20%, through the PUD, 20% of the units in the 560 unit uh, new building uh, have been made affordable. So I thank you for your time, and I really believe that understanding what people live in today um, will help you understand why we need so much more money for the Housing Production Trust Fund. Thank you. Um, Mr. Roberts? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the council. Uh, Founder United Methodist Church has one, of, has one of our goals seeking an end to chronic hopelessness in Washington, D.C. That effort requires both immediate action and long-term strategic planning like what has been presented by the Way Home Campaign, the ICH Plan for Permanent Supportive Housing, which needs to be funded, the Helping Families Home Roadmap, uh, and another aspect that is crucial to reducing the number of homeless popula in our population in Washington is the adequate funding of the Housing Production Trust Fund. Faith communities, nonprofits, tenant associations, cooperatives, advocacy groups, and the undersigned organizations urge your support of the Housing Production Trust Fund with an annual funding of at least $100 million to achieve the district's housing goals. The Housing Production Trust Fund is crucial to the diversity and economic prosperity of the residents of Washington, D.C. Thousands of district residents have been impacted by the rapidly increasing cost of housing. These rising costs are leading workers to pay more than half their income in rent, forcing many to live doubled up or in low-quality apartments and contributing to the high rates of homelessness experienced by families in the district. The Housing Production Trust Fund is an essential tool needed to address these issues. The Trust Fund has already produced and preserved over 7,500 units of housing, serving 15,000 people with a diversity of housing needs. With your leadership, the Trust Fund received more than $100 million in fiscal year 2014. This level of funding is needed over the long term. With consistent, robust funding, the trust fund can play a crucial role in ending chronic homelessness, making and keeping rents affordable, providing opportunities for home ownership, and allowing tenants to exercise the right to purchase. The trust fund is also a cornerstone of the district's goal of producing and preserving 10,000 new affordable units and preserving 8,000 currently subsidized units. It is time to commit to a multi-year funding plan with at least $100 million available 
in the Housing Production Trust Fund each year. We very much appreciate the proposal you have made in collaboration with the D.C. Council leaders to devote 50% of future unrestricted surplus to the Trust Fund. But as you know, it may be several years before this takes effect. In the meantime, as you prepare the fiscal year 2015 budget, please invest at least $50 million of one-time money into the Housing Production Trust Fund to maintain a $100 million uh, funding limit in the short term. We also ask that you consider using other funding sources to ensure that there is at least $100 million of funding each year for the trust fund to achieve the district's housing goals. Uh, All Souls Church, Chesapeake Sustainable Business Council, City First Enterprises, Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development, Coalition for the Homeless, Cornerstone Incorporated, CSH, DC Catholic Conference, DC Fiscal Policy Institute, DC Jobs with Justice, uh, Embassy Tower Tenants Association, Hope Cooperative, Jews United for Justice, Jubilee Housing, Kenyon House Family Tenants Association, Latino Economic Development Center, MANA Inc., Mercy Loan Fund, Mikasa Inc., Miriam's Kitchen, National Alliance for Community Economic Development Association, New Beginnings Tenants Association, and the other undersigned uh, organizations. And I'm happy to provide this at a later time. Thank you. Uh, thank you each for your testimony. Um, let's see, I have copies of everybody's testimony except for yours. The, uh, let me see, I, have, I think just a couple of questions. One, um, several of you were testifying about the, the need to fund uh, affordable housing, and the mayor has put money in the budget for fiscal year 2015, uh, and he did that, uh, as I recall, he did that for the current year, last year when we had the proposed budget, uh, roughly $100 million, I think. Uh, there's a little bit of an irony here because we're getting testimony from some folks about how we should cut the um, real, the um, deed transfer and deed recordation taxes, the tax rate, and yet that is a source of funding for the Housing Production Trust Fund. I, I trust that you're aware of that. Uh, so on the one hand, we're being told to kind of cut a revenue source because the tax is too high, and on the other hand, we're being told that we um, need to uh, maintain or increase the funding for affordable housing. Um, Mr. Wedderburn, in your testimony, the, uh, the, the essence of the testimony seems to be that um, in a way, we're doing all right in terms of our taxes because our tax burden is not as high as the myth would suggest. But um, if we are to make some changes, we ought to, uh, on the, uh, in terms of individuals, uh, try to make the tax burden, which is the total burden from different taxes, more progressive. Um, what are you saying, though, with regard to the estate tax? You simply note that the Tax Revision Commission wanted to increase the exemption. Yes, I, I had that in my testimony because I felt the timing would, would uh, trigger I, I left that out, I, but our position is that, uh, well, of course, the commission wants to increase it to um, over five million dollars. Uh, uh, the, uh, the here's the key point: the, the, the federal exemption was combined with a large reduction in the estate tax rate, and it became law due to efforts by the Republican right against deep opposition by Democrats and the President. That doesn't tell me what DC for Democracy thinks we should do with the Tax Revision Commission's recommendation. Well, we, we uh, believe it should uh, stay as it is. So you disagree with the Tax Revision Commission? Correct. Okay. Uh, Councilor Bonds, do you have any questions? No, um, thank you very much. Thank you very much to the panel. And you're right, the pictures, they grab you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Weatherburn. Always a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, each of you. Nicola Whiteman, who is Vice President of Government Affairs, Department and Office Building Association. Uh, Jackie Duke, who's Vice President of Operations, Greater D.C. Region, Brookfield Office Properties. Uh, Sherry Rosenberg, Director for Property Management and Administration, Boston Properties. 
and Joe Kessler, Permanent Office Building Association. I see three people. Good morning or good afternoon. Mrs. Is Mr. Kessler um, here today? Uh, three of us, Ms. Uh, Duke, present an abbreviated version of our testimony. You have a copy of our, our longer statement. Um, and then following our remarks, um, both Ms. Duke and, and Ms. Rosenberg will speak to some of their personal experience within their portfolios uh, as evidence of the need for uh, in support of the mayor's proposed business tax reductions. Okay, before you start, is Ed Wood here? I'll fill up that fourth seat. If Ed Wood is here, if he could come forward. Why don't you begin, Ms. Whiteman? Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Mendelson, Council members and staff. My name is Jackie Duke. I'm the Vice President for Operations for the Greater D.C. Region for Brookfield Properties. I, with me today are Sherry Rosenberg, Director of uh, Management Administration with Boston Properties, and Nicola Whiteman, AOBA's Vice President of Government Affairs, D.C. We're pleased to testify today regarding Bill 2750, the Fiscal Year 2015 Budget Support Act of 2014. AOBA members, multifamily and commercial, are reporting sizable increases to their tax year 2015 real property assessments. In many cases, members are reporting double-digit increases despite no change to the building or where, for example, an anchor tenant has departed or already vacated the property. AOBA believes that the increases are in part attributable to a new assessment methodology being utilized by the Office of Tax and Revenue. What do significant increases to real property assessment mean for the district and its budget? Sizable and unexpected increases to the assessment yield higher real property tax bills, which can negatively impact economic development and affordable housing in the district. AOBA's multifamily members are confronting rising costs, which for many must be met with the, within the context of the district's rent control regime. Unfortunately, even as one regulatory scheme suppresses rents, yet another can allow for significant increases in real property taxes. Many housing providers may thus face the difficult choice of what other demand for their resources might be put off in order to deal with those that cannot, such as a property tax bill. The unfortunate result may be a decision to defer necessary maintenance or to ultimately sell the property. Neither deferred maintenance nor the sale of rental buildings is in the district's best interest. In the district, the loss of rental housing also means a loss of affordable housing. The experience of AOBA members with tax year 2015 real property assessments has been especially striking. Members, and this goes to the issue of maintaining affordable housing, noted significant increases to the assessed value for their moderate income or affordable properties that are subject to rent control. They reported 24 to 52 percent increases for some of their rent controlled properties. Fortunately, current district law provides a solution. In 2008, the Council adopted the Multi-Unit Real Estate Tax Rate Clarification Act of 2007. The, the law, currently unfunded, requires OTR to consider government-imposed restrictions on rental income when valuing residential properties. Given the experiences with the tax year 2015 assessments, fully funding the Act is necessary to preserving the district's rental housing stock for existing residents and future generations. AOBA fully supports Mayor Gray's recommendation to lower the corporate franchise tax, currently at 9.975 percent to 9.4 percent. Additionally, the BSA includes a proposal to further reduce this tax from 9.4 percent to 8.9 percent if additional revenue is available. The district's franchise tax is far higher than in Virginia at 6 percent, Maryland at 8.25 percent. The high franchise tax in conjunction with the real property tax rate and spikes in assessed values which will yield high bills place the districts in a, in a competitive disadvantage in the region, where Virginia primarily is better positioned to compete for and attract to new businesses. The district should consider eliminating or further reducing the franchise tax to a level that's comparable to the amount levied by the district's neighboring ju jurisdictions. Adjustments to and certainly a repeal of this tax could improve the district's competitive standing in the region. Notably, the, in the re recent increase in assessed values is based on class two tax rate, which is significantly higher than neighboring jurisdictions, coupled with a new methodology for valuing properties. Owners are experiencing these increases at a time when the economic forecast for commercial properties is grim. 20 to 25 percent vacancy rates are projected for the district amid a continued increases of, to operating expenses. Federal and private sector tenants are significantly reducing their leasing requirements. Many private sector tenants are relocating to, to other jurisdictions experience double-digit vacancy rates which are negative, aggressively seeking tenants to fill these spaces. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Ms. Whiteman, how are you, are you, how are you all dividing up your time? 
But we're going to be available for any questions, and during the Q and A, they can speak to their experiences in their portfolio. She only has about your three microphone seven. even on. Green light is on. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so not, the three minutes uh, or four minutes I'm thinking of for you actually, Miss Duke can use. Oh, we, well, we right. So we well because we only have a few seconds left. I'm sorry. Are you the, is she the only one, Ms. Cook? Right, she's going to statement? present the formal statement, but maybe in the interest of time, they could speak to their experience within their portfolios during the Q&A to allow the next witness to testify, if All that right, would be. Go on. Okay. Can we finish? Many private sector tenants are relocating to other jurisdictions, experience double-digit vacancy rates, which are aggressively seeking tenants to fill these spaces. Virginia localities, for example, are actively recruiting existing and prospective D.C. tenants. The BSA's proposal to reduce the Class II rate is subject to the availability of funding based on the CFO's revenue estimates. Specifically, the BSA proposes reducing the current rate of $1.65 in the first $3 million of assessed value to $1.55. We recommend that the Council consider phasing in further reductions to the Class II rate. AOBA also encourages fully funding the proposal to reduce the deed transfer and recordation taxes from 1.45 percent to 1.4 percent. Reducing the rate will assist the district in attracting and maintaining the tenant base, which ensures that commercial properties will continue to generate revenues in the city to, that can use to meet its citizens' needs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, so the other two of you don't have a statement. Just they, you're the they, they, do have, they do have some brief remarks on their experiences with their portfolios, within their portfolios regarding assessments. Um, as further evidence of the need for the proposed tax reductions in the mayor's budget, and they can briefly highlight that now or during the Q&A period, if you like. I've often found that unscripted brief remarks can be as long as the four-minute statement. Mm. No, I think you might not think you'll find that with us. All right. <laughs> Do you want me to go? Sure. Thank Hi. You. Um, good afternoon. I'm Sherry Rosenberg. I work for Boston Properties, and we own and manage about 12 buildings in D.C. and have two uh, projects in the development phase. Um, with our tax year 15 assessments, we've seen upwards to 13 to 14 percent increases. And how that's affecting us is our real estate taxes are now making up over 50 percent of our operating costs. And the taxes per square foot in our buildings in D.C. are anywhere between 10 and 16 dollars per square foot. When we compare our D.C. properties to our Virginia uh, portfolio, we're seeing a 5 percent increase with the assessments and the taxes, um, le much less than 50 percent of our operating costs. Um, our concerns continue to be we have tenants that are located both in D.C. and Virginia and that they're smart tenants and that they're going to begin to realize that it's going to be a lot less expensive to do business in, DC, in Virginia than in D.C. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Duke? And, and again, I don't have anything else prepared, but I would like to say, as I sit and listen to everybody who came before me, there's a lot of people that have needs in the city, and we're happy to contribute to that, but we can't, what we can't do is make the mistake that a lot of jurisdictions have made and assume that you're always going to have this revenue tax base, because if you continue to make it business unattractive for businesses and landlords to be in the city, they're, they're businessmen. They're going to go elsewhere. And they're in Virginia, which we look at Roslyn, which has a 27 percent vacancy rate. Crystal City has a 20 percent. They are actively pursuing our tenants. And they can, they can have them for half the price of D.C. So at a certain point, it doesn't make business sense to be in the district anymore. Thank you. Um, Mr. Um, Wood? Yes. Uh, Chairman Mendelson and members of the D.C. Council, my name is Ed Wood. I am a Ward 2 resident and an associate broker at City Houses, a locally owned DC-based brokerage that has been serving DC residents for over 30 years. I have worked in local real estate for more than 15 years, representing countless buyers and sellers in neighborhoods throughout the city. I will also serve as the 2015 president of the DC Association of Realtors, or DCAR. I would like to reiterate the importance of restoring the funding to the Real Estate Guarantee and Education Fund. Obtaining one's license requires a serious investment in both time and money. Once you have your real estate license, you must uphold a number of fiduciary duties. Examples include disclosing to buyers and sellers that you are a licensed agent, safeguarding any funds held for the public, and never knowingly taking advantage of a buyer or seller. 
In my experience, this creates an environment in which clients feel confident that they are dealing with someone who's professional and knowledgeable. Most importantly, the entire licensure process protects district residents and the public at large by ensuring a minimum level of competence. Realtors, who are members of the National Association of Realtors, must adhere to an even higher level of ethical contact conduct as beyond what the district licensure laws require, including always putting their clients' interests above their own. Regardless, every licensed agent, broker, or property manager in good standing should strive to handle all their transactions properly. One of the most disappointing experiences for any prospective property owner or tenant is to lose money on a real estate transaction that was not conducted fairly or properly due to misrepresentation, fraud, or deceptive practice. For this reason, the Department of Consumer Protection offers relief through the Real Estate Guarantee Fund to help satisfy eligible agreed petitioners. As you may be aware, all of the money in the Real Estate Guarantee Fund was raised from fees paid by district real estate licensees. Unfortunately, since over three and a quarter million dollars were taken out of the Real Estate Guarantee Fund, innocent consumers have now lost the protection that the Real Estate Guaranteed Fund was created to provide. In addition, real estate licensees are now being required to pay replacement fees all over again or risk losing their license if for some reason they cannot pay the fees. Restoring 501 thousand into the guarantee fund would be an excellent way for the district government to stop this double charging of thousands of licensees and once again fully protect the district residents they serve. I would also like to encourage a reduction of the real estate deed recordation and transfer tax. The district's extraordinarily high recordation and transfer taxes negatively impact, impact the housing purchases and economic development. They reduce the likelihood that properties will be transferred to growing families by increasing down payments and shrink growth in tax revenue and property value assessments, uh, and push would-be purchasers into neighboring states with lower rates. A decrease in these taxes would certainly improve DC's general vitality. Every dollar residents could, speak, could be spent on home improvements, interior designs, and other products to enhance the district's communities. In conclusion, I urge you to restore 501000 to the Real Estate Guarantee Fund this budget cycle, as well as consider working with the realtors to lower the recordation and transfer taxes and make DC home, home ownership more affordable. Thank you. Uh, thank you, each, each of you, for your testimony. Mr. Wood, I had meant to ask Ms. Peters earlier about this guarantee fund. Uh, where does the $501,000 come from? Uh, I'm not calculation. sure. calculation. Uh, uh, that, that was the number. Oh. Yeah. Uh, well, he's testifying. You're not. Uh, I, I'm not sure where that number had come from. I was given that number, and I believe that was in the budget. Uh, well, is it we funded in the mayor's budget? Yes. In the wish list. In the wish list. Yes. I, I know of the fund, and I know that a few years ago, I don't know which mayor it was, whether it was Mayor Fenty or Mayor Gray, took money out of that fund. It was Mayor Fenty, yes. And I know that that's been a sore point, and that that fund is about protecting consumers. If I remember correctly, the fund is available if a person purchases property and for some reason um, is basically ripped off. And, That's correct. And uh, the fund protects them. And so the fund being underfunded is a risk to consumers. Um, if uh, one of you could get, uh, get me after the hearing or just leave over there with um, Ms. Jacobs um, how, how you came up with that 500000 I'd appreciate that. Um, you know, I'll, I'll repeat the same thing to you, um, Mr. Wood, and I'm not sure if AOBA mentioned it, maybe they did, about the deed and transfer taxes. I recognize they're very high. I also know that a portion of that tax goes into the Housing Production Trust Fund. Uh, if we reduce that tax, that tax rate, if we reduce it, then we're reducing revenues to the uh, Housing Production Trust Fund. We have to make up those revenues some other way or else we're not going to fund affordable housing, which um, is, a, is a critical demand. Um, the, um, I don't have a copy of your testimony, Mr. Wood, but I, I think you talked about what, the, what you saw as the harms of the deed, and transfer, the deed transfer and recordation taxes. 
And I don't want to minimize the concern. It's a very high rate. It might be the highest in the country. Uh, but the reality has been ever since we raised that rate, and I'm not saying it's because we raised the rate. I'm just saying since we raised the rate, uh, the revenues from that almost year after year have greatly exceeded what had been projected. And that's a reflection, Ms. Whiteman, don't turn your head like that. Um, and, and that's a reflection, I think, of the fact that it's not depressing the market. Um, and, and don't misunderstand me. Don't, don't think that I'm sitting here saying, oh, I think this is wonderful. There's a cost if we reduce the rate, but I'm not convinced that there's a harm because the rate is as high as it is. Because we have seen very, a very robust real estate market in this city almost every year for the last 10 years except during the recession. And um, that just says to me that, the, um, that that rate has not depressed economic, economic activity. Um, and uh, well, maybe you're going to say, even though I didn't ask you a question, well, the activity would be even greater if the rate was lower. I'm not convinced of that. I think people look primarily at what house prices are. And one of the problems we're dealing with, that you all are dealing with, is the fact that values are going up. And that values go up as a reflection of demand. We often forget that when we're talking about taxes. The reason why your taxes are going up, why you're testifying about the commercial property assessments going up, is because the demand is still there. And it's not that I, I think we should just sit back as a government and say, well, tough luck, you, you know, million dollars, billion dollars, pay as much as we want to get from you. I, I don't want to do that. But we overlook in this discussion about these rates the fact that the rising assessments is a reflection of increasing demand. The assessments reflect value. Mr. Wood, do you want to respond to any of that? Uh, the only thing that I would say is that uh, I have seen and, and speak to realtors every day who see people who do factor that in when they decide whether they're going to stay in the district or they're going to move to one of the neighboring jurisdictions. Uh, obviously, they're, people do have a choice of three jurisdictions in this area, which is unusual. Yes. Um, but uh, to but us now, wait a minute. And, and this applies to all of you. Um, when, when you're talking about these sizable increases, and I'm looking at AOBA's testimony, on the residential side, we have the lowest tax rate in the region. Is that not correct? Well, that's part of the equation. So yes, we have one of the lowest tax rates. rates. Huh? Well, yes, on the residential side, we do yes. have one of the lowest tax rates. But then we're also unlike I'm many. I'm not talking about the commercial. I right. I'm talking that. multifamily. Um, but what's also unique about our multifamily, yes, they are subject to a lower tax rate, uh, but they're also subject to a rent control regime. So you have yes. uh, spikes. But, but, but that wait a minute, because I, I, I knew you were going to bring that up as well. Am I, am I wrong in believing that for multifamily properties that the property owner has the ability to challenge the assessment based on income? Yeah, they, I mean, they can challenge it. Um, the, the better approach, before you even get to first level appeal, second level appeal, or challenging your, your appeal, is to get the underlying assessment right and to reflect the actual value. Well, what, I mean, what, we're, what we're hearing is that they're not taking the restrictions on income into consideration, that they're using they comparable. They have to, because well, for, yes, for, for the law, but maybe the reality is. Well, something you can different. take that to court. Yeah, an individual property owner can take it to court. And I don't want to be glib about it because I think they've gotten assessments wrong for well, years. But, the, but just so everybody understands, you know, truth in, truth in uh, hearings is that, um, you know, for the average homeowner, the, the assessed value is um, the only basis on which a homeowner can question or determine what their, the, their assessed value is, is by looking at comparable sales. But for income-producing property, the property owner can argue income. And if the income is depressed because of rent control, that's going to affect the value of the property. Right. Before you, but before you get to first-level appeal, you know, particularly the Multi-Unit Act, it says that in generating the underlying assessment, because if you get the underlying assessment correct, OTR should take into consider those restrictions on income, which goes to your point, that that should be factored in when generating the underlying assessment. But what's the difference between uh, that and using the income method for um, determining the value of the property? Well, what we're hearing is that they're not taking in, that into account. And well, that, the property that's not owner has a experience. right to, to use that. And they can right, take but why go the, through the first level? If, if you get the underlying is, assessment right, question, you never get to the first level of appeal. This is not a question of, of, um, this is not a question of the rate. 
And I don't see how it's really a question of this 2007 act that you say was never funded. That's a question of whether the um, assessment office is assessing properly. Right. Okay. I agree with that. Well, that's not before us. That's before, I mean, that is oversight. But that's, right. That's and, and before the, um, it used to be BRPA. I don't know what it's called the now. The real, real RIP tech or real property tax appeals commission. And you're correct. Yeah. That, that's, you know, part of the issue is whether or not it's generating the, the correct and accurate assessment. And that's, that's not before this committee today, it, but what is before the and committee? And it's not the revenue side of this budget, and it's not the expenditure side of this budget, right. which is what the budget's about. But it's the same, that's about how the law is being implemented and whether the assessors are doing their job correctly. And I don't want to minimize that as an issue, because mm -hmm. I recognize that particularly for income-producing properties, there are millions of dollars, typically there are millions and millions of dollars that are uh, involved there. Uh, right. But the reality is, just so everybody realizes this, is that for income producing properties, there are three ways of determining the value. Homeowners don't get that. So when you talk about how um, you're depressed because of uh, rent control, but you can reflect that because that does actually affect the value of the property. Oh, I, I am less likely to pay as much for your rent control building as for your non-rent control building because I know that the rents are depressed in your building and your building is an income producing property which is why I would be interested in buying it. So that's reflected in the value and you have access to that when you are challenging what the excess, assessed value is. Right, and I don't disagree with that. My my only point is that, at that point. <laughs> my my only point is that yes, there's an appeal process, and you can contest the the assessment whether or not they've taken the val those dispressed values into consideration. But the preferred approach is to generate an accurate assessment, yes. and that assessment, as you've noted, should reflect that there's uh, the income is suppressed because of statutory <laughs> restrictions on income, such as rent control. And yes. so the 2008 Act is on the books and directs. OT to specifically take into consideration statutory restrictions on income, but they're saying they, 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 they're not obligated to do that because it's not funded. And so that's, that's the but budget they implications. they have to if it affects the income, on the income uh, method for determining the value. But let's get off of that. Do you really mean to suggest in your testimony that you would like to see us repeal the franchise tax? Well, the mayor's proposal to reduce it um, from the 9.4% is an important first step. The, the point that we're trying to make is when you look at the total picture of all of, of the tax policies in the district when compared with tax policies in Virginia, uh, it puts us in a very uh, disadvantaged position to be able, in terms of being able to attract tenants and retain tenants. So it's not necessarily one tax by itself is when you're looking at the high class two uh, real property tax rate, uh, in addition to the high franchise tax, in addition to the other costs. And so tenants and, I get and look at the total picture and say, you know what, it, it, as, as uh, Ms. Duke noted, it's, it, at a certain point it makes sense to, uh, to locate into Virginia or well, Montgomery County. I don't know, um, Mr. Wedderburn testified, uh, and you were present, and he, I know he, um, was very actively involved in uh, paying attention to the Tax Revision Commission. I believe you went to most of their meetings, if not all. And he said in his testimony, the third myth is, is that D.C. businesses pay fi far higher taxes than our neighbors. The reality is that no significant differences exist. Moreover, fully two-thirds of D.C. businesses don't even pay the, the uh, business, uh, the 9.975% the business tax rate. I'll, I'll at, at least partially. I can't speak to the business tax, but I'm um, assuming he's talking about our tenants that are paying taxes. And I'm guessing what he's not capturing, I don't have his data to know, but we pay the property tax and we pass that back through to our tenants. So if you were yeah, asking. No, no, no. What I just read to you was about the franchise tax. I can't speak to the franchise. I can talk to real estate tax. Well, I again. absolutely know that the commercial real property tax is uh, the highest in the region. And by far, yes. <laughs> Even though the first three million is a one fifty-five, one sixty-five, so one sixty-five, yeah. and hopefully will be one fifty-five um, if funded by the council. And we we compare um, about three to five dollars in Virginia, Maryland, to ten to twelve in DC for property tax. The tax That's revision right. commission. Now oh, this is a commercial property tax rate comparison. That's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure why you showed this to me, because it does say we have the highest. Um, 
Well, it's the highest Silver Spring's a little bit franchise higher. tax as well, because Virginia is 6 percent, and Mar I'm sorry, Maryland is 8.25, and we're currently at 9.975 percent. Um, but again, you know, part of our concern is that the business, the, the tax structure in the district um, handicaps our ability to uh, effectively compete with Maryland and Virginia. And so we are losing tenants uh, because they're looking at all the costs. So it's not just the franchise tax. It's, you know, for those who have to pay that, it, it's the class two property rate. Uh, it's the business regulatory climate. Um, you know, the, the downtown bid, for example, issued a report and looking, uh, this is a 2013 report, that 79% of the businesses that left the district went to Northern Virginia. And, and why is that? Because there's, it's, it's the lower business, the lower taxes, uh, a more business friendly climate. And, and Northern Virginia is marketing itself um, you know, it's saying, you know, come locate here or move from the district because our taxes are lower, because we have a friendlier business regulatory environment. So they're, they're taking advantage of that to say you don't need to be in the district, come across the border. I, I get that. I get that. But that wasn't really my question. I started out by saying, do you, are you serious in recommending that we ought to repeal the franchise tax? Well, there should be a real consideration of what the business climate, the tax rate in the district is, if we are going to continue to sustain the kind of That's development. Well, well, it's, it's something that should be on the table. Uh, we fully repealing the franchise tax. Again, as part of the tax package in the district. I think the reduction in the mayor's budget is an important first step. Um, maybe even if, if not repealing it, certainly putting it, reducing it to a level that's competitive with Maryland and Virginia. Again, uh, Maryland is 8.25, Virginia is 6 percent. The 9.4 percent is still much higher, but it's definitely a move in the right direction. So th there needs to be some consideration about how our tax structure is going to be amended so they can really compete with other jurisdictions. And so maybe that's part of the discussion, or maybe the discussion is about further reductions in the but franchise what, tax. What about the statement that I read to you that, um, and, and I don't know that it's accurate, but um, the statement that two-thirds of businesses in the district don't pay the franchise tax. I, I know that that's possible because the franchise taxes, you know, income can be offset by expenses. Right, and I don't and remember. So it's, it, it's manipulable, and I don't mean that in a negative way. Right. You know, the real property tax is not manipulable. Exactly. Uh, and I get that that um, actually, I mean, that, that is for real hits businesses. But the um, income tax, uh, I, what I've always heard from tax experts is that that is a less significant tax on businesses. Right. And again, it, it's not one tax in and of itself. It's the combination of those taxes that make the district a very uh, expensive place to do business. Uh, and, and also, it's the importance of, of signaling. That's something the Tax Revision talked a lot about, whether or not you know, making certain reductions or changes to the tax rate or the tax structure, what that does to signal to prospective tenants and existing tenants that this is a place we want, we want you to stay here, we want you to relocate here. And so even sometimes nominal changes in the tax rate is enough to say that this is a, this is a location that's, that's welcoming, we want to grow our economy, we want to attract new businesses, we want businesses to locate in you know, every ward of the city. Um, and so when you make changes, it's not just about, well, the, importantly, it's about the actual cost of doing business, but it's also about the public policy goal of, of signaling to prospective tenants and existing tenants to come and locate well, the district. you know, and that's, that was exactly the point that the Tax Revision Commission made. It might have been former Mayor Williams when he presented that recommendation. Yes. Because as I recall, I pressed him on the point that uh, we would do much better for businesses if we reduced the real property, the commercial real property tax rate rather than the franchise tax rate. And I wouldn't disagree with you. And um, the answer that I got was uh, that, uh, well, we can reduce, I forget what the Tax Revision Commission recommended, maybe a percentage point drop? Well, not on um, the class two rate. They, I, no, no, I'm talking uh, about on the, the franchise tax, yes. I think it was a dropping at a um, percentage point. Yes. And, um, and uh, they said that they could do that far more cheaply than to drop the commercial real property tax rate significantly. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the, the, um, the dollars in front of me, but I have in my head that a one cent drop on the commercial property tax may, might be a reduction of $6 million in revenues. And, you, uh, I, 
I, I may be off. I, I know I'm, I doubt that I'm too high. I might be too low. The point being, if you want to lower it 40 cents, which would get us in the range of Virginia, that would cost $240 million, if I'm right, in lost revenue. Whereas the franchise tax reduction that the mayor is talking about is what, maybe 10 million? Right, I don't, I don't remember the exact numbers too. Um, and certainly we recognize, for example, going from a dollar 85, we're not suggesting, for example, going from a dollar 85, just for sake of argument, to a dollar overnight is the appropriate course of action. Um, but there needs to be some consideration given the economic realities, the changes in the market, uh, the, the rising vacancy rates, uh, federal retention, um, private sector retention, that, that this kind of golden goose is not here anymore. And so there has to be some discussion about some adjustments to the class two rate. And, and one of the things that the mayor had discussed, um, and shared in testimony for, to the Tax Revision Commission, and I believe Council Evans and others did, was whether or not there could be consideration of a phased-in approach. And I think that's the better model that's more fiscally uh, sensitive, is that you obviously couldn't go from a dollar eighty-five, and again, just for sake of argument, to a dollar thirty overnight, but some modification, some reduction to the class two rate. And, and you're right, that, that, that could have a significant impact because of the comments that you've made and the comments my colleagues have made. Those are pass-through costs. And so those are things that tenants will take into consideration, um, particularly since you've heard now, you know, taxes are now 50 percent of operating expenses. It used to be the utilities was the largest item on, in terms of your operating expenses, but it's become taxes. And so if you want to have, for sake of argument, the most bang for your buck, and a reduction to the class two rate um, is, is an important step. Let, let me read to you an excerpt from the um, Tax Revision Commission <laughs> report, um, and then I will recognize Mr. Berry. Unfortunately, there is little information about effective business income tax rates because the business income tax, with deductions, credits, and other expenditures that affect what a business ultimately pays, is difficult to calculate across types of businesses. As noted, a majority of district businesses pay the minimum tax, not the statutory rate. States often add other significant taxes to supplement their business income tax. A study presented to the Commission, that's the Tax Revision Commission, on regional business tax comparisons described some of these supplements and illustrated how they can increase the business tax burden substantially. The study concluded that, although the district has a higher business income tax rate than Virginia and Maryland, the, quote, tax burden in the district for C corporations is not significantly different from its Maryland and Virginia neighbors, unquote. This is in part because, quote, the gross receipts tax in Virginia in some situations eliminated the tax savings of the Commonwealth's 6% business income tax rate, unquote. Just saying, with regard to the, the, the franchise tax rate. Uh, why don't I recognize Mr. Berry, who's joined us. Thank you, Chairman. I rather uh, say my opening statement to after this panel leaves, but to be able to uh, ask questions of this panel. First of all, Mr. Chairman, as you know, when I was on the City Council, I was Chair of Finance and Revenue. We did some revolutionary, progressive kind of things in terms of half, half in the uh, taxes for senior citizens and other kind of modifications. And as mayor for 16 years, I had to deal with the income from the District of Columbia taxpayers in order to balance this budget. I keep hearing everybody talking about, Ms. Whiteman, I've known you a long time. We've had, uh, good relationships. We differ on policy issues as uh, we should because you represent AOBA and I represent the citizens and taxpayers of our city. Let me try to put this in perspective. It's a mistake to prepare, to compare tax rates, Virginia, Maryland, or Fairfax County, or Arlington County, or Montgomery County, because you use taxes to pay for services. 
what Washington has become is a city of the haves and have not. We have the highest poverty rate of any urban city in America. I repeat, the highest poverty rate of any city in America. That's reflected very easily in our Medicaid. There are over 200,000 citizens on Medicaid, a third of our population. And you only get on Medicaid if you have a certain income that's at or below poverty. Now, we've been very blessed here that those of us on the council have done 200 percent of poverty. We have a high criminal justice cost, which is economically based. People are selling drugs to get money. They don't have any money. I'm not condoning it at all. That's reality. People break in people's homes to get goods and services, to get goods so they can get some money. That's go on down the line. Virginia or Maryland does not have these high poverty costs, these social services. We're spending over $450 million in DHS alone, not to mention our foster care programs, not to mention other kinds of social services programs, not to mention uh, what we spend in APRA because of substance abuse. There's a direct relationship in terms of substance abuse of the kind of, that, that we put people in jail for and poverty. Give me an example, cocaine use. It's been royally publicized and documented that powder cocaine is prevalent among white people and crack cocaine at one point is called a dimension. So the point I'm making here is that let's, we're not comparing the right comparison. We can compare the rates, of, of course, but you don't look at the other kind of costs. The other thing that's quite much bothers me, these same business people who advocate reduction in taxes don't hide DC residents. There are 300,000 jobs in the private sector, 300,000. And yet, we look at the employment, 70%, 70% of those jobs go to non dc residents, 70%. If you look at, we can't, we can't pass a simple income tax, a community tax, as you call it. If you live in New Jersey and work in New York, you pay two taxes. You pay a simple income tax to the state and a community tax to the city of New York. So I'm just put this in, I don't have any, I don't want to, I, there's, not, there's nothing you could say to change my mind about that. So I'm going to vote against any tax reduction. I may be in the minority, but I'm going to do that because we have these high social costs that other places don't have. We have these high poverty costs that other cities and counties and Virginia and Maryland don't have. I understand why you would make that comparison because that's where it's always been. When I was chair of the Committee on Financial Revenue and the Council, the same arguments were made. But I will ask you this in terms of the vacancy rate of, of, of office space. What is the present vacancy rate? The, the present vacancy rate for the district? Yeah, for, for office space. Yeah. Um, probably about 12 to 13%, and much higher in, in the neighboring jurisdictions. You've got some jurisdictions that are in the 20%, 35%. Then you can't make that comparison. There's some businesses that lose their advantage if they move out of the district. That's not necessarily the case anymore because you can move, you, again, you can move to Northern Virginia, and, and we've got examples of that, uh, where you have it, you're, you're, it's metro accessible, you're just across the river, um, can you, you have a tax rate. I did this table, it was sent it to me on Monday. A list of companies that have moved out of the district and indicate what that tax bill was and to do an extrapolation 
as to was that the only reason they moved out of the district was taxes. I suspect there were some other reasons. One reason may be that the majority of their employees live outside the district and therefore to move to Arlington County, or to Fairfax County, uh, Montgomery County, uh, may be more convenient for the employees. There are all kinds of factors that you give for moving besides taxes. Do you agree with that? Right. I mean, there are, there are many factors which a, a company will take into consideration in, into moving, um, and certainly taxes is, is a part of that and a significant part Isn't of that. Isn't that the only one, though, right? Yes. It's not no. the only one, but it's certainly a, a, a no, factor. No, I understand. It's a factor. Take into consideration. the only one. That's what I'm trying to establish. Hmm? When people start talking about taxes, I have to make sure that I say thing to some of my colleagues. My colleagues talk about uh, raising income tax on, on the top 15, 20% of our population. And they say, well, we're going to run people out of the district. That's BS. I don't believe there's any person who is paying high-end taxes is going to leave only because of the taxes. They have to buy a new house in somewhere else and sell that house here been living here forever. And so we have to be very careful. This is for the public more than you and I. We just have a, a fundamental disagreement because of who you work for. And I understand that. And so I really uh, appreciate uh, you all coming. I didn't hear the other testimony. Well, I've heard your testimony down here a couple of times since uh, this budget process has, has occurred. Thank you, Ms. Whiteman, for coming. The rest of you all for coming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Thank you, each of you, for your testimony. Um, I'm trying to remember, Mr. Wood, did you give us your testimony? We're going to be, we're going to be submitting our yeah. written testimony okay. with addressing your um, Excellent. questions. Okay. Uh, thank you again, each of you. Thank you. Thank you. Samantha Waxman, public witness, Ward 1 resident, is she here? Uh, Juanita McKenzie. Uh, from the 930 uh Randolph Street Tenants Association. Uh, Lewis Perwine, public witness. Is Lewis Perwine here? If you'd come forward. Uh, I'm going to ask Bob Pullman. I'm going to take this out of order if he's here. I just saw him sitting there. He just stepped out. I'll get him with the next, or if you can get him in here. All right, Ms. Waxman, let's begin with. Mr. Chairman, can I make a statement? Um, yes. Can I make it? Uh, please begin. Thank you. Um, my name is Samantha Waxman, and I am a Ward 1 resident. I am here as a member of Resource Generation, which is an organization of young people with wealth who are working to end wealth inequality. I would like to thank the council member and the rest of the members of the council um, for the opportunity to be here today and to voice my support for a fair and progressive tax system in our city. Resource Generation strongly supports the mayor's proposal to keep the current tax rate for high income earners at 8.95%. We are also happy to see that cuts to the estate tax have not made it off the mayor's wish list and into the budget. These cuts to the estate tax would cost the city nearly $40 million in much needed revenue and would increase wealth inequality in our city, which is already the third most unequal city in the United States. If the city is going to give tax breaks this year, we believe that they should be focused on low and middle income families, including such proposals as expanding the earned income tax credit for single individuals and by raising the standard deduction. As you know, our city is experiencing an exploding homelessness crisis, coupled with a high unemployment rate that disproportionately affects low- and middle-income families. There are many harrowing stories, many of which we've heard here today, and levels of homelessness this high haven't been seen since the 1980s. In these circumstances, we need to ensure that we are prioritizing our neighbors' basic needs over tax cuts to the wealthy. 
The district's tax, tax system already places the majority of the tax burden on low and middle income families. These families pay more of their income in taxes than the richest 5%. We'll see what Lowering the top tax rate for high income earners would shift even more of the tax burden on low and middle income families, and we believe that the wealthiest people in the city can afford to pay their fair share in taxes. As a person who has inherited wealth and will inherit more wealth in the future, I do not want or need a tax break. I especially do not want or need a tax break that comes at the expense of critical social programs for residents of our city mm -hmm. who are not born into a family like mine. A cut to these taxes could mean the difference for thousands of people between eating, eating a meal or having housing or not. For me, it just means that I'd be more rich. I've worked in social services and I've seen firsthand how critical these services are to ensuring that district residents can thrive in our city. I really do believe in Mayor Gray's vision of one city that unites us all across difference in mutual well-being, but we can only realize this vision together if we support our most vulnerable residents by fully funding safety net services and by not burdening low and middle income families with paying the, the majority of our tax revenue. I entreat you, council members, to ensure that all tax proposals considered ensure that wealthy people pay their fair share of taxes so that we can fully fund the safety net and that if any tax relief is provided, that it goes to support low and middle income families. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Waxman. Ms. McKenzie? Good afternoon, Honorable Chairman Mendelson and Chairperson Marion Berry. I want to uh, and members of the committee, thank you for convening this hearing. My name is Juanita H. McKenzie, and I live at 930 Randolph Street Northwest. I have lived here since October 25, 1974. I am the former president of the 930, 940, 960 Randolph Street Tenant Association, founded on August 12, 1981. I have been a member since our conception. We are a very strong association consisting of 61 members in an 84-unit complex. We are a very strong association consisting of 61 members in an 84-unit complex. I am here to testify today on behalf of the Tenant Association, seniors, low-income, disabled residents, families, and single moms with children on fixed income, native Washingtonians, and immigrants concerning the proposed 2000 15 budget. I want to ask the council members to support $100 million in the trust fund this year and commit to funding the trust fund in the long term by passing the Budget Support Act language committing one half of all unrestricted surplus dollars to the Housing Production Trust Fund once savings obligations are met. The Housing Production Trust Fund is the only local fund for the production and preservation of affordable housing in the District of Columbia. It finances all types of affordable housing from transitional, permanent, supportive housing, rental, limited equity, cooperatives, and home ownership. It is one of the most successful housing trust funds in this country. We need to invest in the tools that we have. My building at 930 Randolph Street was sold on December 1, 2011. This is the second time that my building was sold. While interviewing prospective buyers, we came across many developers who were interested in preserving the affordability of our buildings. However, because they were unable to get money from the Housing Production Trust Fund, they were outbid by a larger development corporation. Now, there is a possibility in voluntary displacement of long-term residents such as myself be because the new owner has threatened to increase rental rates of the property. I have lost my job and I know that I cannot afford market rent because I'm on a fixed income now. Any real solution in addition to uh, to address our current affordable housing needs must also include preservation of apartment buildings like mine. Money in the Housing Protection Trust Fund would help to preserve the affordability of my building. My home on Randolph Street is in the historic neighborhood of Petworth. Petworth is one of the largest neighborhoods in D.C. and houses over 20,000 people um, in the district. My Ward 4 community is a fantastic, multicultural, diverse group of people, just like the people living in my complex at Petworth Homes. It's, I'm located right next 
to the gigantic Safeway that's going up, and I think it's supposed to house over 200 units. As you can see, I live in a wonderful neighborhood, and my neighbors and myself want to continue to live here. Petworth has a real sense of community. They shouldn't be displaced or be forced to leave. We are, in at, we are now at a critical state. The struggle for decent, affordable housing is increasingly out of reach, not only for the poorest of the poor, but for the middle class as well. We should all care because high cost of living is bad for our communities and our economy because it doesn't allow people to send, spend money on other wants and needs. Affordable housing is key to sustaining successful communities. Please support $100 million in the Housing Production Trust Fund. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, uh, Ms. McKenzie. Uh, Ms. Mr. Perwin? Perwin, that's correct. Perwin. Yep. Uh, thank you, Chairman Mendelson, for the opportunity to testify to address your committee today. Thank you to the other council members <laughs> present. My name is Louis Perwin, and I'm, a, I'm also a member of Resource Generation, a national organization of young people with access to inherited wealth and class privilege who try to leverage those resources for social change. Today I will speak on the issue of tax fairness in the D.C. budget. It seems so much of the change in D.C. over the past two decades was meant to attract people like me. I'm a young, wealthy, high wage earner who moved to D.C. because I was attracted by the vibrant culture and exciting access provided by the city. But I was also attracted by the diversity of this place, as new residents mingle with those who have been in the city for generations, creating integrated neighborhoods of the type that cannot be found elsewhere in the region. This budget season, we have an opportunity to make sure that this diverse city persists. In his recent budget, the mayor had some important provisions to ensure a progressive base to fund social service, a progressive tax base to fund social services. This included a lower tax rate for people earning between $40,000 and $60,000 and the elimination of the sunset of the 8.95% bracket for people who make over $350,000. At the same time, the budget did not include an increase in the $1 million threshold for the estate tax, which would have represented a huge tax cut for some of DC's wealthiest residents. I applaud these measures and feel that they should be included in the final budget. If there are going to be any additional tax cuts in the budget, they should be focused on low and moderate income households. An expansion of the earned income tax credit for childless individuals and married couples is an increase, and an increase in the standard deduction are examples of such tax cuts. Because the recipients of these tax cuts are in greater need, more of the money they receive will be reinvested in the local economy, fostering further economic development. The fact is this, given the large and growing inequality that exists between the rich and the poor in the city and the myriad of funding needs for essential social services, we simply cannot afford the tens of millions of dollars of tax expenditure represented by proposals to lower the top tax rate and raise money by proposals to lower the top tax rate and to raise the threshold for the estate tax. The justification for such cuts, that they raise money by preventing high earners from leaving the city, is simply not borne out by the evidence. At the same time, the current situation where low and moderate income families pay more of their income taxes than the richest 5% is an affront to any idea of fairness. As a, high, as a high income earner who also stands to inherit wealth, I feel as if I am in a unique position to advocate in favor of progressive taxes in the D.C. budget. Taxes that can help ensure that D.C. can provide in social, important social services for its neediest and can remain a diverse city. I would also like to point out that when the 8.95% bracket was enacted in 2011, it was done because of the advocacy of high income earners like myself who wanted to pay more to make this city run. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Perwin. Um, Mr. Pullman. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson, Council Member Barry, other members of the Council. My name is Robert Pullman. I'm the Executive Director of the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development, also known as CNHED. For the third year in a row, budget discussion around affordable housing is focused on homeless families living at DC General and in hotels. We spend untold hours talking about how to take families out of homelessness, but spend very little time discussing why they're there in the first place and what we can do to prevent homelessness. The simple fact is the district has a severe shortage of affordable housing, and the problem is only going to get worse. 
As the city's population grows by more than 1,000 residents each month, we continue to lose affordable rental housing. The D.C. Fiscal Policy Institute reports that the district has lost half of its low rent uh, units over the last decade. As this continues, it becomes increasingly difficult for low-income residents, even with federal and local rent subsidy vouchers, to find apartments in many neighborhoods of the city. This is why CNHED believes we must commit to building additional affordable housing stock and preserving the affordable housing we already have. The Comprehensive Housing Strategy Task Force took that same position, calling for the production of 10,000 new units by 2020 and the preservation of 8,000 existing affordable units. The Interagency Council on Homelessness has adopted a production schedule that would provide sufficient permanent supportive housing financed primarily by the trust fund along with the sponsor-based local rent supplement program to eliminate chronic homelessness for individuals and families by 2020. If we instead continue to focus our attention only on the crisis of homelessness and fail to increase the stock of affordable housing, we will experience the same crisis year after year. This is why CNHED strongly supports the goal of investing $100 million annually in the Housing Production Trust Fund. We ask the Council to add $29.4 million of one-time funding for the Trust Fund to reach the targeted level of $100 million for FY 2015. I have attached to my testimony a chart of projects that show how Trust Fund dollars are being put to good use. Out of 975 homes financed under DHCD's 2013 RFP, 420 were for <clears throat> households with special needs, and 232 of those were for permanent supportive housing for chronically homeless individuals and families. The trust fund produces rental housing that will remain affordable for at least 40 years and not be affected by rising rents in the district. The district should invest also $2 million more in sponsor-based local rent supplement to provide operating support to newly produced units of permanent supportive housing. It should also support home ownership through the Home Purchase Assistance Program, which is one of the best ways to protect low and moderate income residents from being displaced as housing prices top pre-recession levels. One final comment on the Budget Support Act. We recommend striking Title II, Subtitle I, the Local Rent Supplement Amendment Act of 2014. This is a well-intentioned provision that, in fact, ties the hands of DHCD in utilizing this valuable program to assist populations that the Department of Human Services does not serve, such as extremely low-income seniors and returning citizens. We recommend that DHS collaborate with its sister agencies to allocate local rent supplement through preferences and RFPs to the populations that need it most, rather than restricting its use unnecessarily through legislation. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you, uh, each, each of you. The, um, uh, Mr. Pullman, the $100 million goal, you say that the uh, mayor's proposed budget is short by about $29.4 million? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Um, is, does that hundred million include the um, what do I want to say? The earmark from the deed transfer and recordation taxes? Yes, it does. That's forty million of the. That's forty million dollars. It's in the FY two thousand fifteen budget and forty point four, and then there's thirty point two million in the FY fourteen supplemental budget. It's being moved over into fifteen. Uh, it's, I know it's in the supplemental budget. I, yeah. I, I thought it just... But that's part of what adds up to the... Yes, that, that adds up to the 70.6. Uh, um, and just trying to reach that goal, which uh, certainly is, is one that we feel is necessary, uh, particularly until we get to the point, if we do start getting some surpluses, uh, that may, um, you know, reduce the need to add other monies. Is, is there the capacity to spend this money? Uh, yes, there is. That's one of the reasons I attach this schedule, because it shows $93 million worth of projects that we have just uh, uh, awarded uh, under the recent RFP and under the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Project. So um, we have another RFP on the street right now. My understanding is from uh, DHCD that there was 
There are two uh, tier uh, approach to uh, applying for that RFP. There's, uh, the first tier is projects that are ready to go, and they received an application for $42 million of trust fund dollars in that first round. Uh, there will be a second uh, uh, submission at the end of um, May, uh, so I fully expect that all the funds that they have um, committed to this RFP are going to be awarded. Okay, so you think they have the capacity for the hundred million <clears throat> this year, next year? I really do. Um, and and do you think they're spending the money as well, as wisely, as efficiently as they could be? I like the projects that are being funded. I mean, uh, four hundred and thirty are for um, households with special needs. Uh, Two hundred thirty-two are permanent supportive housing. So these, uh, the funding is going to the lowest income and it's going to the people that need it most. There's also other housing, uh, there's also other funding going to limited equity co-ops where tenants have purchased their building and need to rehab it. So from my looking at the projects that have been awarded, um, I think that it's being very well used. Should the Housing Production Trust Fund be used for uh, permanent supportive housing, which is housing for homeless people? From the support of housing for the chronically homeless, yes. We produce housing for, um, and that's really part of what's important to have is a housing stock uh, that is there and dependable and reliable and not subject to rent increases and other things like that that are going on in the District of Columbia. Uh, we have difficulty leasing space for people who need permanent supportive housing. And so it's important to produce that kind of housing, uh, and the trust fund is one of the major sources for doing that. Already. Well, the, um, the task force report, you referred to a task force report. Yes. Is that recent or is that the one from 2006? No, the one that just issued in February of 2013. Okay. But there was one in 2006, wasn't there? There was one in 2006. And I assume the, the most recent one is fairly consistent with the earlier one? Um, in terms of what the need is, how many units there ought to be? It, it was really done in a different way. Uh, you know, the 2006 report called for something like uh, 15,000 units of rent subsidy over a 20-year period, way behind on achieving that. Um, so this new report focused more strictly on production by 2020. Uh, but it really recognized the same issue, which was a, a, a great shortage. And in fact, that doesn't even, begin, you know, really address the full scope of the shortage. But in the 2000, the, the 2013, 2014 report, when, when is okay, the there was a 2006 report. Yes. It was the first one, and in 2013, 2013. Was the second. The 2013 report in quantifying the need that included uh, for the chronic homeless. Uh, it did not focus on chronic homeless. What I didn't mean focus. I said include. It, it, it included a reference to the Interagency Council on Homelessness Permanent Supportive Housing Plan. Uh, it did not delve into that because it knew that the Interagency Council on Homelessness was developing a specific production plan, sure. which has been developed. And that, but that plan is basically factored into the 2000. Yes, it report. is. Yes, it is. Uh, Mr. Mr. Barry, do you have uh, five minutes? You wanted five minutes for, you said a few questions in your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize to all four of you all uh, for taking that time. But the Chairman said I had to use my five minutes for an opening statement. Unlike other chairs, he doesn't like people to make opening statements after after meetings have started. So thank you all very, very much. I, I've seen each of you all down here before, particularly Bob Portman, who used to work for me. Mr. Chairman, budgets are a way that the executive and the council indicate their priorities. It's called put your money where your mouth is. People can espouse anything, but they don't fund it, then it's just for naught. And I'm a strong supporter or Mayor Gray, I campaign for him, but there's a number of things in this budget that I totally, totally disagree with him on. And uh, I saw Jim Graham just came in, so I started there. It, it is cruel and humane 
to cut the TANF recipient by 41%. That is just cruel. They're not getting enough money now to live on. It's awful. You know, even they get food stamps, and they get Medicaid, and they get other kind of uh, subsidies. They only pay a third of their, their rent in some, some apartments. It's still not very much money. Then to top it all, since 1994, there's not been a cost of living increase. Not a cost. At least the mayor put one year in this, this year, and we're going to go back. It costs us $40 million to, to go all the way back. So make sure we work hard beforehand to get the rest of that money. But these are the most vulnerable citizens in town. And I said earlier, we had the highest poverty rate of any city in America. Any city in America. Even Mississippi didn't have, where I was born, didn't have as high a poverty rate as we do here in the district. And poverty affects so many things. It affects our educational system, because kids come to school less prepared compared to a middle of up income family. The criminal justice is greatly affected by it because a lot of people in low income communities can't get a job. There's no rationalization for stealing, but they have no choice in some instances. If, if they survive, they end up selling drugs. You know, I have a, a godson, I have six god, black godsons, and uh, I've had to straighten them out, a couple of them, drop out of school, and I'm finally going to get them back in school, et cetera. But it's rough out here on low income people. And let me just say this people who are low income are not responsible for being born in poverty. God decides that. I can't decide it. You all can't decide. Nobody can decide where you're born, what color you're born, what circumstances you're born in. And so we can't blame the poor uh, for their plight. Now, we can blame them for some of the actions that they take or don't take after they get into that situation. But we need to do all we can. And we have put very little money into jobs. We ought to have the biggest job training program in America because our unemployment, even in Ward 8, was 26% last year. The mayor says, I haven't checked it out, it's been dropping. But we need a lot more money for career development, not just job training. People do just want a job they want careers. We talk about tanning, we talk about that. Why we need a lot more money in the housing reduction trust fund. We need more home ownership in Ward 8. Only 25% of the people are homeowners. 75% are renters. I love renters, but you don't have any equity. You can live in a place for 15 years paying somebody else's mortgage. When you finish doing that, you can't do it. And so I'm going to be looking very carefully at this budget. Jack, everything I've talked about, identifying $20 million uh, for arts and culture, the creative economy. And finally, Mr. Chairman, UDC. UDC has fallen upon hard times. It started with the control board. It started with the control board. And so it started going down here, made a several radio station to uh, another entity, public broadcasting. And they were asking for $21 million for 14. I don't know, I know I've moved to the as close as I need to. Should have been in there. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to talk to you personally about what we'll do about enhancing UDC. It's in the, it's in the basement right now in terms of budget. The amount of money we spend in UDC is rescue compared to Vermont and other small states that spend far more money than we do. And so that's where I come out. I don't think all the people who came down here because the advocacy can make some difference in how we uh, do it. And the final Mr. Chairman, as you know, I was, had a very serious illness, a blood infection, uh, which is serious. Uh, we didn't let people know that when I was there because we didn't want to be alarmed. But 
it kills about a third of people who get it. And God saw fit to let me be part of the two third. We appreciate that. And then all the prayers of you all who prayed daily for me, God answers prayer. He's still in the prayer answering business. And so I've uh, gotten out of national rehab. I've been recovering at home for about the last two, three weeks. Uh, when I had this blood infection, Mr. Chairman, I couldn't stand up. It demobilized my whole body. I couldn't lift up my cell phone. But now I'm walking. Uh, not as well as I used to walk, but I will get there. I don't have any assistance. I used to have a walker. And God is just good. So thank all the people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for your, your prayers and your concern. Other council members who uh, called me or came to visit me. And finally, Mr. Graham couldn't get in. That's why I didn't see him. I was on the same name. They didn't know that. He was asking for Marion Barry. He said, we don't want no Marion Barry here. And so thank you, Jim, for your, your fame. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barry. Mr. Graham, do you have any questions? Mr. Mr. Barry, not once, but twice. <laughs> and I said, I'm sure he's here. I'm sure he's here. No, 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 we don't have no man. And even when I said who I was. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing there. Uh, what do I have now? Do I have, what, do I have 30 seconds? Or you have four minutes and 40 seconds. For, for all purposes? Yes. Oh, I have so many questions I want to ask. But anyway, let me, let me see if I can get through this quickly. Uh, first, yes, we are in support of each other. We must delay the TANF cut of 41%. It's not one of the highest priorities that we have because we are not ready to cut these families to $150 a month. We're not ready. Our, our, our TANF employment program is working better and better. Uh, we still have 50% no-shows. No shows who don't even connect to it. And there are complex issues there that we have to deal with. And we just cannot, there are, there are, I remind the council that there are 11,000 children under the age of 13, and they will be the real victims of this cut. In this category, 11,000 children under the age of 13. You go and explain it to a five-year-old. You know, that there's now no money at all to do nothing. Anyway, we've got to do that. The second thing is, Mr. Chairman, you will remember in the, the, uh, the, the power exemption, which means that this particular category would not be subject to the, the uh, 60 month cuts for TANF, was given last year by this council for people who are in some kind of educational program. And immediately after we passed it, the administration determined that they could not implement it because it was too expensive. There were too many people they had underestimated on various levels. And so now in the BSA, we find an amendment which would repeal it. And, you know, I don't have the money to fund that, but I think I do have the money to fund another power exemption, which you will remember, Mr. Chairman, for mothers who have babies under the age of 12 months. Why are we cutting a mother with a baby under 12 months? I mean, talk about inhumanity. I don't understand this at all, and I've, I got in a lot of trouble last year by suggesting that we we're throwing the babies out of the lifeboat, but I'm going to say it again because that's what we've done. A, an infant of under 12 months should not be subject to a, any kind of TANF cut. It shouldn't be happening. And so I'm, 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 I'm going to again propose to the Committee on Human Services that we fund that, and I have the funding for it. Uh, there's a strong set of arguments that people under, at this age, you know, are so developmentally sensitive in everything that happens to them that the effects are lasting of this kind of serious poverty. Mr. Chairman, I also want to close, discuss the issue of closing D.C. General by December, no later than December the 31st, 2014. We, we have been advised by the Director of the Department of Human Services that, quote, D.C. General, the building is dead is dead. And most recently he responded to written responses from my committee that quote, no amount of rehabilitation will make DC general appropriate for families. So I think we've got to marshal the will to muster the resources to close DC general, but have in place quality housing for the families that are there and quality housing for the families that present themselves. You know, the notion of having 
seven people in a hospital room is it's it just unfathomable. But also, there very often is no hot water. There very often is other problems with the building and the house, the air conditioning and the services. And are we going to forget Melissa Rudd? Let's not forget Melissa Rudd. She is still unaccounted for. And we're, people are praying every day that this little girl is alive. This happened under our watch as the D.C. government. I think we have some responsibility for what happened along with every other player in this, in this horrible tragedy. But Melissa Murad brings to mind what we need to do in terms of D.C. General. I have been meeting with the advocates, Mr. Chairman, and we have made a lot of progress in terms of creating uh, contingencies that must be met before the building is closed because nobody wants this done precipitously or fat too fast in any way. We want it to be careful. I'm also meeting, I met once with the mayor, I'm meeting again with him today to go over this issue and figure out what we can do to move people into a limited number of hotels where absolutely necessary, but also to move people into quality housing of the type that they deserve in the city. I heard the mayor say the other day that this council, uh, this government has in its savings account one billion seven hundred and fifty million dollars. Let me repeat that. One billion seven hundred and fifty million dollars is today our rainy day fund savings account, whatever. Now that gets us a lower bond rating, I know, and it, there's a lot of benefits from that. But we have got to ease up a little bit, folks. We've got to ease up a little bit. We could take some of that money and, and without impact on our bond rating and say, well, we want to shut down D.C. General. We want quality housing for families. We want to take care of babies under the age of 12 months. We want to do a lot of things that a civilized, civilized community would be committed to. Now, if we, had, if we were strapped for cash and we had nothing, Mr. Barry, if we had nothing, Mr. Chairman, if we had nothing, you'd say, oh, well, you just can't, you know, you just can't, you know, you know you'd mumble something. But $1,750,000,000 is in our bank account today, cash money. And we have this much human suffering in the city that I know things are changing in D.C. I know things are changing. The character and presence of our neighborhoods is changing. But we still have we are an urban center. We have huge problem, problems with human poverty. And the newcomers better just begin to understand that. That this is not about fancy condominiums. It's not about all of the other issues that they care so deeply about alone. It's also about the fact that we have a lot of people who are struggling to make ends meet. Cutting TANF. Cutting TANF where the monthly payment is $150 for a family of four is not the answer. If we had a family housing crisis last winter, by cutting TANF now as it's currently planned in this BSA, we can count on another family housing crisis. We're going to pay the piper sooner or later, Mr. Chairman. We look forward to your support on these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Thank you, each of you, for your testimony. Thank you. Monica Kamen, a community organizer with Jews United for Justice. Tiffany Ross, a director of community outreach and training life pieces to masterpieces. Jesse Lovell, Bobby Cavallero, Is uh, Jesse Lovell here? I'm sorry, is Jesse Lovell here? Is Bobby Cavallero here? Yes, sir. Please come forward. I can't hear a word you're saying. All right, I'll skip you for a moment. Um, Laura, Laura Dooley, is she here? Laura Dooley is uh, with State Affairs Auto Alliance. Libby Hill, is Ms. Hill here? Erica Taylor, if you'd come forward.
All right, one of you is Monica Kamen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you be begin. Uh, let me just repeat in case anybody forgot. You're on a four minute clock. There's a black box there. At one minute left, the yellow light will come on. You'll hear a little chime, and then uh, please wind up because uh, it's not four minutes plus, it's four minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Mendelson, Councilmember Graham, and Councilmember Barry for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Monica Kamen, and I'm a community organizer with Jews United for Justice, a Washington-based volunteer-driven organization that represents thousands of people in the local Jewish community who are fighting for social and economic justice in the D.C. area. JFJ has been advocating for several bu different budget priorities, both on the spending side and on the revenue side, and I would like to summarize our positions here today. I'd like to begin first on the revenue side. I urge the council to adopt the mayor's proposals to keep the top tax rate on incomes over 350000 at 8.95% by eliminating the sunset for that top rate. We also feel strongly that the threshold for the estate tax should remain at $1 million. Allowing the top rate to expire and raising the threshold for the estate tax could cost the city up to $40 million. The revenue raised from these taxes will help ensure that we have a robust safety net and city services that make our city a place where everyone can live, in addition to offsetting the cost of tax cuts for low- and middle-income families, where JFJ believes the tax cuts should be focused. Expanding the earned income tax credit for childless adults and raising the standard deduction to match the federal level are important ways to fight poverty and put money directly in the hands of working families. Um, currently in D.C., moderate and low-income families pay a larger share of their income in combined D.C. taxes than any other group, while D.C.'s highest income families pay the lowest taxes as a share of income. The JFJ community has been extremely active in advocating for a fair and more progressive tax code, and we'd like to see everyone in D.C. paying their fair share. Now on the spending side, we are extremely pleased to see that the mayor included funding for both the minimum wage and paid sick days laws that were passed in January in this year's budget. We urge the Council to protect this funding so that these laws can be implemented as quickly as possible and adequately enforced. In addition to full funding for paid sick days and minimum wage, JFJ urges the Council to fund the Wage Theft Prevention Act to strengthen and expand protections against wage theft. The paid sick days and minimum wage laws passed this year are only useful if workers are able to make claims to the government when they have not received some or all of the pay that they are owed. Finally, the JFJ community appreciates that the fiscal year 2015 budget proposes local funding allocations for a variety of affordable housing programs. However, in a city that is changing and gentrifying rapidly, we believe that the district must do more to protect long-time and low-income residents through funding for affordable housing. While the budget includes an allocation of $40 million to the Housing Production Trust Fund, the fund will ultimately decrease in funding from fiscal years 2013 and 2014 when the al allocations were supplemented by one-time surplus funds of $69 million and $31 million, respectively. We urge the district to create more sustainable funding by allocating $100 million annu annually for housing production and preservation, which would help create a strong number of new housing units each year. Additionally, the Home Purchase Assistance Program has continued to lose resources and serve fewer residents with reduced loan amounts each year since 2008. While we support the proposed increase in local funds by $1 million in, 20, in fiscal year 2015, there is still a net decrease of $2 million in funding from 2014. We urge the Council to increase funding to the Home Purchase Assistance Program in order to adequately serve its projected 260 first-time home buyers. We also support the recommended $4 million in additional funds for the local rent supplement program, yet the proposed budget allocates 75% of that funding to housing production. While I believe that rent housing production is crucial, it can take years before that housing becomes available. Rental assistance to tenants, accounting for only 25% of this funding, offers a much quicker pathway to affordable housing. We strongly support an increase in tenant-based rental assistance funding now and in the future to address the pressing housing needs of residents who cannot afford to wait. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions. Thank you, Ms. Kamen. Ms. Ross? Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson, Mendelson and members of D.C. Council. Thank you for this opportunity to speak in support of the work being carried out by the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities. My name is Tiffany Ross. I am the Director of Community Outreach and Training for Life Pieces to Masterpieces, which serves young black males living in Ward 7 and 8. We were recipients of the Who's a Washingtonian grant from the Humanities Council of Washington, D.C., which is funded in part by the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities. We were funded for our Color Me Community Conversations. 
As an organization that uses artistic expression to develop character and leadership, unlock potential, and prepare African American males to transform their lives and community, we understand the involvement of the DC community from Ward 1 to Ward 8 is essential to their healthy growth and development. There are a lot of misconceptions about young black males, and our Color Me Community Conversations engage diverse groups of people throughout DC in dialogue and artistic expression around the implications of race, gender, and cultural background, allowing our young men's stories to be told through art and shared stories, and for others in our community to share their stories. Every month we conduct a Color Me Community Conversation in a different ward in DC. The funding that the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities provides to the Humanities Council allows organizations like ours to share the history and culture of our communities. This funding has allowed Life Pieces to Masterpieces a new platform for sharing our history and the stories of the young men in our program. Each month we connect DC residents, both permanent and temporary, to each other in a way they normally would not. We are building a community of people within D.C. committed to understanding themselves and each other and moving us, Washington, D.C., a step closer to a place of shared humanity. Thank you, D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities, for supporting the work we do. I am here today on behalf of Life Pieces to Masterpieces to support the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities efforts and their support for the Humanities Council. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Uh, Ms. Hill? Good morning, Chairman Mendelson and members of the D.C. Council. Thank you for this opportunity to speak in support of the work being carried out by the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities. My name is Libby Hill, and I'm a senior trainer with Global Kids. I'm also a resident of Ward 1. Last summer, my organization was the recipient of a grant um, from the Soul of the City Youth Program Grant from the Humanities Council of Washington, D.C., which is funded in part by the D.C. Commission on the, on, on the Hearts and Humanities. The, the, the Global Kids D.C. Summer Institute engaged high school students in, in the extensive study of international affairs, career exploration, and travel abroad. The six-week program focused on global to local connections, foreign policy, international careers and scholarships, media skills, and leadership development. The Global Kids DC Summer Institute was graciously hosted at the Charles Sumner School Museum and Archives in downtown DC. Last summer, GKDC served 26 youth ages 15 through 19 from 10 high schools throughout the DC area. Our youth came from every DC ward with the exception of Ward 2 where the program was run. Throughout the summer, the youth participated in workshops, engaged with high-level guest speakers, and took dynamic field trips to places such as the Mayor's Office of Latino Affairs, Hilton Worldwide, and the State Department. The youth also participated in ongoing reflective evaluation of themselves and other peers. Through generous funding from the Humanities Council, GKDC collaborated with a humanities scholar a native Washingtonian and a Loyola PhD to survey program participants on a weekly basis. The youth authors filmed their perspectives of the program and shot footage of the program itself, helping them to refine their critical thinking and media skills. Eighty of these students um, were selected to travel to Puerto Viejo and San Jose, Costa Rica on a service learning trip for the final week of programming. This footage of the summer, both in D.C. and Costa Rica, was compiled into a film that the leaders showcased to their peers, families, communities, and other stakeholders. This event was attended by over 50 community members and parents who were eager to learn from the students' experiences. The funding that D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanity provides to the Humanities Council allows organizations like mine to relate the history and culture of our communities. It is so crucial to Global Kids' mission to develop youth leaders for the 21st century global stage. It is imperative that young people know where they come from in order to know where they are going. The results of this kind of, fu of, this kind of funding are practical and concrete. At Global Kids, we know that humanities and arts education keeps students engaged. From 2012 to 2013, we saw that our average daily attendance improved from 75% to 84% last summer. The unique film and research opportunity made possible by the Humanities Council kept our students returning day after day. I wholeheartedly support DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities efforts, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Uh, Taylor. Good afternoon, uh, Chair. Chair, uh, excuse me. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson, Councilmember Berry, Councilmember Graham, and Council staff. My name is Erica Taylor, and I'm the Executive Director of the DC Fair Budget Coalition, or FBC. As you may know, FBC is a coalition of more than 80 advocacy organizations, service providers, faith organizations, and community members concerned with meeting the human needs of the district's most vulnerable residents. I am before you today on behalf of FBC to recommend that you pass a budget for fiscal year 2015 that addresses the district's growing income inequality. DC has the third highest income inequality of all of the 50 top cities, largest cities in the country. The average income of the top fifth of earners in DC is 29 times that of the bottom fifth. That is an imbalance that cannot stand. Fortunately, through the budget process, the mayor and the city council have the opportunity to, re to make recommendations to bridge that gap between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots. We have in my written testimony the full list of our budget recommendations. I'm going to highlight just a few of those. As you know, D.C.'s current tax system is unbalanced, putting the heaviest burden on those uh, moderate income residents rather than the wealthiest who can bear it best. The Fair Budget Coalition recommends that you maintain the mayor's proposal to create a new middle income tax bracket, uh, maintain the 8.95% uh, top income uh, uh, rate, expand the earned income tax credit for childless workers, and maintain the state tax at its current level. These measures designed to help revenue generation will enable the city to better invest in its residents. One such necessary investment is adult literacy. Adult literacy is a potent measure that connects poverty, income inequality, high school graduation rates, and unemployment. The single best determinant for a child's chances of graduating high school is the mother's education. Addressing that need will have a cascading effect. 36% of DC is functionally illiterate, but fewer than 10% who need adult ed programs are getting them. We encourage you to create a cross-agency task force to develop and implement a strategic plan for improving adult literacy in the city. This is a relatively light lift for the budget, requiring only $175,000 for implementation. While family homelessness has uh, rightly been prominent in the media lately, we cannot fail to address homelessness among youth and singles. We encourage you to support the End Youth Homelessness Act of 2014 to address the latter, or former, and as proud members of the Way Home campaign, we would like to see, in the, to see increased access to permanent supportive housing. Furthermore, to better serve families, it is critical to restructure the rapid rehousing program so that it can last longer and give those largely young single mothers a real opportunity to being able to either afford market rate or be directed to more appropriate longer term housing supports. No less important is that the city must better track income from the rapid rehousing and emergency rental assistance programs. It is impossible to have a true sense of the appropriate level of future funding and the most appropriate populations to target otherwise. Finally, we encourage you to, to expand interim disability assistance by $3.9 million to reach an additional 1,200 residents in need. I'll leave you those highlights for now. Thank you for allowing me to testify and for, and for any efforts you make to help bridge the gap and the divide between the haves and haves not during the, for the, with the fiscal year uh, 2015 budget. Thank you. Thank you, each of you, for your, for your testimony. Mr. Berry, do you have any questions? Thank you all very much for coming. Let me start with... Uh, Ms. Taylor, good to see you again. I have been supportive over the years of the Fair Budget Coalition. I'm not agreed always with your priorities, but I certainly agree with the thrust of getting this city to bring some balance. As you said earlier, we have the largest gap of income inequality uh, in the nation out of the 20 some large urban cities. For instance, here, the average family income in Ward 3 is $200,000. $200,000. Whereas in Ward 8, is $25,000. That's outrageous. A country as rich as we are, and a city with an $11 billion budget is just criminal. I told the mayor this, I'm a supporter of Mayor Gray. It's criminal. So I think you're right 
in terms of this economic inequality. I'd like to get your total budget recommendations. Um, when we finish, we can come right over here and get them from you. Thank you so much. In terms of uh, art and culture, I say that in 1976, when I was a member of the D.C. City Council, I joined with Polly Shackleton, who was a Ward 3 council member at that time, and we created the Art Humanities Commission. We created the Office of Latino Affairs. We created the Office of Aging and some other eight or nine different offices. And I've been a long-time supporter. I'm on finance and revenue where the Arts Commission comes. And Jack Evans and I, I just saw him this morning, <coughs> we're determined to find, identify at least $20 million for that. You can smile. <laughs> <laughs> because the master um, pieces have been here before. The other, other problem we have in the Arts Commission's budget, we have a carve out for Eastern River. A carve out for Eastern River. We found that 50% of the grants were given to non Eastern River recipients. That's going to stop. We're going to put in the budget a requirement that if you get East River money, you got to have programming East of the River. Uh, now, there are some people have programming over, all over and East of the River, but we got to make sure that those of us who live, work, and, and, and recreate East of the River, there are 140,000 people, 73,000 in Ward 8, and about 70-some thousand in Ward 7. Yvette Alexander and I determined. So I guess my, my question to uh, Ms. Hunt. No, that's not Ms. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Barry. Yeah. Your time's expired. Mr. Thank Kim, you, Mr. Four minutes. If you have questions. Yeah. Jim, uh, finish. Thank you very much. What wonderful organizations all of you represent today. And in your case, uh, Ms. Taylor, you represent a whole bunch of others. Yes. You're here not just for yourself and not for the Fair Budget Coalition, but a whole group of others. Ms. Hill, I, I'm interested in your program. You know, I think Brian Weaver in Ward 1 has had a program where he takes young people down to Guatemala. Uh, you go to Costa Rica, though. Uh, I, I've been to Costa Rica. I've never been to Guatemala. Uh, can you, how many, how many uh, kids are involved with uh, your organization in that trip? Um, so for three years now, um, we've taken students abroad in the summer. Students have gone to Costa Rica, Haiti, and Brazil. Um, and each time we've taken between 14 and 8 students. Um, and so, and they come back and they, and they do action projects. They um, tell their schools about um, what kinds of things they've learned um, and continue to build relationships uh, with the communities that they work with. That's good. Are they DC children? Oh, oh yes, all of our students are, are DC public schools. Well, that's students. important to make and, clear. And, isn't it? and many of them come from Ward Seven and Eight. So. That's great. Thank you. Uh, look, I, I, I want to, you know, how could you be disappointed in your testimony? Jews United for Justice is a great organization. You know, life pieces to masterpieces. You know how well I know you all from my own committee and fair budget. But none of you mentioned this TANF cut. 41% TANF cut that we've got. And I know you've got to bring your own issues forward, the ones that are most on your mind, but 41% we're going to cut TANF benefits for people who've been on the program for more than 60 months. That involves 11,000 children under the age of 13. Uh, can we count on your active organizational support to oppose these cuts? And oh, you, could, no. you, could you step forward and... and and go on the record? Yeah, we choose United And you can justice. expand upon your yes, too. Don't feel like you know, That what? You can expand upon the yes, because we've got a minute and 55 seconds. Um, choose United for Justice can be on the record opposing those cuts to TANF, definitely. Okay. 
Life pieces to masterpieces? Life pieces to masterpieces. Uh, we definitely feel that this is a concern that affects our families. Uh, today, I feel as though I'm not in a position to, to speak mm -hmm. on behalf of all of Life Pieces to Masterpieces and what we would support, but I'll definitely take it back to our leadership. That's good. Um, and similarly, while I don't feel um, uh, able to speak on behalf of my organization about it, I know that um, we educate our youth about what's happening both in our communities and what's happening abroad, and um, we'll certainly be raising this with them. Good. And the Fair Budget Co Coalition fully supports uh, working to address these, ta these TANF cuts. Thank you. It's working what? To address the TANF cuts. Are you running for office? You <laughs> 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 Are you are you against them or for them? No, no, we're to address them. We're, we're against the cuts. Okay, we do not, okay, sorry, we do not want the cuts. <laughs> just have to, you see, I just pressed just a little bit, you know, but we've got to have a, you know, there are a lot of advocacy groups that are front and center on this, but we need all of the groups that we can get, every single one, to make it clear that we're not ready to end this program. It's going to end in 2000, the end of 2015 or the beginning of 2016. And, but even that should be that, I won't be here to discuss that, but I'm here to discuss the cuts on October the 1st, and I, I think that's got to be a very high priority for this council. Did you hear me mention that we have $1,750,000,000 in the savings account right now in the District of Columbia government? So what we need to delay these cuts for the full year, which is what we should do, is about $6 million. And we can do it for six months for half of that, I guess. Is that right, Ms. Burdoff? Do the whole thing. Yeah. So, but we're just going to take a lot of effort because, uh, you know, we've got to get Mr. Barry's with us. I'm with us. Mr. Graham, uh, your time is expired. We need five more votes to make sure that these, these vulnerable, vulnerable families and children are not subject to this kind of devastating reduction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Thank you, each of you, for your testimony. Uh, Jesse Lovell, if you'd come forward. Uh, Bobby Cavallaro, if you'd come forward. Um, and I can't remember who the other people were. Julia Senertia. And uh, I'm going to mispronounce this. Uh, Miss Boyd. And I take it that Jonah Davenport is not here. Okay. Mr. Lovell will begin with you, four minutes. Okay, great, thanks. Um, well, thank you, Chairman Mendelson. Thanks to council members for having this hearing today. My name is Jesse Lovell. I'm a resident of Forest Hills in Ward 3, and I'm active in a number of grassroots organizations and coalitions that are working for fairer budgets, fairer taxation, and making D.C. a more livable city for low and moderate income households. I'm here today to ask the council to address three main issues that all connect to the issue of affordable housing. First, strengthening D.C.'s local rent supplement program and other rental assistance programs, both to prevent new homelessness and to keep renters in newly acquired rental housing. Second, shoring up the Housing Production Trust Fund in fiscal year 15 to help move toward creating a stronger fund for subsequent years. And third, moving D.C. toward a fairer tax system by targeting tax cuts on low and moderate income households and by maintaining adequate revenues elsewhere. Starting with my first point, I recently read about Contessa Allen Starks, who was featured a year ago when she first found an apartment through the Rapid Rehousing Program. She subsequently lost that home less than a year later when the subsidies ran out and the rent became unaffordable. At last week's DHS oversight hearing, we heard from another client who lost an apartment as her subsidies ran down and as medical issues kept her out of work for a time. And she also pointed out a near full-time job at Target just couldn't provide enough income in any case. We're all eagerly awaiting some positive results from the mayor's 500 Families, 100 Days initiative. My question is, what about the 100 days after that and then 100 more days? I absolutely believe rapid rehousing must be a key part of the solution, but we are going to need better accountability and I think stronger and more flexible subsidies to keep clients from re-entering the homeless services system. So I agree with others who have asked the Council to find additional funding for LRSP rental subsidies in the FY15 budget. 
Second, I agree with those who have asked the council and the mayor to do more to create a more stable housing production trust fund with more predictable funding. Given the deep district's skyrocketing housing prices and the rapid loss of affordable rental housing, renters found approximately one half the number of rental units at 750 month or less in 2010 that they would have found in 2000. There really can't be any debate that the district needs to make bolder investments in affordable housing over the next 10 years than it did in the previous 10. Third, I support progressive taxation in all its forms. In a city facing the affordability challenges we're facing, we should focus on providing tax relief to those who feel the burden of high costs of living in general and high housing costs in particular. I support an expansion of the earned income tax credit for both families and single adult tax filers, as well as an increase in DC's standard deduction to meet the federal level. I strongly support the creation of a new middle income tax bracket, which seemed long overdue. At the same time, I realize that these tax cuts will cost the city significant revenue. According to the Tax Revision Commission, the cost of a new EITC, deductions and exemptions, and a new tax bracket would be more than $100 million per year over the next four years. Budget surpluses alone do not guarantee adequate funding for each of our city's worthy programs, of course. Federal cuts to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program and Temporary Aid for Needy Families could place some significant additional burdens on the district. It's for all these reasons that I believe we should be careful to make sure that we maintain adequate revenues to meet our housing, anti-poverty, and family services goals in the years to come. I therefore believe we should maintain our top tax bracket at 8.95% as proposed in the mayor's budget and maintain DC's estate tax thresholds where they are today, recognizing that our tax priorities, our tax relief priorities should lie elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lovell. Uh, Mr. Cavallaro. Chairman Mendelson, Councilman Berry, Councilman Graham, and Council staff, thank you for allowing us to testify here today. My name is Bobby Cavallaro. I am the Dean of Students at the Elsie Whitlow Stokes Community Freedom Public Charter School. The Elsie Whitlow Stokes Community Freedom Public Charter School prepares preschool and elementary students to become scholars, global leaders, and responsible citizens who are committed to social justice. We are a language immersion public charter school who teaches children to read, write, think, and speak in two languages, either French or English or Spanish and English. French, yes. I've been in education for 14 years now. Throughout my career, I've advocated for students, for parents, and for fellow educators. Now I'm the parent of a 22-month-old boy and I would like to advocate for my own family and more generally for the health of my school community. We're here today to, to testify in support of an amendment to the School Reform Act and the Fiscal Year 2015 Budget Support Act found in the subtitle Preference for Admission for Public Charter School Act of 2014. If passed, <clears throat> excuse me, if passed, this amendment would allow for preference for preference for admission of a child of a full-time employee of a public charter school. We are here to testify as educators, as current parents, and as a current student. Staff preference for school, for charter school employees is a common sense measure that will, that will, that we hope that the council will remain, that will maintain, excuse me, in the BSA. It would help students parents, educators, and schools. The staff, the staff preference will accomplish several things. Number one, members, number one, staff members whose children are being educated at a place where they're employed are more engaged and more involved in the improvement of their schools because their own children's education is on the line. As a school administrator, I can ensure that the best practices are being administered with all of our students, including my own. Administrators, administrators, teachers, and staff have more personal time to invest in their schools because of the convenience of their child attending their schools. Many times I get home early in the early evening hours, just enough time for dinner, a little bit of playtime, bath time, and bedtime routine, which include reading a book. However, there are many days throughout the month where I, my attendance is required at school late hours. 
Sometimes it's just enough time to walk into the house and say goodnight to my son. By having my son at the school, this will provide more of a sense, uh, more sense of security for my son and for me. Thank you very much. And Council Member Graham, just for the record, I am against the TANF cuts as a Ward 4 resident. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cavallaro. Um, Ms. Um... Surukia. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Mendelson, Councilman Berry, Councilman Graham, Council staff. Um, my name is Julia Sinerki. I'm a Ward 5 resident and a native Washingtonian. I'm currently the Data and Assessment Manager at LC Whitlow Stokes Community Freedom Public Charter School and also a former first grade teacher. I'm also the mother of a 20 month old who will be entering the DC school system in the 15 16 school year. Along with the reasons that Mr. Caballero mentioned, uh, I support staff preference for charter school employees for the following reasons. Parents who are employed at their children's school have good access to and a natural line of communication with their children's teachers. Staff preference supports a community school model. Staff preference could also increase retention of quality teachers and staff in the charter school sector, and we all know that quality teachers are key to improving education in the District of Columbia. Also, this concept has pre precedent in other educational institutions, including higher education, in which the children of employees receive discounted or free tuition. Our colleague Jonah Davenport, the current parent of a pre-K student and first grade student, could not be here today due to school responsibilities, but he wanted me to read his testimony on his behalf, so I will do that. As a parent and a teacher at Elsie Whitlow Stokes Community Freedom Public Charter School, I have been extremely lucky to teach at the same school where my two children attend. Aside from the obvious matters of convenience, having my children at my school has several advantages for my family, my school, and I think the entire community. As a parent, I have unbelievable access to my children's teachers, curriculum, and daily routines. Phone calls home are replaced by timely face-to-face -face meetings. Asking, what happened at school today, goes from a mystery to a quiz where I already know most of the answer. And the fly-on-the-wall experience is never to be underestimated. As a teacher and a pre-K coordinator, I have the fortunate role of welcoming, welcoming many of our families to, mark, to our school. When I can testify that my children attend El at Los Stokes, I give our school an unspoken endorsement. I've always wanted to teach at a school that I felt was good enough for my children to attend. And now, prospective families know that we will treat all students as if they were our own, because they are. Community is part of our school name, and it's not in name only. By reinforcing our commitment to families, teachers, and students, we create the village that it takes to raise a child from a young scholar to a responsible global citizen. Charter schools have long appreciated the elements of choice, academic freedom, and community support that have led them to be the catalyst for change in the educational landscape of Washington, D.C. Bringing teachers' children into the fold will only help strengthen the commitment we have to our school and to our city. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Boyd? Good afternoon. Sorry. Good afternoon. My name is Sati Young Boyd, and I am an 11-year-old sixth grader. My father is my sixth grade teacher at Elsie Willow Stokes Community Freedom Public Charter School. My older sister, at 15, has already graduated from Elsie Willow Stokes, and her grades were excellent. My father was a tough father and a tough teacher, quizzing her before her tests. My younger sister, nine, is a leader in her grade at Elsie Willow Stokes, and I think that she got that by watching my father at school. I have been at Elsie Willow Stokes since kindergarten, and my father has helped me through all of school by being there. When I get sick, my nurse calls him down and I am able to either go home or lie down. If we need to have a parent-teacher conference, I know my father can be there. If I need a permission slip signed, I can get it signed quickly and there is not a need for me to stay at school. This year, my father has been very helpful, arranging somewhere I can quietly do homework and also study for tests. He's quizzed me on my math and my French, despite the fact that his French is not amazing. My father has made sure that I have a computer to type up my reports and provided websites for my projects. My father has always been involved in my schoolwork and homework. However, the very best thing about having my father in school is, was by being able to see him in the hallway and give him a hug, despite the fact that he was at work and I was at school. To conclude, staff preference for charter school employees should be passed. Thank you for giving me a chance to show a student's point of view. Thank you. Uh, thank you, each of you, for your testimony. I don't have any questions for you, but I will say this. 
If I was giving out gold stars, Ms. Boyd, I would give you a gold star for your testimony. <laughs> Mr. Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, commend you for all of that you do. I don't know how you do it instead of keeping track of all the, these things, so I, I appreciate that. I never have wanted to be chair of the city council. For that reason, it takes you in directions you don't want to go sometimes, so thank you for your I wanted to be focus. mayor, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to be mayor, and I was for 16 years, you know. Oh, you were? <laughs> yeah, okay. and enjoy it. <laughs> uh, let me welcome all four of you all here. Uh, Mr. Uh, Cavalero, yes, I agree with the concept. Are you suggesting that staff people who have children that are non DC residents go free? No, absolutely not. So, what are you suggesting then? For staff members who are DC residents and whose children are in DC and pay DC taxes and are full-time employees. Yes, they have preference in the lottery. So you're asking if they have preference? Yes. yes. I agree with that. Thank so you. Uh, I'm on the education committee, as you know, and yes, I would sir. do all I can to, to get our chairman and uh, uh, one other member of the, of the committee uh, to, uh, to support that. That makes a lot of sense. What happens if a staff member has several children that are in other, well, I'd ask this way, if you have three children, are you suggesting that if you're a full-time staff member at Charter School A, uh, you should have preference in the lottery for the other two children? Um, if you didn't throw it out that way, it's fine. I think you ought to. Yes. I think all the children ought to have preference. Yes, sir, I do. Yeah. Um, I think the, the way the law is written, it says as long as it doesn't exceed more than 10% of the school population, um, then, you know, the staff should get, full-time staff should get preferential treatment. Well, let me, so you suggest we eliminate that 10% then, right? Um, but you ought to. I, I think 10%, yeah. I think the way it's, it's in the bill is, is fine. Okay. So you think that if it doesn't exceed 10%, can you go in detail with that? Why you support what's, what we do now? The only change would be that you would give preference. Uh, well, if there's the, a charter school with, you know, let's say only a startup charter school and only has 30 students, let's say, and 50% of those are family, you know, um, I, I don't know. I don't think that, I mean, I think 10% I think having the 10% is a good number. Um, okay. It seems like a fair number, um, so I do think that a limit of 10% is fair. Well, what do you live in Ward 4? You don't need to give a specific address. What neighborhood you live in? In Petworth? Petworth? Yeah, not too far from Roosevelt High School. You know, Petworth is, is being justified yes, sir. every day. Crestwood, every day. Up in the flower trees, hollering in those places, every day is being gentrified. And I have no problem with gentrifiers, except that in a lot of instances, they're displacing people who have been here for some time. That's why I got a problem doing that. I've been trying to think of legislation of some kind. We have a first right of refusal law, but it's empty because you can't expect people to pay this three and four hundred thousand dollars that you're asking for. So you got my support on the, on, the, on the staff thing. Thank you. And David and I get along very well. I'm sure we could get his support. And we'll, we'll make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you it. Very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Mr. Graham? For Thank me. you very much, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Lovell, thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. Because you're part of an increasing number of Ward 3 residents. I mean, Forest Hills is a nice place to live. I know that neighborhood. I don't yeah. know. I'm, I'm a renter, by the way, not not well, an owner. Not right. just, <laughs> just to be clear, well, not even close okay, to the owner. Okay, well, yeah. yeah, but but you know what I'm talking oh, about. Oh yeah, it's very. Nice. And so that's that's the tale of two cities. That's the tale of two Washingtons. It really is. 
But, but you've come forward and you've done the right thing. I hope you'll support us on resisting any cut in the TANF uh, in, on October the 1st. Will you do that, Mr. Lovell? Because yeah, you I sound like a right-thinking person. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Sure. Now, on the matter of Stokes, Stokes was founded in Ward 1. Yes, sir. Let's be clear about it. You didn't say it. I don't know why you didn't say it. Oh, sorry. We were we founded in Ward 1. <laughs> oh, that's and good. Jim, and Jim Graham helped us out a lot. Well, our, well that, that wasn't what I was trying to bring out, but, <laughs> but I do remember various visits to the school. Now, now the, the young lady, what is your name again? Satya Ewing Boyd. Miss Boyd. Miss Boyd? Ewing Boyd. Ewing Boyd. Yes, sir. Are you on the, oh, here, here you are, Sapia Ewing Boyd. You, you weren't there then, but when it was first founded, it was in the basement of St. Stephen's Church. Yes, sir. And I went there, and it was just so, you know, ama but amazing things were happening, even then. And now, of course, today you're in a different world. I mean, you, you moved to 16th Street, and now where are you now? We are in the Brooklyn neighborhood um, in Northeast. Way over there. Well, yes. that's all right. It's a good place to be. But, but we, we couldn't have, afford to buy in Ward 1. Yeah, well, you could have bought that one building and you had to change. Well, that's another story. <laughs> uh, but, but no, it's a, it's a great organization. Thank you. And, but I, I just wanted to say to you that at the time when I was in that crowded basement with, it was quite a limited facility, let's say, but, but amazing things were happening to those children. And I went several times, as, as I want you to know. And it was a very special experience. You could see what was going to happen to that school. So I appreciate very much you coming here today on these important issues. I hope you all, too, will oppose the cut in TANF, 41%, uh, uh, 13, uh, 13, uh, 11,000 children under the age of 13 will be the real victims. You're under the age of 13, aren't you? Yes, sir. How old are you, 11? Yes, sir. See, if you were in TANF for more than 60 months, your parents TANF benefits would be cut 41% on October the 1st, 41%. So we've got to roll this back. We've got to stop this from happening. I see Mr. Goulet has come, and I know he cares very deeply about poor people in the District of Columbia. He does, and, and he's going to work with us to figure out a way to not have this happen because, Mr. Goulet, there's too much tragedy here for us. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> you know what Tana is temporary assistance to needy families, but this this is the principal welfare payment for children and mothers and fathers who are poor. Is that okay? Yeah, I know. Thank you each of you for your testimony. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Laura Dooley. Is Miss Dooley here from the um, State Affairs Auto Alliance? I didn't realize that he had had an arrest. I didn't yeah. know. I just looked at it. I didn't know. I uh, Miriam Savad, I just want you to know I didn't is know. she here? I Michael Sindram, if you'd come forward. Karen was, Warner so with Unity me. Healthcare, if she could come forward. Is there anybody else in the chamber who wishes to testify before I call the executive? Uh, Ms. Warner, why don't we begin with you while we're waiting for Mr. Sindram? Okay. No, Four thank minutes. You. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson, uh, Councilmember Barry, and Councilmember Graham. My name is Karen Warner, and I am here on behalf of Vince Keene, the President and C CEO of Unity Healthcare. Vince is attending a memorial service today and regrets that he is unable to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to offer testimony about two very important issues. Unity has been in active talks with the Department of Health, members of the Council, and members of the mayoral administration about our ability to provide comprehensive health and human services to the residents of the district. We have appreciated everyone's candor and support. As final decisions on the budget are fast approaching, we feel it is imperative to communicate again about the issues that we are asking to be addressed in the next fiscal year. The first issue is maintaining access at Congress Heights Health Center, DC General Health Center, and Southwest Health Center. Unity currently provides primary care 
dental care and specialty care to 20,983 individuals at these three health centers in wards 6, 7, and 8. The grant supporting these health centers is scheduled to end on September 30th, 2014. What will happen to those patients when their neighborhood health centers close in less than six months? We are concerned about the more than 20,000 patients who are accustomed to walking or taking public transportation to see their Unity doctor. Wow. We are very concerned about disrupting the continuity of care and trust with their doctor that has helped so many patients control their chronic diseases and achieve a better quality of life. In order for Unity to meet the health care needs of these patients, including any potential transitions to other sites, Unity requests the following actions. The Department of Health funds the $2.6 million grant that supports these health centers for a minimum of one additional year. Also, the Department of Health continues to fund the lease costs for the Congress Heights Health Center in Ward 8 and the interagency lease and facility costs for Southwest Health Center in Ward 6 and Unity at DC General in Ward 7 for the life of the grant. For decades, these health centers have been a lifeline for the patients they serve. Due to recent efforts to expand health coverage, the district currently boasts one of the highest rates of health coverage in the nation. Without maintaining and even increasing access to convenient, quality, and trusted health care services, health coverage is a moot point. The second issue is tax abatement for our Walker Jones Health Center. In 2008, the Council of the District passed Bill 17917, the Walker Jones Northwest One Unity Health Center Tax Abatement Act of 2008. Despite passage, funding was never allocated in the district's budget to cover the tax abatement. Unity has been paying these taxes since then, and the financial burden that we have taken on amounts to over $1 million. This money could be much better spent on supporting health care services for the district residents. In order to fulfill the purpose of the law, Unity requests the following. The council allocates money to fund the property tax amount of $230,633 for the past fiscal year and annually thereafter. Also, the council passes legislation to extend the tax abatement past its current expiration of t September 2013. Unity has long appreciated the commitment of the council in supporting primary care access and health care in the district. These two items funded in the FY15 district budget will assist both the district and Unity in fulfilling our ongoing commitments to the district's residents. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Werner. Mr. Syndrome. Good afternoon. Mr. Good afternoon. Wilson, all those with the sound of my voice. Michael Syndrome, a disabled veteran, served our country more than most. Let me give a shout out to Lady T, who's watching as I speak and you respond. We're talking about the budget, affordable housing. You know, it's very expensive, Mr. Mendelson, to live in the District of Columbia. Not many of us have a part time gig at 200,000 a year, staffers, the granite building, prime realty, mm, it's a lot of dough. To live in the district, that is. For a part-time gig, I might add, Mr. Chair. So affordable housing for our first, at least one of us is eating, for our first responders, firefighters, police officers, disabled veterans, that's gonna be expensive. Are you with me, Mr. Chair? You're shaking your head no. Well, hopefully you will be. There's a timely article in the Post. Independent wins Arlington special election. And it indicates here fresh thinking about this independent who won in Arlington, our neighbor to the south. And a more skeptical approach to spending tax dollars on costly projects such as streetcars. And in the same section of the paper, it indicates here that $800 million citywide expansion of streetcar service. $800 million. That'll buy a lot of Unity Care. Yes. 
800 million, Mr. Chair. They buy a lot of affordable housing, a lot of fire trucks, a lot of firefighters, a lot of paramedics. How about the billion for the Pepco Underground? Oh, oh, you have to be a shareholder, that's right. That's a holy cow, right? <clears throat> hmm. Veterans Court, right? Since we're washing cash and we can throw out 800 million for the trolley folly and a billion for undergrounding, which is not a panacea for the very greedy, I didn't say needy Pepco, Veterans Court. Passed up an article to your colleagues here who seem indisposed or distracted. Veterans Courts. Since the Revolutionary War, brave men and women have raised their right hands and taken an oath to protect and defend their country, often at great personal expense. In the past few years, the public has begun to recognize what veterans community has known for a while, that physical wounds are not the only injuries from service. Mental and emotional illnesses are invisible scars of battle that also inflict damage. Even with the recent focus on increased understanding of mental health issues, these illnesses are not always identified and diagnosed until much later on. Veterans courts serve veterans facing judicial action due to substance abuse, mental illness, or trauma. The specialized courts strive to keep veterans out of jail and connect them to the benefits and treatment they have earned, all while saving the American public tax dollars. Sounds to me like win-win. A government accountability office report concluded that due to stigma, lack of understanding of mental health care, logistical challenges, and concerns about the VA, many veterans do not seek treatment for mental health. These are all issues the VA has recognized and works to address. Additionally, some may not realize they require health care. Maybe you need to help out with that. The same rec report indicated that from fiscal years 2006 through 2010, the number of veterans requiring mental health care increased steadily. During that period, Robert Russell, a judge in Buffalo, New York, it's not far from my hometown, Rochester, New York, ever been there? Snow <clears throat> Notice a steady rise in veterans appearing in his drug court and mental health court. Russell, Judge Russell recognized that more could be done to connect veterans to the benefits and services they earn. So he joined forces with the local VA medical center to create a new court docket that would focus exclusively on veterans in the justice system. I didn't say just ice. Mr. Sindermann, time has expired. I'm still alive. I get that, but your time has expired. But thank you. I have a couple of questions for um, for you, um, Ms. Werner. The um, you testify about this grant expiring, but do you know that it will not be renewed? Um, we've been told that they're considering it, um, but that it would not include uh, being partnered with the facility costs. And so if it's not um, partnered with the facility costs for the what do you sites. Mean partnered with the facility costs. So the grant funds are for operating the sites, yes. um, but also the district pays for the lease cost for Congress Heights and interagency lease costs for the other two sites. So, it, so they would still ask us to move out of those sites. Well, that's a little bit different. I, I'm getting confused. Um, the operating grant, you're in discussions. You, you can't say that the operating grant won't be continued, but they were providing the facility and now they're saying they won't provide the facility? So the operating grant ends um, September 30th, 2014. Um, they have said there is a possibility that they will rebid it um, re as a it. new opportunity. Okay. Um, and it would not be linked to those three sites. And then the separate issue is the fact that they pay the cost for those three sites. So the money may continue, but it wouldn't continue to be a grant um, definitely uh, provided to Unity for those sites. It would not be linked directly to those three sites. And how long has Unity been there? Um, we have been at Congress Heights in Southwest since 2001 and at Unity at DC, DC General since 2006. And uh, with um, 
a, a uh, multi-year contract or with a uh, annual grant or what? Do you know? So it was a five-year contract or a five-year grant um, for these sites starting in, and I apologize, in 2009. Um, but we took, in 2001, Unity was asked to take over the sites from the Public Benefit Corporation as part of um, all of the neighborhood health centers. Yeah. And Southwest and Congress Heights were part of that transition in 2001. And then in 2009, we were awarded a five-year grant that included the former PBC sites and Unity at DC General. Now, have you talked to the um, ward council members concerning this? There's several ward council members. It's wards six, seven, and eight. Yes. Um, we've talked to uh, Mr. Wells, um, uh, and he is supportive. Um, and we've talked to uh, Ms. Alexander. And I believe that Vince has reached out to your office, Council Member Barry, um, but I, I can't confirm that. You haven't talked to me. Uh, Council Member Alexander's probably in the best position to be uh, helpful because she chairs the health committee, and this is a health issue. OK. With regard to Walker Jones, uh, Unity, by virtue of its business, I assume is tax exempt. I'm guessing that you don't own the property at uh, Northwest One. Right. We lease that property and. And so you're paying rent through the uh, lease? Is that the right. issue? Right. So the taxes are passed through to us as the, the entity that leases. And the pass through uh, in the most recent year was $230,000. Yes. And have you talked to any other um, committee chairs regarding that issue? Um, so we've provided the information to Councilmember Evans. Um, we have also talked with Mr. Uh, Councilmember Wells about that since Walker Jones is in his ward. Um, and uh, he was, again, very supportive. And he is the one who introduced the legislation in 2008. OK. Thank you. My time has expired. Mr. Berry. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what was your name again? Since you were on the list, what was your name? Karen Warner. Karen Warner. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your position at uh, Unity? I'm the Vice President of Strategic Development. Development. I know a lot about Unity. I know Mr. King and <laughs> I know other people. I don't understand all this. So help me walk me through why the. Let me ask one other question. Is services provided by Unity? Is it eligible for Medicaid reimbursements? So many of our patients are um, Medicaid recipients. And Under what percentage? Um, I believe it's about 60%, um, but I could definitely get you the Probably example. more than that. Probably more than that. So if they're eligible for Medicaid, right. whether that not the distribution went or not, you could still continue to be reimbursed for your Medicaid payments, couldn't you? Right. Now, I don't understand this cut of $2.6 million. Can you help me explain how this came about and why is it cutting at those three centers and not cutting anywhere else? I can't explain it, um, but I can tell you that what we've uh, what we understand from the Department of Health is that they no longer want to support the facilities. Pardon? Uh, the department no longer wants to support those three s facilities and the facility costs that are associated, and so therefore they don't is want to... Is it 2.6 for facility costs or the services? Uh, for the services. But we can't provide the services if we don't have the space. Well, what I'm asking, at 2.6... If you lose it, not only do you lose the facility cost, you lose the service cost too? Yes. You sure about that? So, so far we have no indication that, um, Who told that you the that? grant is going to be extended. Who told you? Uh, the Department of Health. Who? It's not a. So, end. Community Health Administration, um, I believe. Give us a name. Who told uh, you all? that was going to be extended. So I don't want to fight about it. I ain't got to fight, which I'm willing to fight. 
But if I don't have to fight, I won't, I won't fight. I got some other battles I want to fight. So who told you that? Um, so uh, Vince Keen met with um, Department of Health, and so I would have to check with him on exactly who he met with. Um, but I could definitely get, get back to you. Could I ask another question? But you really cannot answer, but I'd ask it anyway. Why is it that this queen, this king is not here testifying? This is such a drastic situation involving three very important senators. Why is he not here? Um, Mr. Keene is preaching at a memorial service today, um, and that's why he's not here. He preaching, he's preaching all day? <laughs> I'm serious. I, I'm sorry, I don't know if it's all day. Okay, I, I, I'm going to call him up. I'm going to get on this case. Anything this serious, Mr. Keene ought to be here before this committee so he can try to persuade us to do something about it. And so uh, that goes across the board. Thank you for coming. Michael Syndrome, I don't have any questions for you. You've been awfully nice today. I don't understand what got into you. You know, <laughs> to, have a friend, to have a friend must be a friend, Mr. Mayor. All oh, right. And the same way you made their way up, it'd be the same way you made their way down. Probably I, satisfying. I appreciate you coming. Yeah. This, I mean, Mr. Syndrome is on every committee hearing on everything. We appreciate you. Thank you. But remember this, Mr. Mayor, you get paid for all this. I don't. Mr. Graham, do you have any questions? No, you've been very nice today because when I ask you to stop, you just keep talking. So I've stopped asking you to stop. You're going to share some of that food with me? At least one of us is eating. <laughs> but you can go out now and eat. You could have eaten before. See, I have no time for this. I, I don't have that part-time give of 125 grand a year with staffers and What, have they reduced my salary? Have they reduced it? Huh? Let, me turn, <laughs> let me turn to the issues of unity because I didn't know nothing about this. And I have more than a passing interest in D.C. General Family Shelter. So I can't imagine why this administration would not be continuing the contract for D.C. General Family Shelter, after all of what we've been through in the last six months, and, and I know the others are of equally compelling nature, but I mean, um, Mr. Goulet may know. are you, I don't, did, did Mr. Goulet do it, did you say? I'm saying he may know the answer. Oh, I don't know. He doesn't get at this level. Like. You, pardon me? I can discuss it. Well, come on up here. And, uh, no, Mr. Mr. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Mr. Sorry. Goulet will come up in this time. <laughs> There I go again. Correct. <laughs> Hard to tell who's more out of order here, the witnesses or you. But anyway, I'm very uh, concerned. Is this is the money at stake? Is it for, is it for lease infrastructure kind of things, or is it for services? So there are two pots. No, just One. answer. That. I, I know, but you, if you go Both. down that road, I'll just <laughs> remain confused. Is it is it for the, the the facility cost, or is it for the services cost, or is it for both? We're asking for both. No, no. Are both threatened? Yes. Okay. That, that's what I want to be absolutely clear about. Because <laughs> yes. I can't imagine what the facility cost is for D.C. General. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I know there's an interagency transfer involved of some kind or another, but that's, that's just an accounting thing because we're transferring from Peter to Paul, you know, from the Department of Health to the Department of General Services, so I don't understand that. We can't have the clinic closed. Uh, at D.C. General, you know, I mean, unless we are continuing to believe that we don't want to provide any services to the vulnerable families at D.C. General, which I just can't believe. There's more to this story, I think, than, than what uh, we have at the moment. And I'm sure that Mr. Goulet, who cares deeply about poor people and their welfare, uh, did I say that already? Yes. I, I should say it again. But I don't <laughs> we got to keep this open. There's, I mean, I'm just speaking for the one I know. And these families cannot be without the Unity Healthcare Clinic. I, I do want you to give my regards to Vincent Keene, who I've known um, for a very long time. And the thing I like about Vince Keene, I'm glad to hear he's preaching today because he is a very spiritual man. He's a very spiritual man. And I, a lot of our nonprofit advocates are spiritual people. But of course, Vince has a background which, which was all about that. And uh, I just, I love all the time I spend with him. I knew him when I was at Whitman Walker for years, and, and he was at, at Unity, and he's done a remarkable job of, of serving the healthcare needs of poor people in the District of Columbia. 
I mean, he's, he's really one of my heroes. He truly is. And so Mine too. <laughs> used to, right? You mentioned him in your testimony, which is very good, because when people come from an agency, they should mention their executive director, you know, who, who can't be here for one reason or another, but who is here in spirit with us. I know he is. And so please give him my regards, please. I will. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you both for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Syndrome, thank you for being well behaved today. You're, you're, I thought you're going to be nice and in tandem to extend me a few moments since we're all well, cordial and you. Know, you On a spiritual note, I was so far off of whatever the topic is. Oh, I figured we're doing so well. And I figured today, since the entire budget is before us. 800 million? How could I be more on point? A billion you, dollar? Anything you said would be a, on point. It said you were talking about the Veterans Administration. But your colleague mentioned and that's about federal. it. That's federal. Even so we, we can't help you with uh, What's Veterans federal? Administration. No, wrong. You're absolutely wrong because as indicated, you, as indicated, Veterans Court is under the exclusive, would be under the exclusive jurisdiction of the Chief Judge of Superior Court, Lee Satterfield. That's if, local. If. And, and the scuttlebutt is not. there's no money. There's no funding. What's up? Yeah, actually, it's not local. Hmm? Actually, it's not local. The courts were, uh, the budget for the courts was transferred to uh, Congress with the 1997 Revitalization Act. The good judge has shot it down. If he pushes forward and you give him the funding, it'll be up and running. But I did want to end on a spiritual note. As Please. We need that. On the street, I saw a small girl, cold and shivering in a thin dress, with little hope of a decent meal. I became angry and said to God, why did you permit this? Why don't you do something about it? For a while, God said nothing. That night, he replied quite suddenly, I certainly did something about it. I made you. On that note, remind your staffer too, she owes me $25 for those shoes, which she has yet to pay. Thank you, Mr. Sendrum. Mm. We will now turn to the government. <clears throat> or the government. Uh, Mr. Um, Goulet, if you'd come forward. And uh, it's our practice to swear in government witnesses. Are you the only one who's going to be testifying? I think I've got it all covered here. So should be in good shape. OK. Give me just a second. Well. And uh, before you get into your statement, I'm going to ask you about the unity situation since Ms. Werner is still here. But if you would uh, raise your right hand, do you swear from under penalty of law the testimony you're about to give to the Council of the District of Columbia? Community of the whole is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Answered in the affirmative, and you may be seated. Can you, before you get into your statement, just explain the uh, unity situation? Yes, I was informed. I had a meeting with uh, Vince Keene last week on this issue. Uh, as, as I understand the situation right now, Department of Health has money in their budget uh, that was awarded previously to Unity. Uh, they were looking at an RFP route uh, this fiscal year. Uh, we're going to have a meeting with myself uh, and Deputy Mayor Otero to really determine what the best course of action on, is on this. I think this also links into our situation we're doing right now with the United Medical Center because we are looking for uh, the creation of two clinics uh, that will feed patients into United Medical Center. So I think this discussion will dovetail nicely in with what we're trying to do in Ward 8 with the community clinic over there, uh, linking these facilities up to what we're trying to do with UMC. I think it's really important to make sure that funding for both the clinics and the new hospital remain in the budget uh, so that we can proceed with these negotiations with Unity. But uh, I've got... Uh, you know, notes on all three of the clinics. I think it's uh, ongoing discussions at this point. I think the issue will actually be resolved uh, in a way that will make all parties happy on this. You said it's important. To, which money stay in the budget? Uh, the, the money specifically for the clinic system that uh, is going to feed into United Medical Center. Uh, we've got money in there to build uh, at least two clinics, possibly three clinics, uh, because it's really important. What Huron has told us is when you have a hospital system, a community hospital particularly, you need clinics that are able to feed patients into the hospital. Otherwise, uh, the hospital becomes starved for patients. 
I'm gonna, we're going to examine what DOH is doing with the funding. There may or may not be a better way to do what they're doing. But we want to make sure that obviously the, the needs of our residents are met, that the successful services that Unity has been uh, implementing or continuing. You know, one of these specific buildings involves some lease space that the district government had, as I understand. And Unity was uh, sharing that space with DC uh, government and paying about a dollar a year. I think that space was very expensive, though, and the government was looking to relocate its agencies uh, to cheaper space. Uh, I think that put Unity in a bit of a bind, and they're trying to work out uh, possible site locations or co-locations with that right now. That's the uh, Southwest Clinic? Yes. I, I, let, me, let me take a look here. Check my well, there's three at issue, Congress Heights, Southwest, and uh, D.C. General. Yeah. I, I think this specifically involves Southwest. Okay. Uh, so we're, we're looking, at, uh, looking at all three, and uh, Congress Heights... No, it was the, actually, I, let me correct that. Congress Heights is the one uh, that was having trouble because now uh, with the D.C. government agencies moving out, they would have to, uh, I think, vacate by uh, January 30th. And, and that would be create an obvious problem for them uh, because they would have to find another site. So we're going to work very closely with Unity on this. We really think it can actually be resolved. Uh, we think the funding is there to do this in the budget right now and doesn't need any additional resources, but it does connect in nicely with what we're working on with UMC. So, Well, before you go to UMC, uh, there are two issues. One is the operational costs, and the Department of Health is looking to rebid that contract? They, they had uh, announced plans for a competitive bid. I don't think the RFP has been issued yet. And that's what you're going to talk to the Department of Health about. Right. But, but the funding is there in the budget. That's correct, if yes. RFP, if, if the Department of Health goes through with that proposal, it's not that the government is discontinuing the program. It's just that Unity would be at risk since they'd have to rebid the contract, correct? Yes, that's my understanding. That's the operational it. side. Yes. The facility, facility side, the issue is with one of the three sites or all three? I think with two of the sites, as I understand it, one of the sites you have the issue with the D.C. government agencies moving out of the lease space, potentially. Congress I don't think Heights. that's been firmly decided yet. The other one I think can be resolved uh, very easily with DGS. I think there was some questions about, you know, the amount uh, and, and who pays for certain services in terms of janitorial and maintenance services. I actually think that's a pretty easy fix, uh, and we can work to negotiate that without any trouble. So I actually I think this is going to be an issue that resolves itself in the next few weeks, but uh, we're going to keep working on it. I don't think it does require additional funds in either the fiscal year 14 or 15 budget, but we want to make sure we work hard uh, to preserve funds that are in the Department of Health budget and in the uh, United Medical Center package, which will include those funding for the clinics, which are going to be really important to keep in there. When you say resolved in the next few weeks, what does that mean? What, what can we look right. to May 28th? Uh, that's two, three weeks from now, or um, June 15th? I mean, this may be a good discussion that we would follow up with you on. I think in maybe I, I would say probably about three weeks. Uh, and one thing we're going to watch closely is where the funding is tracked in the council's budget, because uh, you right now have control of the budget. And it's going to be essential for funding to remain in place in certain areas for us to be able to execute this. And I think that may be part you know, of the hesitation to commit uh, certain things to unity at this time because the budget is in flux at this point since it's with the council. And we just want to make sure that those priorities remain in place uh, as it gets approved by you and then sent uh, to the mayor. Why don't you proceed with your statement? Okay, terrific. Mr. Chairman, yes, can I Mr. follow up on, on that? that? Yes. Thank you very much. As I understand the uh, UMC plan, this is a sort of a specialty clinic that will be operated by UMC itself, and not by Unity, and that yeah. they will use this to get people out of the, out of the uh, emergency room and, and add to it they want to build a new amatory care facility uh, separate and apart from what they have now. They don't have one. And so that's my understanding that even if you fund these uh, Congress Heights Center, that there still is a need for an additional dedicated center. Right now, Unity can send their patients anywhere they want to send them. 
In fact, I was disturbed when I heard last week that they're sending pregnant women to uh, minister, I think, which I think is wrong. If you're going to get DC money, however you got it, you're going to be trying to support UMC. So let me look more into it. Yeah, uh, it, it, let me briefly respond to that, Mr. Berry. Uh, the, the, the specialty clinic you're, you're referring to, I think, would be one that would be co-located potentially with the hospital facility. Uh, so there would be a way to divert people on site away from emergency care, which is, as you know, more expensive. Now, what we've also looked for is uh, you know, potential, I think the two clinics I'm referencing would be uh, general care clinics where people would then be transferred, you know, as they come in uh, to the hospital. Right now there are clinics, as you know, in your ward. Uh, some actually have dedicated transfers that, that go to MedStar. Others uh, have uh, transfers that could go a variety of places, as you mentioned, with Unity. That would be an important criteria in the discussions we would have with them because if we are putting up district money uh, to build these cl new clinics or to fund existing clinics, we would want to make sure that patients are going uh, to UMC because there's going to be a real need uh, with the added physicians, with the added services that we're bringing back to UMC to be able to make sure patients return as well. And we're seeing a lot of excitement around the, the increase in doctors, the increase in specialty services that it's providing, but without patients it doesn't do us any good. So that's the ongoing discussions we will have with them. And we want to make sure that, obviously, we want to be supportive of Unity, but make sure that it's in a way where district funds are used uh, to get patients, you know, to where they would need to be in the system. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm glad you said that, Eric. Makes me feel better. Oh, thank you. In terms of uh, a direct line to you, and yes. see. And we'll be glad to provide an update to the council on this as we uh, proceed. Okay. And I'm going to look into it myself, Mr. Chairman, along with you. Uh, let's get to Mr. Goulet's statement. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole, uh, specifically Mr. Barry, who is here with us right now. Uh, my name is uh, Eric Goulet. I am the Mayor's Deputy Chief of Staff and Budget Director in the Mayor's Office of Budget and Finance. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today on the fiscal year 2014 Revised Budget Request Emergency Adjustment Act of 2014 the Fiscal Year 2015 Budget Request Act of 2014, and the Fiscal Year 2015 Budget Support Act of 2014. I would like to take a moment to thank my staff for their incredible work and dedication throughout these past four budget cycles. I'd also like to thank Jeff DeWitt and all the staff in the Office of the Chief Financial Officer for their professionalism and partnership through each of these budgets. And also thank the Council's Budget Office, which is led ably by Jennifer Budoff, uh, for their efforts leading up to each budget vote. So thank you to all of those people. Uh, the Mayor's proposed budget for fiscal year 2015 uh, continues to reap dividends from the initiatives the Mayor implemented at the start of his administration to reduce unemployment, increase the pace of economic development, particularly in our district neighborhoods, and restore fiscal stability in the District of Columbia. Over the past four years, we have continued to see population growth and economic advancement resulting in steadily increasing revenues. These new revenues have been largely reinvested into staffing and programs in education, public safety, and human services. Most notably, uh, through prudent budget management, the district's fund balance is at the highest point in its history, at $1.75 billion. The policies and procedures the mayor has advanced during his four years in office have left the district as the envy of big cities and states throughout the country. The fiscal year 2015 budget and financial plan is structurally sound and does not use our locally mandated reserves to balance the budget. There are no tax or fee increases to balance this budget either. This budget preserves the district's 12 percent debt cap and continues to fund the legislatively mandated dedicated pay-as-you-go capital fund, all the while still providing $1.4 billion of capital investments in fiscal year 2015 and $7 billion over the six-year capital improvements plan. The path back to fiscal stability has required many difficult decisions during the past three-plus years. The mayor would like to thank the council for standing with him to make the tough decisions to live within our means, and he hopes this trend continues into the future. Staying the course will undoubtedly be difficult, but we are already starting to see the fruits of these difficult but prudent choices. 
The theme of this year's budget is keeping the promises. With the district continuing on an upward trajectory, this budget makes numerous key investments to ensure that we continue to keep our promises to all DC residents to keep this city moving forward. In order to take full advantage of these opportunities, the mayor invoked the following four overarching goals for fiscal year 2015. To continue improvements in public education through the additional investment of $116 million directly into our public school system. Make $100 million, an additional $100 million over the 187 we did last year in affordable housing here in the District of Columbia. Number three, to encourage economic and workforce development throughout the District of Columbia. Number four, to improve the quality of life for all DC residents. Mr. Goulet, yes. uh, when Bob Pullman testified, he said that uh, we were about, the budget's about $30 million short with regard to uh, affordable housing. We're, we're investing $100 million in affordable housing. We're not directing $100 million to the trust fund. We're investing it to affordable housing generally. That includes things like the HPAP program, which Mr. Berry is a champion of. It includes uh, Anita Bonds' bill, uh, which provides uh, property tax relief for our seniors. Uh, so we put $100 million to affordable affordable housing initiatives. I think Mr. Pullman specifically wants $100 million in the trust fund. We certainly increased money for the trust fund by I think about $35, $36 million, uh, plus the 43 that's in there through the dedicated deed taxes. You know, however, we did not uh, put the full amount of money in the trust fund because there was all these other great uh, housing initiatives that will preserve affordable housing and create new opportunities for people to own homes here in the district. The uh, Fiscal Year 2015 Budget Request Act of 2014 establishes the Operating and Capital Budget Authority uh, for the District of Columbia Government for Fiscal Year 2015. The Budget Request Act advances the Mayor's budget goals by making important investments in four key goals mentioned above. Over the last four weeks, government officials and the public have testified before the Council on the details of the Operating and Capital Budgets for executive and independent agencies that are appropriated and authorized within the Budget Request Act. The agency budgets in the Request Act include investments that have already been discussed at length by the Mayor and his agency directors throughout the budget process, including a thorough public discussion in which the Mayor presented his fiscal year 2015 budget at a series of budget town hall meetings in all eight wards of the city, and uh, both Council Member Barry, you and the Chairman, uh, were nice enough to join us at those meetings, so we really appreciate you coming out uh, and meeting with the residents on the Mayor's budget as well. Uh, we can talk quickly about errata letter changes. Each year, the Executive Branch submits what's called an errata letter uh, to the Council. Uh, the letter contains technical and conforming changes uh, to supplemental budget proposals, and then the, also the proposed budget request and support acts. Uh, the letter also can be used to propose reallocations of funding uh, to keep the budget in balance if new events uh, that have occurred since the transmission of the budget uh, to the Council have created cost pressures. Uh, some years, uh, previous administrations simply forced the Council to make these changes on their own uh, to keep the budget balanced. However, uh, Mayor Gray has recommended uh, two reductions uh, to his own uh, fiscal year 2015 budget uh, to cover these increased costs and to be continuously fiscally responsible here uh, by not uh, forcing the council to have to do the hard lift on this issue. Uh, the most significant cost increase uh, we have seen involves the pension impact of an arbitration award uh, received by our firefighters. Uh, this amounts to a recurring cost of roughly an additional $7.9 million annually uh, for pension costs. Uh, while we strongly disagree uh, with the arbitrator's unusual decision uh, to award retroactive pay to FEMS when none of the other unions received it, we are respecting the collective bargaining process and abiding by the ruling. Uh, we will be transmitting the contract to the Council soon and in order for it to receive a clean fiscal impact statement so the Council is able to approve it, uh, these funds need to be budgeted. Other smaller cost pressures that have emerged include a need for computers, uh, body cameras, and maintenance funds, uh, also security cameras uh, within three of our public safety agencies, uh, MPD, uh, FEMS, and DOC for fiscal year 14. And then finally, uh, we also have seen a uh, $2.2 million projected increase uh, in the child care subsidy for fiscal year 2015 
uh, due to an increased demand for the program. This is actually a good thing uh, to see people wanting to step up and be able to uh, have their kids uh, in this program. However, it does create increased costs uh, that we have funded through these reallocations. I will be glad to speak in more detail about any of the other smaller amounts uh, during the question and answer period. Uh, these increased costs uh, were covered by two proposed expenditure reductions. Uh, first, uh, the mayor proposed eliminating the $15 million of non-recurring funding uh, that he allocated for the city fund in fiscal year 2015. This was an incredibly difficult decision for the mayor uh, because he still very much supports uh, this great program. Uh, so he has requested that the budget support contingent revenue list uh, be amended to place the $15 million for the city fund as the first item on the list. Uh, additionally, uh, based on recent enrollment trends, uh, we have a proposed reduction of $5.6 million uh, from non-public tuition. This has truly been one of the great success stories of the Gray administration as the amount uh, of money uh, in this program has cut, been cut nearly in half because we're bringing our kids uh, with disabilities back into our neighborhood schools so they can be educated with their non-disabled peers. So it's a great success uh, to be doing that. Uh, two uh, legislative changes in the errata letter are worth noting. Uh, we proposed the legislative language needed for implementing uh, social impact bonds in the District of Columbia. Uh, we have been working jointly with the council on this initiative uh, since council members Alexander, uh, Barry, Che, Evans, and McDuffie introduced the Social Impact Financing Amendment Act of 2013. Uh, the legislation was also co-sponsored by council members Bonds, Grasso, Graham, and Bowser. Uh, this legislation will provide the framework necessary to execute the district's first social impact bond. A social impact bond is not really a bond at all, it's called a bond, but it's really a pay for success contract that is based on the payment of outcomes rather than outputs. An investor, a private investor, agrees to provide upfront payment to an evidence-based data-driven program run by a service provider, which, if scaled, would produce better outcomes and save government dollars in the short and long term. The government realizes a savings over time also associated with better outcomes. The investor assumes the financial risk. If the intervention works, the government pays back the investor for their capital. If the intervention does not produce the desired outcomes, the investor does not regain the capital and there's no loss to the District of Columbia. The Pay for Success Contract Authorization Act of 2014 provides that a multi-year non-lapsing fund is created separate from the general fund to be used for fund payments uh, to be made pursuant to pay for success contracts including what's called SIBs. The SIB will fall uh, in the realm of disconnected youth. Uh, we're not sure exactly. We've got to wait to see where the private money uh, lines up behind which initiative. But possible intervention areas will involve teen pregnancy, uh, high school completion, juvenile justice, or things of that nature. Uh, one other change uh, worth noting is that the mayor funded an additional annual inflation increase to the charter school's facilities allotment in the uh, budget request. Uh, we did not, however, include in the original Budget Support Act a provision that automatically adjusts this inflation, uh, this uh, facilities allotment for inflation in future years. Uh, but we have included such a provision in the errata letter. This change will make certain that the value of the facilities allotment uh, does not decline annually uh, with inflation. I'm going to talk uh, about our financial plan savings Mr. as well. Mr. Goulet, that amount for the charters, isn't that something like $1.3 million? Yeah, yes, Mr. Chairman, it is. Do you remember the exact amount? I can't find it in the letter. I actually, I've got it right here. Let me pull it up. Uh. Bless you. One second, we'll have it for you. Ah, I have it here. It's actually uh, $2.8 million. So actually, the specific number is 2788848 And that would give a CPI adjustment uh, to our charter school's facility allotment for this year. Uh, we also built into the financial plan inflation increases. Uh, so it would provide that then in the out years as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we talk about financial plan savings. I wanted to take a uh, moment to quickly address uh, what appears to at least be a uh, matter of ongoing concern for a few members of the council. 
Uh, the financial plan beginning in fiscal year 2016 uh, is balanced uh, using a formula representing continued performance efficiencies uh, that the executive branch will implement over the next 17 months. Uh, this amounts to roughly an 8% uh, reduction to non-personal services uh, that are not within the uniform per student funding formula, Medicaid, or ones that are actuarially based, such as our retirement calculations and things of that nature. Uh, th this approach is really not novel or unique. It is the identical approach we used during last year's budget when we carried over $96 million of FY13 revenue forward to cover FY14 expenditures. This year, uh, Mayor Gray recommends carrying forward $98.7 million of current year revenue forward exactly in the same manner as we have done uh, last year. Uh, this past year, the executive branch was able to cover all but $2.7 million of the carryover by the time the baseline budget was released in December of 2013. Then in February, another $139 million was certified. So not only were we not facing a $96 million gap, we actually invested the $139 million directly into new services for D.C. residents. Since the mayor took office in 2011, year after year, the council has expressed skepticism about the executive's ability to achieve aggressively budgeted savings uh, through performance improvements in Medicaid, uh, disability and unemployment compensation, the D.C. Health Care Alliance program, non-public tuition, special education, transportation, and fixed cost savings. However, each year, the mayor has achieved all of these projected savings. Through the errata letter we transmitted yesterday, we have already accounted for roughly 25% of the fiscal year 2016 gap through projected savings generated from effective agency management and procurement reform. That reduces the savings that still need to be realized through continued effective management or revenue growth to only around 6%. What the council should not Mr. Mr. Goulet, Yes. You accounted for 25% of the gap, reducing the gap to 6%? Yeah, right, right. It was about an 8% reduction of non-personal services that we were projecting, excluding areas that are fairly unique, like Medicaid, like our schools formula, like our actuarial benefit calculations. We were thinking in the other areas, you know, 8% would be a reasonable amount we could easily achieve by the time the fiscal year 16 uh, baseline budget is produced. Uh, we, we, what does 8% mean? It was roughly $166 million that we were thinking. 166, and yes. you uh, have in your errata letter, if we agree with all that, reduced that by $40 million. So yeah, we still have $120 million Right, rough, right. We've solved roughly 25% already just in these few weeks. Uh, we would have solved more, frankly. And we still have 75% of the problem unsolved. Right, and we, 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 you know, on a, on a time basis, we're doing very well ahead of schedule. Yes, sir. But, but also, what we're, we're assuming, I mean, and let's be honest about this, is that any good CFO is going to be realistically conservative with his revenue estimates. And, and, and I think Jeff DeWitt would be no exception. He's certainly somebody who... Uh, you know, isn't overly conservative with them, but you're not going to be optimistically, uh, you know, about certain economic forecasts. And we're expecting that we may get an incremental growth in revenue, certainly not, you know, uh, some of the growth that we've seen during the, the big boom in the district, but we think we'll get some incremental growth there. And we're not going to stop working. The mayor is going to make sure that each of his agency directors who are on the job are going to continue to keep working to generate a more efficient government uh, for our residents. So of course, if uh, another 9-11 happens, revenues are going to go south. Well, and all all these all your optimism is going to go south as well. Well, Mr. Chairman, if something like that happens, we're going to have to reconsider a lot of things. A significant. We had to do it lot before. Of we did well, it in 2001. And, and, and October we addressed 2001. It. We did it in uh, 2008. Right, and, and, and we addressed it. I mean, what we want to make sure we do is to keep our nose to the grindstone and keep moving forward with trying to be better than we were the previous year, to try to be more efficient, to try to be more careful with how we spend taxpayer funds. And I don't think we want to let ourselves off the hook that easily on this. I mean, I, I think what the council should not encourage is a complacent executive branch. That isn't focused on running a more efficient government and growing the economy, because that's why revenue keeps growing up. It's not by accident. It's by the fact that DIMPED is out there putting projects in place. Let me give you a very important statistic, and this is one that our, our CFO has told us, and that was that just five years ago, 
Only a third of the money that was raised here in the District of Columbia was spent in the District of Columbia. That's up 12% in just five years to about 45% right now. So, and that, that is really through the efforts of DIMPED to go block by block in our neighborhoods, put development in like Costco to be able to have our residents not have retail leakage where they go spend money in Maryland or Virginia, but actually to create retail leakage in Maryland or Virginia when their people are coming here to buy things. And that's why, frankly, our revenue continues to grow. It's not by accident. It's through continued efforts of this administration. Uh, Mayor Gray uh, has never accepted a business-as-usual mentality, and he has set the bar high uh, year after year, and we should continue to do so. What does the uh, $98.7 million, uh, uh, I'm sorry, where, where does the uh, $98.7 million we are carrying forward this year uh, go to fund? Well, there is roughly $139 million in policy initiatives in the fiscal year 15 budget. But the majority of funding uh, goes to obviously the two largest ones, public education and affordable housing. Now, we've heard a lot about this from the council. If the council is really seriously concerned about the ability of this executive, even though we've succeeded three years straight, or a future executive to run a more efficient government, you're really not faced with a difficult problem here. Simply by cutting back on new initiatives, you could easily eliminate the need for any revenue carryover or performance savings. So if you really think this is a problem, there's really a very simple solution to it. Now, do we recommend doing that? Certainly not. Certainly not. We would be losing an incredible opportunity to use certified revenue that is not part of our general fund balance at this time but to continue to accelerate education reform here in the District of Columbia and to provide affordable housing for D.C. residents and reduce chronic homelessness. The mayor committed to replenishing our reserves through unallocated year-end surpluses. We have held true to our word all four years, and this budget is no exception, and our fund balance and cash on hand is at a record high. There is a tipping point, however, when the district becomes so conservative in its assumptions that we miss opportunities to make investments that improve the quality of life for our residents and we miss the chance to demand continuously better performance from our government. Conversely, there are some, and I heard it today, uh, who would recommend withdrawing money from the fund balance to pay for even more spending. This is even more concerning because this was the precise strategy that caused the district's fund balance to plummet uh, between fiscal year 2008 and fiscal year 2010 by over 50%. Now, we believe we have struck, again, the right balance in terms of the budget of responsibly building our fund balance, but also investing in services. Mr. Goulet. Yes, sir. Uh, you said that the mayor is committed to replenishing our reserves through unallocated year-end surpluses. Exactly. When exactly does that happen? For instance, it, it with regard to FY13, when did that happen? It happens during the CAFR closeout each year. So it would happen uh, and the CAFR closes out uh, you know, beginning in about October 1st, usually takes them until February 1st when it's roughly released each year. Uh, so it would be any funds uh, through the closeout process that aren't allocated. It could be additional revenue that's been identified uh, through. I didn't ask you what. I said when. So when right. specifically does that so when it, occur? I mean, the fiscal year closes September 30th. Yes. Uh, there can be adjustments, usually a month of adjustments the CFO can make internally. Uh, however, uh, during the closeout process, any funds that have not been spent. You're still not telling me when. When? And I'll just tell you why I'm asking, because okay. the mayor leaves office on January 2nd. Well, it would be any funds after October 1st. So when would you uh, replenish the reserves? When would I replenish them? Yes. So I don't understand. In we're not November, taking... in December, or is that left to the new mayor in We're January? not taking any money from the reserve funds here. What we're doing instead is taking certified revenue, putting it in a lockbox, and then carrying it over to the next fiscal year. We're not taking any money, and I want to be clear about this, from our locally mandated reserves to pay for anything. That was our commitment to the rating agencies to not raid the fund balance and to build those reserves. So, but you are taking money from the conting contingency reserve. And repaying it this fiscal year. So actually, those funds uh, will be repaid in full. Uh, there's a two-year period when you legally can repay them. Mr. We Goulet. Yes. The mayor committed to replenishing our reserves through unallocated year-end surpluses. Correct. That's what we're talking about. Yes. Okay. Um, what, what we have through the errata letter is a further borrowing from the contingency reserve, and it's not replenished in the errata letter. 
Oh, it certainly is. All of it is in the Yeah, 100 percent. Absolutely. Uh, what we did, what we've been very careful to do uh, through the errata letter and uh, is when we borrow from contingency cash to repay within the same year, because we want to go up to Wall Street uh, with a contingency cash fund that is fully, fully filled. And uh, we have not uh, taken a dime out of that fund. It's available for unforeseen or non-recurring needs here in the city. We haven't used a dollar from that fund that isn't fully restored. In fact, Mr. Chairman, that's one of the big hits uh, that, uh, you know, regrettably were made to the city fund, is we had specific needs, a lot of which in our public safety cluster that we had to pay for this year, mm -hmm. and we had to take revenue that we otherwise would have carried forward to 15, bring it back to fiscal year 14, and fully replenish that reserve fund this fiscal year. So there won't be a dollar uh, that hasn't been replenished from that fund, and you, you won't even have to do that in the closeout process. It'll be done when you approve the supplemental budget. Go on. Okay, the, the, uh, moving on to the fiscal year 2015 uh, Budget Support Act of 2014. Uh, the fiscal year 2015 Budget Support Act of 2014 uh, makes amendments to the laws of the District of Columbia that are necessary to implement the policies, initiatives, and cost savings incorporated into the budget and financial plan. Uh, before discussing the legislation, I would again like to emphasize uh, that this year's BSA is entirely germane to the budget. As you are well aware, the mayor has always made it a priority of his uh, to ensure that only budget-related subtitles are contained in the BSA. Uh, this year's document is certainly no different. Uh, without reciting every subtitle in my testimony, I would like to take this opportunity to highlight several portions of the Act that support key priorities of the mayor's budget in the areas of government operations, economic development, public education, health and human services, and finance and revenue. Of course, I am available today to address any questions you might have about any of the other subtitles uh, that are included in the bill. Uh, government direction and support title we'll start with. Uh, the first subtitle I want to highlight is the Pay As You Go and Reserve Fund Accounts Amendment Act of 2014. This subtitle would make a needed clarifying amendment uh, to the PAYGO language, first of all, this is a, a small technical change, to make it clear that the provision applies in fiscal year 16 uh, when it was intended to. I've always believed it applied then, uh, but there was some confusion about that. Uh, the, the, uh, and this just eliminates that confusion. Uh, but more importantly, uh, this subtitle uh, amends the use of the fiscal stabilization and cash flow reserve accounts uh, to provide budget authority and funding uh, for locally approved expenditures during the federal government shutdown, providing that any amounts used must be replenished immediately after the shutdown. Mr. Chairman, you and I had this discussion at a hearing uh, on the shutdown, and we committed to make this change uh, during the next budget, because you and I had both agreed at that hearing that this was something that was needed. Uh, we would have been even uh, more shutdown proof uh, had we been able to access our locally mandated reserves uh, during that shutdown. And uh, I think we had both agreed that that uh, no year appropriation authority should be available. There was some legal concern from attorneys that it was not. Uh, but these changes allow the district to use all funding in these two accounts should a shutdown ever occur again. As you will recall, we found ourselves in this situation uh, and we were able to come the obstacles. However, there were these significant legal and financial questions that were raised. These amendments will eliminate any doubt that we can access our local reserves if the shutdown ever occurs in the future. Uh, lastly, uh, this subtitle outlines how funding in these accounts can be used uh, once the district has fully funded uh, the emergency contingency fiscal stabilization and cash flow uh, reserve funds. Uh, in accordance with our previously agreed upon strategy, uh, that uh, yourself, Mr. Chairman, the mayor, and I believe Councilmember McDuffie as well, uh, committed uh, that after we reach the two months cash on hand, all additional uncommitted funds in the unrestricted balance of the general fund shall uh, be used for the following purposes. 50% uh, uh, shall be deposited in the Housing Production Trust Fund. Incredibly important to accelerate affordable housing and will easily get us above that $100 million amount for most years. 25% uh, uh, shall be deposited in the District uh, Retiree Health Benefits Fund, which is OPEB, as we refer to it. I know that's a big issue for you, Mr. Chairman. And then also another issue I think that's very important is 25% uh, uh, shall be reserved for PAYGO projects, and this will increase as we 
uh, fill up the OPEB fund. Uh, one other important thing this does is it allows us to also use the fiscal stabilization reserve uh, for cash flow purposes as well. The reason this is really important is it may allow us to eliminate what's called trans-borrowing altogether. It really is viewed as a sign of weakness if a jurisdiction has to borrow on a short-term basis. Because of the odd configuration of our fiscal year, uh, we have to result, go to short-term borrowing because our big property uh, and income taxes don't come until March or April, even though our fiscal year starts in October. Uh, so, but if we can get to the two months and we can use the fiscal stabilization reserve, we actually may be able to eliminate trans-borrowing in the district altogether, which would be a fabulous achievement. Uh, the other subtitle I want to highlight is the family bonding. Oh, let me move. interrupt you for a second. Yes. That's a local account, or is that yes. one of the congressional accounts? There's two of the locally mandated reserve funds. Right now, we can use, uh, by statute, the contingency cash reserve fund for cash flow purposes. The uh, other two are local accounts. Uh, one is clear, the cash flow reserve is clearly for cash flow. That's what it's solely for. Uh, the fiscal stabilization fund, I'll actually uh, take blame for this myself because I was the one who drafted uh, the legislation you know, when I was on, on that side of the dais, uh, you know, was just a drafting error. We, of course, wanted that to be used for cash flow purposes as well as spending pressures, uh, but it just did not allow, have that as an allowable use on there. This is just really a technical correction to make sure that it's clear we can use it for cash flow purposes so that you really don't have to go to the market and waste money uh, borrowing on short-term funds when we can use our own money that will then just simply yes, be it, replenished later in the year. Th this is local law governing those funds. Correct. Right. So this is an amendment to local law only, but it gives you the authority uh, and the CFO authority to use it for cash flow purposes. And to avoid the trans-borrowing. To avoid the trans-borrowing, yes, sir. And that does not require congressional action. No, it doesn't, but the, what, what it does require in the Request Act, and we've included this, is to get that no year appropriation authority uh, for the two funds, uh, both the cash flow reserve and this fiscal stabilization reserve, because that was the big debate last time, is could we access these funds uh, during a shutdown? And one of them has to... The, uh, what do they call it, continuing appropriation authority? Well, neither of our local funds did, only the two federal funds. Uh, so the, the contingency cash fund and the emergency cash fund had the no year appropriation authority attached. The two locally mandated reserves, the fiscal stabilization fund and the cash flow fund, did not. So we were told we could not utilize those during a shutdown uh, to cover district expenses, even though we knew we would be able to fully reimburse those funds uh, when our budget authority became available. So it, it may be a, a moot issue. We'll see how the budget autonomy case goes. But this uh, is still very important to have in there uh, to make sure that there's never a situation again where we wouldn't be able to access our local reserve funds in the event of a shutdown. The, uh, moving back to the Family Bonding Leave Program Amendment Act of 2014, uh, this subtitle would allow an eligible employee to receive leave uh, with pay for as long as six work weeks following the birth of a child. The legal placement of a child with the employee, uh, such as through adoption, guardianship, foster care, or the placement of a child with the employee for whom the employee permanently assumes and discharges parental responsibilities. The employee would receive a guarantee of return uh, to the same or equivalent position and continue to accrue leave, uh, whether it be annual leave, sick leave, during his or leave absence. Uh, passing this legislation is a major priority for the mayor as it not only is an important measure, but it is a human, humane thing to do here for our employees. It will allow newly formed families the needed time to bond without the stress of a lost paycheck or job. Uh, we're going to move on now to the Economic Development and Regulation uh, subtitle or title. Uh, there are three important subtitles in this title that I do want to discuss. Uh, the first is the Manufacturer Tasting Permit Amendment Act of 2014. Uh, this amendment will allow for the on-site sale and consumption of beer uh, brewed brought by a brewery. It will enhance the profitability and sustainability of local breweries. Now, I came to the District of Columbia you know, probably, I think, 11 or 12 years ago. I would have never imagined that we would be a new popular site for local breweries here, but it really has taken off and has brought tremendous revenue uh, here into the district's economy. However, current breweries in the district are limited to offering free samples and sale of beer to go, uh, you know, when people take them with them, which is really unnecessarily limiting their revenue stream. 
It also really puts them uh, at a competitive disadvantage uh, with competitors in Maryland and Virginia. And this amendment will just simply help support our local uh, businesses. It will enhance tourism uh, because people want to tour these breweries and will help uh, bring new breweries uh, to the District of Columbia. Uh, the second subtitle I want to mention uh, was actually talked about earlier here today, and that is the Local Rent Supplement Sustainment Amendment Act of 2014. This is an incredibly important subtitle, uh, which is designed to end chronic homelessness by requiring that all new and vacant slots for the local rent supplement assistance be filled with chronically homeless families and individuals referred by our Department of Human Services. Referrals must obviously be made uh, in accordance with special criteria in the DCMR and in keeping with the capacity of the vacant units. For instance, we would not take uh, an individual and move them into a family unit or vice versa. We would respect those covenants that are on those units. Uh, these changes will help ensure that we protect our most vulnerable residents here in the city. If we continue to let outside organizations fill units from their own waiting lists, we will not be utilizing those district units effectively to reduce chronic homelessness here in the District of Columbia. If we're putting the money up, it should be for those most in need and it should be used to reduce chronic homelessness. The last subtitle I want to mention is the Film DC Economic Incentive Amendment Act of 2014. Uh, this subtitle would repeal all previously existing language associated with the Film DC program and replace it with a new structure which is actually identical to the original structure that it was proposed in the first place. Uh, it will create, uh, recreate the Film DC Economic Incentive Grant Fund uh, with a number of criteria. Uh, these grant funds, uh, most importantly, cannot exceed 100% of the taxes paid to the district on the qualified expenses. Uh, the two uh, films that actually were successful in this program were done under this criteria, and the whole point being that we may, for, we may forego 100% of the taxes that these film organizations pay when they come into the District of Columbia, but we're not going to pay more than we get back in taxes. That's incredibly important to making this a profitable venture for the district. Uh, for the purposes of this subsection, uh, we, we term qualified expenses as any costs paid in the district for film, television projects, including any expenses incurred for vehicle rentals, camera equipment, lighting, stage equipment, recording equipment, costumes, wardrobe, construction materials, props, scenery materials, film and tape, design materials, special effects, fabric, uh, uh, printing or production scripts, and so on and so forth, including food, hotel, all of these expenses associated with films. Uh, so we make sure the program, once again, is viable and that it does not end up, we don't end up paying out more than we get in, which I know is the goal that both the council and the mayor shares uh, for this program. Uh, moving on to the public education title. Uh, the public education title contains important subtitles like the Funding for Public Schools and the Public Charter Schools Amendment Act of 2014 which would establish the funding levels for the 2014-2015 school year. Uh, this subtitle appears in the BSA each year, but I did want to mention that this year it includes a number of increased weights, as well as the establishment of an at-risk weight. As you all know, uh, nothing is more important to the mayor uh, than public education, and as proof, he has invested more than $100 million into DCPS and DC public charter schools uh, through these weights, to keep our public education system moving forward quickly in the right direction. Uh, the mayor recognizes that schools are improving, but that more needs to still be done, and the actions taken as part of this year's budget are just another step in the right direction. Uh, if we stay the course in public education, uh, we will soon have the best urban education system in the country, and we are moving that way in the very near future. I would also like to make note of the Alternative School Establishment Act of 2014 subtitle, which would establish criteria and guidelines for alternative schools. The Preferences in Admission for Public Charter Schools Act of 2014 uh, clarifies how students are admitted uh, in the case of large applicant pools, and the Common Lottery Advisory Board Establishment Act uh, also uh, puts in place the key board and its governing structure. Uh, moving on to the Health and Human Services title. Uh, the Health and Human Services title contains a number of provisions related to the protecting the district's most vulnerable residents. But there is one in particular that I want to highlight. 
uh, subtitle H, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Amendment uh, and Cost of Living Adjustment Act of 2014, is the result of our collaboration with Councilmember Barry. We worked very uh, closely with him in uh, getting this in the budget, and the council member gave us a lot of uh, sound advice on how to get this in. It would provide CPI increases in fiscal years 2015 and 2016 and would then increase the benefit by 46% in fiscal year 17 uh, to be commensurate uh, to similar benefits in Maryland. And it is also roughly equivalent to if we did a CPI adjustment back to the last time this was increased all the way to 1996. Uh, this will undoubtedly provide needed benefits to families in need, something the mayor has always supported. Uh, there was talk, though, and I'm going to talk briefly about this up here today, uh, about trying to uh, go back on welfare reform here in the District of Columbia. Uh, this has been a concern in the last couple of years, and I want to talk briefly about the history on this. Uh, everyone else, uh, every other jurisdiction in the country, when welfare reform was implemented in the 90s, uh, put in place what was called temporary assistance uh, for needy families. You know, for all the right reasons, uh, the District of Columbia you know, wanted to keep funding people in need and uh, continued this uh, after federal funds disappeared as an entirely locally funded program on a permanent basis. I've even heard certain cynics refer to this instead of the TANF program uh, to call it the PANF program, which referred to permanent assistance for needy families, which is certainly not the direction we should have gone in. Now, the district decided to be the only jurisdiction in the country to pay everyone uh, for 100 percent of the benefits, regardless of whether they met work requirements, and for an unlimited period of time. Now, uh, unfortunately, despite the best intentions, uh, this relegated people uh, to a cycle of gener generational poverty. It didn't encourage job creation. It didn't encourage placement of people into jobs. And over the last five years, the mayor has put in place a step-down program, which brings us back into compliance with where the rest of the country uh, went in the 1990s. Uh, the mayor has not wanted to cut anyone off of funding. Instead, he's wanted to move people towards self-sufficiency by, by creating new jobs here in the district and making sure those jobs are filled with D.C. residents by giving our residents training through the community college and making sure that people can be self-sufficient here in the District of Columbia. Uh, we will have provided five years of time uh, for people to uh, get training, uh, to be educated, and we will still have the most generous programs of anywhere in the country in terms of our uh, assistance programs. So I don't want to leave anyone with the impression that we are not supportive of trying to move people to a better place. Uh, but we've taken five years, and we need to get to where everyone else is because the other system, frankly, has not worked. Uh, finance and Revenue title. Finance and Revenue title contains several subtitles that are necessary to balance the district's budget. But I only want to highlight a couple as they contain much-needed tax relief or other program expenditures. The mayor's fiscal year 15 budget contains incentives designed uh, to reduce the tax burden on D.C. residents in accordance with many of the recommendations uh, from our Tax Revision Commission, which has done an excellent job providing uh, a, a number of very interesting recommendations that over time uh, I'm sure many of them will be implemented. Uh, Subtitle A includes a number of bills passed by the Council subject to appropriations. While all of these bills uh, you know, were important to the Mayor, uh, he only could fund a few in this budget. Uh, specifically, wanted to highlight three of these, the Earn Sick and Safe Leave Amendment Act of 2013, uh, the Minimum Wage Amendment Act of 2013, and the Senior Citizen Real Property Tax Relief Act of 2014. Uh, the funding of these bills lives up to the commitments uh, previously made by the mayor and all represent key priorities of this administration. Particularly, I would like to folk highlight the importance of the Seniors Bill, as it would provide $8.5 million dollars to exempt low- and middle-income seniors uh, from real property taxes if they are at least 70 years old and have owned a residence in the district uh, for 20 uh, consecutive years. There's also a limit on the number of assets you can have. Uh, this was a bill that was actually championed by Councilmember Anita Bonds on the Council. Uh, it was passed subject to appropriations initially, and we were happy to fund it uh, in this budget because this was a real priority for the mayor. Additionally, uh, we've added uh, a technical amendment uh, to this uh, that would clarify that that 20 consecutive year per period of time 
uh, could include no more than two non-consecutive gaps of ownership where each gap uh, shall not exceed 120 days. Uh, what we didn't want to have happen is for anyone to be inadvertently disqualified because of a short gap between a sale of one property and then the closing on another property. That would have been unfair, and it could have been a period of just a few days over a time of 20 years and disqualified the person from this benefit altogether. Uh, continuing on the theme of reducing taxes, uh, the mayor's BSA also contains subtitle B, the Tax Revision Commission Policy Recommendations Implementation Act of 2014. Uh, this subtitle would institute the changes approved by the Tax Revision Commission uh, to the district's tax code that the mayor was able to include in the budget, uh, supporting the following. Uh, reducing the marginal tax rate on individual income between 40000 and 60000 from 8.5% to 7.5%. That's funded a couple ways. First, by repealing uh, the sunset on the high income earners tax. We had, it seemed to have a lot of support for that here today at the hearing. And it's similar to what we saw when we first proposed this uh, during the mayor's first budget. Uh, we went around to uh, eight ward town halls. And even people uh, who make that type of money here in the district uh, were supportive of a more progressive tax system. Uh, we also uh, have other changes here, reducing the business franchise and unincorporated business franchise tax rates. Uh, from 9.975 down to 9.37. Uh, there's additional reductions in the uh, priority list, but they weren't uh, been able to fund in the budget. And uh, we were able to do that uh, through uh, changing the apportionment uh, of multi-state businesses uh, income uh, to a single weighted sales formula. Now, what this means is that district businesses, particularly our small businesses, well, the, the do business in the District of Columbia will receive a uh, tax break that's funded essentially through large multi-state businesses that are doing less business here in the district. And that's why uh, the Tax Revision Commission recommended this. Uh, we also have a provision here which we think will generate money in the short and long term, uh, but there is an upfront cost to it, and that's exempting passive investment vehicles from the income tax to encourage more of that business uh, to be done in the district. And finally, we do uh, have a provision here which is somewhat technical, which has all non-premium tobacco products being taxed equally. Uh, finally, Mr. Uh, Goulet, um, yes. why would the, um, when the um, Tax Revision Commission initially looked at the exempting passive investment vehicles, its uh, initial estimate was that there was no cost. Now the CFO is scoring it at a $4 million cost. Why? I, I spoke with the CFO about that. Uh, the Tax Revision Commission, I think, was lo looking at certain factors. As you know, you know what our, uh, our CFO takes a fairly conservative approach in terms of making sure that we will have the revenue coming in that we expect to be generated before uh, accounting for that. Uh, the Tax Revision Commission did not consider uh, they were not as conservative in that estimate. They were thinking this would bring immediate revenue in. So I think uh, you know both sides are just looking at it slightly from different approaches here. The uh, but do we the overall concept is the same. Do we have any passive investment vehicles in the district? Uh, we, we, have a, we have a few right now, uh, but, but and I think that was their concern. I think they could probably speak to this better than I could in terms of how they calculated uh, their fiscal impact versus the way the uh, Tax Revision Commission did. I'm going to call out, uh, I think we have a representative in the CFO's office here. She's probably thrilled I'm going to call her up. I think it was both, uh, Yesim Yomaz was both a member of the Tax Revision Commission and also calculated uh, the fiscal impact statement, Mr. Chairman. So she would be eminently more qualified to answer this than myself. What I was told uh, back in uh, December, January, was that there were none of these, um, what is a passive investment vehicle? It's uh, basically a fund. It is a hedge fund. And then we're looking in the district. Mr. Chairman, how do we operate like that? If you can ask questions back and forth without any time limit on it, what happens to myself and other members of the council who want to ask the same thing? So how do, how do we do that? How do we compute that? Well, if you have a question on this discrete issue, fine. When these are, you know, as chair of the committee, I have to go through a number of these very technical issues. Oh, I see. And uh, that's why I'm interrupting the testimony to bring it up. If you have a follow-up on this specific issue. No, here's, here's what usually happens in every committee I'm on. The chair certainly has some discretion. Thank you. But after the testimony is when those kinds of questions are asked. Well, I have a lot more questions. Yeah. As the chair of the committee, I have well, and and. 
the role right. of the uh, the function of the budget is such that I have a lot of questions. I understand that, but the rules are that the chairman has the same kind of time that the members have. But I'll I'll be. I thought you said there was some discretion. Can Miss um, discretion does not mean just go on and Ms. on. Miss Yomas, answer the question. In, How much in, time will I have after you finish? With regard to this specific issue? No, about the budget. Well, when Mr. Goulet is done with his statement, then uh, we'll be on 10-minute rounds. All right. Including me. Almost there. Two more pages. On this uh, passive investment. So these are hedge funds. Do we have so any? Un uh, yeah, um, excuse me. They're unincorporated businesses that trade on their own account. So um, the initial discussion with the Tax Revision Commission was that they were tra going to write a legislation that will make sure that no existing entity in the District of Columbia will qualify for it. We did not make any comments on the fiscal impact until we saw the legislation. We usually will not do it. I think what was in the re report about that it won't have a cost was the intent is to write it in a way that it wouldn't have a cost. But ultimately, this is a loophole. It is a very small loophole for companies that trade on their own accounts, and it will have a cost by the virtue of being a loophole. Well, and just to, just to add on to that, I mean, I think loophole uh, you know, for us seems like a harsh word because our goal is to actually get investors into the District of Columbia. So we want people, these hedge fund investors, to come in, uh, to, to, to locate in the District of Columbia and to invest their money uh, here in the district. So, yeah, I think I, I would call it maybe more of an incentive uh, than a loophole to bring in uh, these businesses. And I actually think, you know, we, we believe in the uh, Economic Development Office that so this is going to be an important part of our economic development strategy for bringing more business into the District of Columbia and get a critical mass of these hedge fund investors uh, to locate here in the district. Now, there, you know, there may be some estimates of an upfront cost because we've got certain businesses that will take advantage of this now, but the long-term benefit is you create that critical mass of people who want to come and invest here in the District of Columbia. And that's the long-term reward. It may not be able to be calculated right now uh, for the purposes of this, but the investment is well worth it because we will achieve that. Well, but the trick is that their offices will be located in the district because they will have employees who they will be paying um, – Real property taxes, have exactly. employees, some of them who will live here, they'll be paying sales tax. That's where we get the benefit, correct? Exactly. My understanding is we don't have any of those now. That's what the Tax Revision Commission initially said. That's why I don't understand how it went from zero to four million. We have enough investment firms in the district that we cannot just say, you know, I cannot discuss the specifics of an individual firm. But I cannot say that we have no companies in the district that do not trade on their own accounts. So yes. the data, the, uh, uh, go ahead, please. No, please. Uh, the estimate we have is driven by the 2007 census data that tells us the gross receipts of investment firms, and we apportion the p part of it to the activities of these firms that on, they have trading on their own accounts. So it is, in fact, not a conservative estimate, but I believe it's a law of estimates. But um, there will be a loss to us. Hey, we're not disputing their estimate at all, I think. I think what we're, we're just looking at is what we haven't been able to quantify yet, which is the, the long-term benefit of getting a critical mass of these businesses here in the district that are hiring D.C. residents, that are, are living here. And, and we cited the statistic earlier about how t taxes being raised here in the district are now being spent in the district. So you bring these firms in, you locate them throughout the city, you have this investment here, and you're going to have incredible spillover benefits uh, that, that are, are things the CFO can't calculate yet in their fiscal impact statements, but they're going to be very real in the very near future. Such as? Uh, such as increased property taxes, increased income taxes. Uh, I mean, that's what you want to do is encourage businesses to move to the district, sales taxes. And you heard testimony earlier about some concern of the softening of our office vacancy rates. Now, these people will locate in, you locate in uh, office buildings in the District of Columbia. So we want to encourage more investment firms to move here. Uh, you know, there may be some impact. I'm not uh, disputing anything the CFO was saying. You know, from this, there may be some impact. I think the Tax Revision Commission thought it would be minimal. I think they think it may be a bit higher. But uh, either way, the long-term benefit of this is really clear, which is that we're going to bring these investment firms to the district, and they're going to fill our offices and fill our coffers uh, with income tax, property tax, and sales tax. 
Uh, I may come back to this. Why don't you go on with your statement? Thank okay, you. Okay, terrific. Uh, the additional uh, contingent revenue priority list, I'll have to highlight one thing on here. Uh, the uh, next section uh, involves uh, a very difficult budget choice the mayor had to make. And that was, as we talked about earlier in the errata letter, uh, because of uh, unforeseen cost pressures uh, in both fiscal years 14 and 15 uh, that arose uh, after we submitted the budget, the biggest of which being the fire contract, uh, pension requirements, uh, we were not able to put funding in uh, for the city fund and you know, let there be a balanced budget. So the mayor did not want to force the council uh, to make the tough call on this one. Uh, he instead wanted to be responsible, tell you about these cost increases, and then propose a solution. Our solution uh, involved uh, reducing the city funds $15 million, but then moving that to first on the contingent revenue priority list. So if additional revenue uh, is generated in June, uh, we would still be able to fund the important purposes of the uh, city fund, which gives uh, grants on a purely competitive basis to our nonprofits here uh, to do very uh, innovative things. Uh, number two on the list, the only other one I'll talk about, is uh, to continue to increase our infant and toddler funding, which has been you know, a, a real success story here in the city uh, for three and four year olds and now one and two year olds. And that's got to be uh, one of the largest reasons why we're seeing this increase in test scores. Uh, in total, there's uh, 20 items on this list, uh, 52 million in expenditures, 86.4 in tax relief items. Now, we're optimistic. Uh, Maybe not that we'll be able to fund all of them in June, but that uh, the district's uh, recent fiscal success may allow us to fund a portion of these. And uh, you know, if we can't fund them this year, maybe we'll come back to them in a future year to be able to do more of them. The special purpose revenue and dedicated uh, revenue fund amendments and transfers section, the last section uh, that I will discuss uh, today, uh, it really involves a uh, mayor's goal of cleaning up the budget uh, to increase uh, transparency and accountability. I'll actually give the, the council credit this, council budget director, uh, the general council, and yourself, Mr. Chairman, started this initiative last year uh, with, some, uh, with these uh, dedicated funds by putting in that no year appropriation authority uh, for a number of these in the budget so you don't have to come back with all these budget authority issues each year and funds that you want to have remain available until expended uh, can, can do that for those purposes. So we followed your lead this year, did that for the remainder of the funds uh, in the budget as part of a cleanup effort. Uh, additionally, uh, you know, we have not been a uh, fan of uh, dedicated funds, O-type funds that aren't necessary uh, for dedicated purposes. So we uh, continue our effort to keep those uh, for only ones that need to be because what you don't want to have is the district's annual budget. You have a general fund. You don't need to have funds that are constantly and unnecessarily siphoned off from that uh, to go into these little silos within agencies uh, that then build up. So we want to have most of the funding uh, going to the general fund for important uh, services for our residents, uh, but also allowing uh, funds that are really necessary to be dedicated to be able to spend that money on an ongoing basis. Uh, the results, uh, really, of this full-scale review appear in the subtitle. Uh, those funds uh, which appear are either being repealed entirely uh, or some are being determined uh, that they would uh, not be needed uh, any more fund balance. And, and the good thing about this is is actually $52 million, uh, once we scrubbed all these funds, uh, was became available uh, this fiscal year. As you mentioned, concerns about this, Mr. Chairman, uh, we were able to use $52 million of fund balance that wasn't necessary for program costs. Uh, to be able to fully replenish, uh, in part, our contingent uh, reserve allocations that we've made this year. And that's a part of our plan to fully replenish uh, the contingency reserve fund out of current year revenue uh, so that when the fiscal year closes, we don't have any gap there. Uh, in conclusion, uh, Mayor Gray's uh, budget uh, for fiscal year 15 continues the amazing financial turnaround uh, the mayor has generated since he took office in January of 2011. Uh, the budget is not balanced by raising taxes or fees, and it funds critical priorities in education, public safety, and workforce development, while continuing to preserve the district safety net for our most vulnerable residents. Uh, I really appreciate you allowing me to go through all the, uh, this lengthy testimony, but there's a lot of important things in these three acts. Uh, so thank you for your indulgence on that. And I'm right now happy to answer any questions uh, that you, Mr. Chairman, or Council Member Barry, uh, may have on any of the measures I discussed or any of the other measures uh, in these bills. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Goulet. Uh, on that last point about the special purpose, 
You said something about making some of them non-lapsing or? Yeah, what, what we're doing is. Rather no uh, subject to, um, what you put it? Right, uh, the, the, the no-year appropriation authority. Yeah, uh, but I don't see that in your written statement. I added it in. I ad-libbed in a few places in my testimony I here because I thought of some important things that weren't in there. Uh, you know, including giving credit to, to, to really you for starting this effort last year. I mean, just as a general matter, we've tried to go through these uh, non-lapsing funds and identify areas where, uh, you know, funds aren't needed for dedicated purposes. In that case, we've returned the money to the general fund. However, if, you know, working with the council, uh, we've determined that funds should be in a dedicated non-lapsing fund that's available till expended. Uh, you, your, your office took the lead on this last year by providing no year appropriation authority for those funds. Uh, so we wouldn't have to worry about them continuously coming back for reappropriation the next year. It's exactly the sim same thing that we're looking at right now with our locally mandated reserves that you allow uh, funds that you've appropriated. Let's say, let me give you a good example of this. Uh, let's say we have a situation where uh, our doctors have, uh, they pay a licensing fee into a dedicated non-lapsing fund. Well, they pay that fund in and then they decide there's something they need to do to upgrade uh, some computer equipment in their office. Now, they, they put the money in the fund. It's, it's not going anywhere. It's locked into the fund balance. But they have to come back to the council each year to get an appropriation of O-type authority to spend that money, uh, even though the intent of the council has been clear, which is that money be available until expended. So the council took the lead last year, which we thought made a lot of sense, of rather than have to go through uh, these unnecessary supplemental requests, which are sent all the way to Congress to get approval for this, uh, we simply add that no year appropriation authority, which we're also seeking on our locally mandated reserves, so we can really bypass Congress from this budget approval process uh, because it's simply not necessary uh, for dedicated funds to have to go through an appropriation process year after year after year. So that would be the purpose for this, and we thank you for you know, giving us the idea and showing us why this makes sense. Uh, you're welcome. Um, Mr. Berry, for 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me again commend you for being here all day uh, as the chair of the Committee of the Whole with all the other responsibilities that means that you really seriously care about that. I want to thank Eric Gray for uh, being very detailed. Uh, one, it helps us on Channel 13 for the public to see what's going on. Because budgets are very hard to read. I mean, I've only, I learned my first year or two as mayor how to read them, and I've been reading them ever since. And you still know them to this day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my, my directors always knew if you come into my office with a number, you better not change it unless there's some overriding reason to do so. Uh, my first year, man, it came with all kind of numbers and they couldn't be explained or justified, but finally they got to a point where they could do that. Also, uh, Eric, I've told you and the mayor how, how grateful we in Ward 8 are. Uh, didn't get everything we asked for, but we got a direction. And uh, in particular, in terms of our physical kind of streetscape, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. What I'm committed to doing is changing the perception of Ward 8. Uh, for too long, it's been viewed as a land of uh, the uh, gangbangers and prostitutes and, and welfare mothers and those kind of things, which we know is not the case. Yeah. There are 73,000 of us who live in Ward 8, 70 some thousand in Ward 7. And we've been neglected over the years. Some of it institutionalized, some of it's personal. So what we were trying to do is we knew we couldn't fill that gap in one year. So I'm appreciative for you all, for you and the mayor. Uh, we talked a lot about it we just last week. We, I think we went through the list to see where we are. Uh, I'm going to go over it again over the weekend so I can get busy with the chairs of these committees to make sure they understand what that money is all about. Well, thank you, Mr. Berry. We yes. appreciate that. And I want to also give credit to you for proposing these initiatives because the, the, the over $3 million we put in for streetscape funds for Ward 8 corridors, 
the money that's going to provide business facade improvements, and then also the additional clean team funding for that collective Ward 8 business initiative, I think is going to do just what you said, which is to really you know, add a new energy to Ward 8 business corridors and make people realize that Ward 8 is open for business and encourage people to go spend their money there. One thing I'm, I'm committed to doing is making Martin Luther King a grand boulevard, mm -hmm. not that ragged stuff we see up there now at Michael X and Martin Luther King, but to try to really get some architects with some creativity to say, here's where we're going to go, and then figure out how to get there. And the I same is true with good old Bro. Uh, Martin Luther King is the entry point to Ward 8 across the 11th Street Bridge. Mm -hmm. And what people see now is, is ridiculous. It's crazy. They see a, uh, a facade on, in 1900 that's, that's been up there for about 15 years. You, I think it was there when you were working for San That's Island. right. It was. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. That whole corner is, is outrageous. I've talked to Victor Hoskins about it. I haven't gotten much results, to be frank with you. So that money would help with that. Then you got the Alabama Avenue quarter. We don't have many businesses on Minnesota Avenue, but those that we have uh, ought to reflect the character uh, of the neighborhood. And twenty-five thousand dollars average. It's not nearly as much as the eighty-five we got on Eighth Street, but times are different now. And that that whole regard. Also, uh, uh, Eric, I'm not for hardly any tax reductions. I said earlier today that you can't compare our taxing structure with Virginia, Montgomery County, or Fairfax County, or Arlington County, because we have these high social costs. Taxes are supposed to pay for the running of government, etc. For instance, as you very well know, we spend $2 billion 30% of his hours on health care. And people are getting sicker. They're not getting well. It seems to me it ought to have some impact on that. We have over 200,000 people on Medicaid, uh, which indicates that there's poverty there. So until this city, not just the mayor, not just the council, but the entire city, do something about this disparity in income, uh, for instance, in Ward 3, uh, I'm not picking on them, I'm just stating the fact. The average family income is $200,000. Whereas in Ward 8, the average income is $26,000. You can see that gap. This is loud. We know it affects education. It affects the criminal justice system. It affects all of these these things that, that, are, that are there. So uh, let me ask a series of questions about this housing money. I commend the mayor for putting 187 million dollars in the 14, uh, additional 100 million in 15. How much of that 187 has been targeted for HPAP? Do you know? I, I believe it was a million dollars directly into HPAP on top of the existing budget for HPAP, and uh, we've also tied that into a Ward 8 and Ward 7 home ownership campaign, which I think was recommended by yourself, was an additional $300,000 for that, because Ward 7 and 8, as you very well know, have lower levels of home ownership than elsewhere in the city. So we want to be able to encourage, uh, you know, through these incentives that you help us put in place here, uh, to be able to encourage residents in Ward 7 how and Ward much, 8 how much to that homes. How much of that has been spent? Uh, 187, approximately. 187, that was, uh, that was the money that was issued through the consolidated RFP. It's all been allocated for various projects, I think a lot of which are in Ward 7 and 8. But I don't know how much has been spent. It, it all's transferred from the district uh, government budget over to the Housing Production Trust Fund, which, as you know, is an enterprise agency budget. It's all been awarded. I don't know where each individual project is in terms I'm of I'm going to find out because I vigorously disagree with the mayor on putting only a million dollars in home ownership. We know that there are people who have been living uh, in Ward 8 and Ward 7, other low-income communities, for a long time and renting. And when you rent, as you very well know, you don't get any equity or anything else. 
So I'm going to look at where that money has gone, where that money has been spent, and try to convince my colleagues to put a lot more money into HPAP. At one point, I recall, we had about $100 million in HPAP uh, when I came in, I think. But we need more home ownership. $300,000 is a nice gesture, but it ain't going to buy us very much, Eric. I know it's not your decision. It's the mayor's decision, so I'm not going to. But it was an increase of a million dollars that's, above that's what was last year, and that'll, be, that'll go Come a long on. way. Let's not get into that, Eric. I'm trying to be nice about that. That's a million dollars out of $187 million. That's just ridiculous. But we're, we're, I do my homework, and I find out where it is, and I work with you on where it is, and try to convince my colleagues to take more money and put it in home ownership. That's meaningful. You know, the HPAP program, I think, is $30,000 now uh, per, per, per family in terms of in income. The other, other problem I have is cutting out the $15 million from the city fund. And an $11 billion budget, Eric, doesn't make sense. I don't want to put in the con in contingency for the thing. Yeah. I'm going to work hard as I can to identify monies to do that. The most egregious part of this, and not, do, and not yours, it's the mayor, is the TANF cut. It's outrageous. Here people suffering and pushing every day, trying to get out of poverty, trying to get some jobs that they can't get. We had a hearing on human services, and 90 percent of the jobs they got for the TANF people, the few jobs they got, were all at minimum wage jobs. And you know, you, you, you've been in Washington a long time, you know what it is. You cannot live on minimum wage, even all the subsidies and stuff. So I'm going to be working very hard. Jim Graham and I are determined to find the $6 million uh, somewhere in this budget that will allow this cut not to go into place. It doesn't make sense to me. Here are people who are already struggling. It's not their fault that the city continued uh, that program for more than 60 months, and so I'm going to be working on that. The other area is a streetcar, but I'll wait my next round on that one. That's going to take a little bit. Well, Mr. Baird, very, very briefly on TANF. I mean, I, you, you actually, I think, are the one who initiated this discussion back in the fall of, of 2010 uh, and got us thinking about TANF reforming. You may regret having brought that up now. No, I don't regret I'm, I'm proud but, of the fact. But what's really important is since that time, it's over a five-year period of time where these step-downs have occurred. And five years, which is the, where everybody else in the country is right now, and rather than cut people off immediately after five years who've been on for over 60 months, we cut it back gradually so people could find minimum wage jobs to start with because we realized you know, people who've been on TANF for could, could be 10, 20 years aren't suddenly going to be. I got that. Mr. Chairman, yeah. can I have one minute to deal with that? Here's what happens, Eric. It becomes a, a cycle, and it's not their fault that the city continued our local program. They, they had nothing to do with that. And secondly, when we found out, I didn't even know, I didn't, didn't know you had eight, 9,000 people on going past 60 months. I, I thought it was a smaller number, and we're looking to limit it prospectively, but I didn't know it was that much. Then we found out that nobody had been assessed. And so they finally got everybody assessed. And so let's, I'll continue the discussion on my next round. But I, but I think there's, there's no way you can justify that. No way that the mayor can justify that. I told him this. And I'm a strong supporter of America, Ray, as you very well know. I know. I've campaigned for him. But there's no way you can justify these people who've been kept in their behind uh, um, all their lives. To be have 41% cut. It's going to add to our homelessness, homeless families. We're going to pay on the front end or the back end. Mr. Baird, I think we both agree that the policy of keeping people in a temporary assistance for needy family program on a permanent basis was not a good move. You said it wasn't the fault of the government. What the mayor has done by putting this on a trajectory is getting people back to work, encouraging self-sufficiency. We're seeing people going back to work, people who were on TANF, starting with those low-wage jobs, maybe a, wall, a job at Walmart, then moving up to a job that pays higher than minimum wage, 
and becoming self-sufficient. And that's exactly what we want to do, not trap people in a system where they're having to rely upon the government, but to create jobs here in the city and to fill those jobs with D.C. residents, which is what we've done. And we're going to just be at the point where everyone else in the country ended up being. Mr. Tonight. Gouray, let's do it on our next round. All right. So I have a chance to interact on it. Um, thank you, Mr. Barry. Um, I think I will pick up on that. The, um, the reduction in the, the TANF assistance after five years, is that reduction new? No. Uh, this reduction began uh, three years ago. It, now, the councils postponed it and modified it, but it wasn't new that this would happen. Correct. It was going to be over a period of four years. It was legislated into law. We actually did do a one-year extension to make sure everybody got a sense. You haven't changed that four okay. years. We have not changed anything in the budget on it. It's still the exact same way the law contemplated it. So this, this, this sudden um, harm is actually something that's been contemplated for a number of years. Yes. We actually postponed it for a year, and it's scaled, and it's also those who have been on welfare for more than five years. Correct. You also, don't you have dollars in the budget for training, increasing the training to, so that these folks can go back to work? Yes, we do. We have not only uh, money for training, we also have money for hardship exemptions uh, in the budget as well. So there's, a, a, there's money for tra job training at UDC, job training with our CBOs, our community-based organizations. And uh, David Burns has really moved this program uh, light years of where it was before. So, so basically the deal is that we're not doing anything new except we are actually trying to help people get jobs. Yes. Um, and uh, any uh, so-called uh, harm is not just after five years, but actually after five years and the extension that we gave. Well, I think Mr. Graham said it well. Anyone who wants to move to a better place, the mayor has made every effort through these job training programs, uh, through the work readiness, through the exemptions we provide to get them there. Mr. Graham mentioned that there's a 50 percent uh, no-show rate at the, in some of these uh, job training classes. I mean, we can't make people show up. We can't make people move to a better place if they don't want to. What the mayor has tried to provide is an opportunity for anyone who wants to advance themselves to go to work, to have that opportunity. And we've provided it. And we're seeing people, Mr. Berry knows very well the reductions uh, to the unemployment rate in Ward 8. Uh, we've seen the highest reductions to unemployment in the eastern side of the city, in Wards 5, Ward 7, and Ward 8. And I'll try to get the exact statistics of those three I'm wards. I'm going to reclaim my time because I have other questions. Um, I want to ask you about truancy. Yes. Uh, and I hope somebody warned you that I would be asking they about did. this. Uh, I want to find out how much we have or where we have money for truancy in the FY15 budget. Uh, DHS, pass? Yes, I have it right here. Yeah. Right. And I'm glad you gave us a heads up on this because I did not know where all our truancy money was located. Uh, right now, yes. it appears we have $904,944 in what? Uh, for the youth uh, engagement student attendance team, uh, which is within our uh, DCPS, uh, one specialist uh, provided for homeless children, and this provides professional development for attendance improvement, uh, other student incentives and awareness. Uh, we got $1 million uh, within DHS for what's called the PASS program. Is uh, that $1 million total or $1 million additional to what they've had in the past? Uh, this is $1 million. I believe it's total, because I don't think we added money for a new initiative here. So unless they reallocated it internally. No, but they've had money. money. Pass has been around for a few years. Then it would be uh, one million total. Uh, okay. This money was uh, allocated uh, uh, for truancy work at elementary and middle school levels uh, within this program. Uh, now, Justice Grant's administration, which you're well aware of, we put a million dollars into the budget this year. There was a million last year. Uh, but it was only one-time money, so we've added that money back in uh, as recurring money uh, this fiscal year. And uh, that fund is still a non-lapsing fund, correct? Uh, I believe so, because I think there was some issue with the closeout of it last year with it being non-lapsing. So I, I believe it's a non-lapsing well, fund. It was fund. established as non-lapsing, and yeah. somebody told me that it, it was being changed to lapsing. No, somebody told me it was lapsing, and I didn't think you had proposed to change it from non-lapsing to lapsing. I don't lapsing. know whether we did. Did we? Did we? No, we didn't. Okay. No, we have not changed it. Okay. So $1 million is being added to it. 
Yes, uh, and it matches the million from the past year, but it's yeah. added to the base. Okay. And then we finally have $143,000 uh, uh, in the student transit subsidy program, which is used to help prevent uh, you know kids from being truant in the first place. How much? 143,000. It looks like here. I and thought then, the uh, transit subsidy would cost a couple million. Well, I think that's just specifically for truancy issues, if I'm reading this right. And it's got 7.4, you know, estimated total for the uh, transit subsidy program. But I think 143 of that is directed towards truancy efforts. Uh, finally, we've got uh, uh, one full-time staff member within the uh, DME, uh, which is dedicated solely to truancy work. And that's coordinating amongst all these agencies uh, to use their resources to help prevent truancy uh, here in the district. So that would be, I, I don't know the salary of that individual staff person, but we can follow up and get that for you if, you, if you'd like. Okay. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you about um, uh, borrowing from contingency. I am uh, very troubled about this. And I had a conversation, I believe, with you back in January mm -hmm. when you borrowed from the contingency fund for the super cans. Yes. That uh, I was hopeful that that would be the last time that uh, you all did that this year. And since then, I believe you've borrowed another uh, maybe 20, 30 million. In mm -hmm. the errata letter, you've got another 9 million. Yes. Borrowing from contingency. Um, you do see that this is essentially uh, getting around reprogramming submissions to the council. Uh, in the past, what you would do is uh, let's say that you wanted to fund computers in the Metropolitan Police Department. You would uh, go to, uh, I don't know, debt service savings and you would reprogram $2 million to the police department for computers. Now you don't do that. You just go to contingency. You don't have to come to the council for approval. Um, and you don't have to pay it back this year, even though it is your testimony that your commitment is to pay it back this year. If you do pay it back this year, it reduces the surplus at the end of the year, the surplus that would go to increasing our contingency reserves. Because in effect, what we're doing is we're increasing spending this year. Yeah, I, think um, one thing I see nothing good in this. The contingency fund was originally intended to be about such things as we had uh, 10 snowstorms this year, and we only expected to have the same as last year, where maybe we had two mm -hmm. school days, snow days. And uh, so that would be exceptional and extraordinary. Uh, or the duration, which would be exceptional and extraordinary. But um, uh, my god, I mean, here we got uh, on, April, on April 18th, you drew, withdrew from the contingency fund for um, funeral services. Yes, yes. We originally tried to reprogram money. But here's the your veteran affairs, one FTE for, you know, it's not a lot of money, but um, the um, um, the uh, you know th these are th these are not uh, extraordinary expenses, and you may be meeting the letter of the law, but you surely are not meeting what was our expectation several years ago. Well, I think with those funders. specifically, the challenge was we had originally found a different funding source, which was the uh, film incentive fund. Uh, there was a lengthy legal back and forth. You know, Mr. Orange was involved, attorneys from the council, uh, CFO about whether or not we could reprogram funds because we didn't want to access the contingency fund originally we wanted to reprogram for those expenses because mm -hmm. they were relatively modest Well, that may be but you know the, the 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 way the budget works as you know is that the council adopts the budget yes the mayor proposes it mm -hmm. and what we do in terms of changes is a fraction of the entire budget um, but that's the process the council has no ability to um, weigh in on any of these items. None, no ability. And this is, this list here is $65 million. Excuse me, $75 million. With the nine. $75 million. We have no authority, we have no, yeah. forget us. And uh, uh, I, that's, I think that's not, that's not the two <laughs> branches of government working together. I mean, do I want to sit here and say, no, we should not do um, computers uh, for the police department? No. I'm, it might be fair for me to ask the question, why is this suddenly a need when it was not envisioned when we adopted the budget? I recognize that there are needs that come up, but um, um, this is a, a lot of a lot of spending. Uh, actually, the total amount of spending from the contingency reserve 
this year has been, it's probably not fair if I include the government shutdown, but I think it's something like 113 million excluding the government shutdown. But You've repaid some of the money. But this is just extraordinary. And in my view, it um, is really kind of breaking the, breaking the pact between the executive and the legislative branches with regard to working together on the budget. Uh, Mr. The Chair, council cannot review. We have no authority to review. And in fact, dollars that would otherwise be available to this government, the mayor and the council, through a supplemental or through the end of the year, what we do with the surplus then, those are not available. You are essentially, by doing this contingency borrowing, you are essentially borrowing against future revenues. And well, not future, current. Current year. I mean, these are revenues. No, that because they have to be repaid. Uh, although under the law, they, you have two years to repay them. They get they, by law, they get repaid next year a fifty percent, and the following year fifty percent. Well, if you take that approach, we don't support that approach. But that is what this is. No, Mr. Chairman, what we're doing right now, I think you bring up a, a good point. Is we're certainly not trying to and go around the council expenses? on this. expenses. Well, we try to reprogram it on that. I mean, the challenge for us is, is You could this. not find the dollars for funeral expenses from there's a, somewhere else? There's a couple challenges we face right now. And I think maybe you could help us address them in this budget. I mean, the first one clearly is the autonomy issue, is that when we try to move supplemental budgets, not only do they have to move through our local process, they then have to go up to Congress for a layover period. And, uh, and that I can't really be sympathetic on that one. I asked you in January if you're going to do a supplemental, and you said no. I asked the mayor, he said no. I asked in February, the mayor said no. You said no. I asked in March, you said no. The mayor said no. It's only when the budget came down that there's a voila, a supplemental. I think we could have done a supplemental in January. I know you had a bad experience with the previous chairman over supplementals. I think I've been more cooperative with the executive branch. Um, so that's your own doing that the supplemental has been difficult for you. But the challenge is these expenses came up even after we submitted many of them, even after we submitted the supplemental to you April 3rd. I, th I think our problem is that you, you have to have budget authority to reprogram, and that's been the challenge. It's not any intent to try to get around the council or to not involve them in the process. It really is this problem of uh, not having budget autonomy from Congress, because we need to have budget authority available to reprogram. Now, anything we've taken from the contingency cash fund, we've been very careful that there's been certified revenue in 14 uh, to be able to backstop that. And there is current year revenue right now which we're using to replenish uh, the contingency cash fund in whole. Uh, so it's not that we don't have money to do these very important needs. It's that we don't have budget authority. Well, let's see. The, the security cameras, uh, which in my view could not possibly have been an unforeseen circumstance. So it's a one -time. And the MPD body cameras, I believe, and the MPD computers, they were all in the supplemental you sent down. It, but with the errata letter, you're pulling them out of the supplemental and, doing and you're now. spending the money from the contingency reserve. And we can put them back in the supplemental, but you're already spending the money out of the uh, contingency yep. reserves. And we can't say no to that. Well, we have half of that transaction before us, which is the supplemental budget. You gave us 100% of that transaction. You put in the supplemental, the computers and the security cameras. Again, I don't know why they were unforeseen. Um, but it's you, you put them in the supplemental, but now you've pulled them out and you're spending the dollars and we're powerless to do anything about it. Mr. And Chairman, you're spending the dollars against future revenues. Against current year revenue current year certified revenue that the CFO has already certified for fiscal year 14. That's, what, that's how we're able to guarantee that this is replenished. In, in the budget we've submitted to you, we fully replenish the contingency cash fund. There's no gap. There's no having to rely on any future revenues. It's done out of current year revenue that the CFO has already certified. And I want to point out one of the really important things. That's thing because here. you're moving less forward into next year well, from this that's year. That's exactly right. And we provide the cut, as painful as it was, the mayor cut the city fund to be able to for, you know, provide these important needs right now. And the statute clearly reads. So that reads, could be just in the supplemental, but you chose not to. You pulled it out. I, I don't quite get that. Well, we do adjust the supplemental in a number of instances for this by replenishing contingency fund with expenses that we've Wait, been able to do earlier. Hold on, because this can confuse anybody. As I recall, there's $15 million in the innovation fund, and roughly half of it yeah. is what you're going to use to repay the draw from the contingency fund. It's about reserve. six, I think, that goes you back. Were going to move the, 
you were going to move the innovation, you were going to move 15 million from this year into next year. Oh, the 104 originally was moving forward. But of the innovation fund. It's down to fund, 98 now. Of the innovation fund, of the innovation fund, yeah. you were going to move 15 million dollars from this year mm -hmm. to next year. Of revenue. And doing that through the supplemental. Correct. And instead what you're going to do is you're going to eliminate the innovation fund, which frees up that 15 million, and you're using 7 million of it to pay for these uh, cameras and some of these other draws. And the council has no say in any of that. Those well, expenditures just go ahead. Whereas what you could have done is you could have just left the cameras in the supplemental, not pushed forward those, uh, that innovation fund, and then we would have been a partner with you in approving that. Yeah, yeah. The bottom line is the council's cut out of this, and it is a process by which the executive, whether it's Mayor Gray or the next mayor, unilaterally makes policy decisions on how to spend dollars, unilaterally, and unilaterally draws from the contingency fund, because the way the law is written, the executive can unilaterally draw from the contingency reserve. And I don't have a problem with that if it's like a snow emergency, mm -hmm. but I do have a problem with that if there is, how much in the contingency fund? 200 million, 150 yeah. million? Yes. Yeah, that means that. you could, using this logic, draw $200 million, and next year we have to spend $100 million for that, and the following year $100 million, and that is not a good way to budget. But Mr. That Chairman. is not a good way. What it does is it means that next year we got to find $100 million to replenish that. And, you know, I've been around with mayors who can't do, you know, can, they can't come up with the dollars, and then that is a spending pressure. But, but, but a very important thing to point out. First of all, we are limited by statutes to what we can use this for. So we couldn't just go spend it on anything. You can no, only spend it on. one time and recurring. So let's just go over what one time or recurring. Or, 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 Funeral or, services, one FTE, social impact bond study, telecommunications upgrade, business regulatory reform task force, two FTEs, one a labor liaison and another a records clerk, youth court, small unions, um, Retroactive pay, telephone upgrades, sing, talk, and read, mm -hmm. procurement reform, um, archives modernization, sustainable DC project, taxi cab color scheme incentive program. Mm -hmm. um, do you want me to go on? I, I mean, it's a very long list. Yeah. Yes, you are limited. Um, as a practical matter, I don't know how you're limited. But the important yeah, thing is, that. I think that you addresses your biggest concern, which is the sustainability of this. We have paid all the money back this year. Every dime that was taken out of this fund balance has been restored. You have. Are you going to be here next year? Uh, that, is that's very, something even I can't contemplate. This is a very bad process. <laughs> well, it, it isn't, because because yeah. instead of a check and balance, there's no check and balance. But here's what's going to help oh, us. Actually, there is a check. The council next year, if you don't repay it this year, and I believe that you will, but if you yeah. don't repay it this year, next year the council gets a check. Well, you're going to be able have to, to repay write a it. check for $100 million. Well, we, we've given you the opportunity to fully repay it in the 14 supplemental. We've put all the money in there. We didn't leave anything out. I mean, Why just didn't to, you give us the opportunity to approve it through the supplemental? Well, and the problem is this congressional layover issue, though, like these computers. Let me give you an example of the computers. Is we put these computers in the supplemental. Because we Where want do these computers come from? You know, I used to have oversight over MPD. No. It was only a year ago. I don't remember they're talking about these computers. Well, let, let me talk to you about it. No, we had a bill concerning body cameras two years ago, and the executive came in and testified against it. But now body cameras are all the rage for well, $250,000. Well, we'll is with, that $750,000? We'll start with the computers. Right now, half of the computers at MPD are too old to even run the current version of Windows. Weren't they too old a year ago? A, a year ago? Um, I think this has been a continuous issue. Now, what they were planning to do, they told me what they're planning to do, is they were going to try to swap some computers out. Now, we've just renovated Baloo, as Mr. Barry knows. When they renovated Baloo, they were going to bring new computers into Baloo. And what they wanted to do was take the old computers from Baloo and bring them over to MPD. Now, what they've actually done, they, they found those computers are being repurposed within DCPS, so they can't actually access those computers. That's why we requested you it know, in the supplemental. Everything can be justified, but is it unforeseen? Where is the planning? And is this a good way for the government to move forward with regard to controlling its money? There is no check and balance here. This is unilateral, and it's spending against future revenues. Mr. Barron? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's been uh, eight minutes and 53 <laughs> seconds over, so I'll take half of that because I have to leave.
shortly. Uh, let, me, let me continue that, kind of, that discussion. Yes, sir. I, mean, I know how the contingency came about during the control mm -hmm. board era, uh, where I was mayor. Uh, at the same time, Chairman, I do think the council has the authority to limit how much can be taken out of the fund without council approval. I really think we do. And if we do, we ought to do it. This is not personal that Erica. Mr. Berry. Wait, wait a minute. Yeah. May I finish? I was going to answer your question. Oh, okay. Well, what's the question? Well, the, the question is it requires a Home Rule Act change to change that. Well, we, we certainly can try. Well, but, but you need to have this flexibility there. The problem well, is not. Wait a minute, Eric. Just, yeah. I'm not going to take all that time going back and forth okay. on this question. We have a fundamental disagreement on this. If it takes a home rule change, Mr. Chairman, I'm for proposing a home rule change that it pass the council first. That's one way you can do it. Then send it to the Hill to, to get it changed, get it on and others to work with us on it. So I, I've had enough discussion about this contingency. Contingency is supposed to be used for an emergency it was unforeseen mm -hmm. in terms of the broad definition of it. And, and I will stop at that. Okay. Um, Mr. Boulay, you had $104 million of 14 money that you carried over into 15. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Perry. Yeah. It's okay. down now to 98. Wait, wait, wait a second. I'm not asking my, Eric, you know me. You've been around me. I didn't ask you that. I asked you if we but two. Uh, but I want to Wait a second. No, I don't, I, I, I'm, okay. I'm not interested right. in that. It was spent in the supplemental $18 million. That, Is that correct? It's about right for expenditures, yes. Uh, about, about, yeah. about that number. Roughly. What I want from you, not at this table because mm -hmm. it will be fair, a breakdown of what this $104 million Bought us. That's the, yeah. that's the first thing. Well, I can tell you right now, actually. No, I don't want to know right now because my time is running. So in order to tell me, you got to go line by line. No, I wouldn't, actually. It, it actually really is a simple answer. It's, it's not dedicated to any specific item. It just used to... I'm not going to buy that. But, but that's the truth. We don't tag I dollars. The truth. I'm not going to buy that. So let's just get that together. I tell you why I'm not going to buy it. Because I want to go into this... Hundred and four million that you're spending in fifteen, and move some of it back to fourteen. That's what I, I want to do. So I, if you want, if you agree, well, I can, I can just take I can just take a lump sum and and bring it back. I can answer the question for you. Well, okay. Secondly, Mr. 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 Goulet, you know that the Congress approves our budget by the gross titles. Mm -hmm. I think with the seven titles yep. or something like that. The same thing is true with anti-deficiency. Within that title, we can move authority around. It seems to me you can. And so there's no reason why you have to not be able to move that authority around within a certain appropriate. And I think you're going to help us be able to do that with the yeah, budget I'm, you've got. So that'll be yeah, good. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to do that. Great. Uh, I'm, I'm going to look very carefully at the, hundred, at, the, at the amount of money that's been obligated out of the 187 and see how much of that has been actually begun to be mm -hmm. spent. I want to go into that fund. I just take it in advance. I want to get ten million dollars for homeless youth. I want to get X number of dollars for HPAP mm -hmm. this 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 year. Because HPAP is never is, is non relapsing money, so we can put it in. We need home ownership. Mm -hmm. Wait a second. Well, in Ward eight. This is not aimed at you. This is a Aim at the policy of the mayor. Oh, but, but all of that money has been encumbered. You're not going to be able to we'll see. take any. I will see if it's been encumbered. Well, all, all of it had through the consolidated RFP. Well, first of all, it can't be encumbered because 
all those contracts have not come over to the council I over a million dollars. That I do know. I'm the contract stopper on the council, <laughs> as you very well know. And the, and the chairman uh, gave me the but, uh, much, much worse to do it by requiring three disapprovals. But I am the stopper because we've got more jobs by me holding up a contract than anybody on that council, and we've got more uh, minority contractors than anybody on that council. And I, I'll give you an example. I held up the uh, White and Turner contract for Turner. And I worked out a deal with uh, uh, Mr. Hamlin that he's going to get at least 50 percent African-American Latino subcontractors. We got 60. We got 55 percent. So I'm the holder upper, and I get results from that. Now back to the One City Fund. Again, uh, this is just a philosophical difference. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in the eleven billion dollar budget. We can't identify fifteen million dollars. This money goes to small nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. yeah. that would die on the vine that they had this money. It, when we had earmarks, and each council member could recommend it to our colleagues. I mean, so much was put down yeah. for a little bit of money, so I'm going to be working on, on that. Also, let me just say, based on all the testimony we've had by the chairman having his hearing, education committee having a hearing on truancy, in the seven years that we have put some emphasis on truancy, it has decreased no, no, it has increased, in some instances, no more than 2%. Because it's, it's structured wrong. It's in the deputy mayor's office, who has no authority over DHS, over CSFA, over DYRES. I think it ought to be in the city administrator's office, which you can order these departments to work together. I mean, they they work together even outside no, the don't. official. Why do we don't have better results? Then tell me why. In seven years, we not had a, re, a, a reduction in truancy according to the chancellor's statements and her testimony of no more than two percent. And in some instances, we have a greater truancy rate at some schools than we had when we started. Well, tell me how you explain that. Well, I think there's probably a lot of explanations as to why truancy is st still a problem. I mean, 2 percent is a reduction. Obviously, we'd like to do better, but it sounds like... Stop, Eric. I don't yeah. want to go through that. Cut that no way you can ask that. Can yeah. you stop the clock for a second? Yeah. I know a little bit about this. When you say 2 percent, I think uh, it went from something like 20 percent down to 18 percent. But we've changed the definition of truancy. Under Mayor Fenty, the uh, definition of chronic truancy was increased to 28 unexcused absences, 28. We changed that. It's now 10 unexcused absences. So you're going to have a whole lot more kids now who are considered truant than you had before. You have a higher number, and yet we've been able to reduce the, uh, the percentage of truancy. Let's start the clock. Well, thank you, Chairman. That means we're doing we well. We're not doing anything. Chairman, that means nothing. And the, the final analysis. I appreciate the change in definition. In the final analysis, we have spent thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, on trying to correct this problem, like most cities around the country yeah. have not made a dent in that problem. But that's a, that's actually pretty well, significant. If we had a 2% improvement of the stricter standards, that's impressive. That that's not, I, that's I, I, impressive. Was trained, I was trained as a scientist, and 2% is statistically even. Oh, 2%. Yeah, but you made it tougher to achieve it. Yeah. That's a significant difference, 28 to 10. I didn't make it tougher. Well, well my point is, is wait, wait a minute. My point is, suppose it had dropped 5%. What happens in this government, there are no quantifiable goals. The Chancellor admits that. I said, Chancellor, why can't the, the task force set in, in 2014, our goal is to reduce truancy by 8% mm -hmm. uh, in 2015 by another 8%. So if he can see some light, it's a tough problem. It's, it's not one person's fault. 
on that, but it's a serious problem around the nation. So I'm not saying it's not easy, but I don't want you to give the impression, as you're doing to the people watching this, that we have been more successful than we have been. Let's stop, let's stop at that one. So that's a big area that I've talked to David Catania about, to the our committee. See, we can't ourselves impose some, some uh, goals and timetables on, on that situation. The other situation is that Mr. Graham and I are going to work as hard as we can to get the $6 million, so just get ready for that. We're going to find it. We're going to get that $6 million because philosophy is wrong. I told Mr. Gray, during the campaign, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt him, and it did. I said, Mr. Gray, and I've known Vince forever for 30 some years, I said, as long as you advocate cutting TANF, those TANF workers have no incentive, the recipients. They don't vote that much anyway. And they certainly don't have any incentive. What happened in the, in the election in 2010, 12,008 people voted. 18,000 and what seven voted. That's 30,000 votes in 2010. With Vince Gray getting 90% of all those votes. On April 1st, we had a drop off of 7,000 people in what eight and a drop off of almost 11,000 people in what seven. And I'm a good analyst about this election. What happened, a number of people were not happy with these policy decisions to cut TANF and cut some other programs. And they didn't know Neil Bowser, so they stayed home. They stayed home. So that's what happened, Mr. Chairman, as we go forward. The other found area that I've talked to Mr. Dewitt about, we have a voluntary reporting of uh, income earned in the district as compared to other places in Virginia, Maryland, mm -hmm. or wherever you are. I have Shante, who's my legislative counsel, Mr. Durant, looking now to see if we have, we can't make it mandatory that each entity that has income from other places or outside the district be required be required under penalty of law to report every nickel earned in the district. And you're going to find out we're going to have more money coming in because self-reporting in the tax area has never been has never been that effective. So that's another area we're going to deal with. The other area I want to look at, I said earlier, and I, I, I wish I, I think I can get some help from you on this, is the HPAP. We really philosophically, Mayor Gray is off base on not putting more money in the home ownership. And I, I told him this from doing the campaign. I said, uh, Vince, people who want to become homeowners not going to support you because you've not put enough money in the HPAP. Moderate to upper income people. But that's not the only way to create home ownership, Mr. Gray. Give him another way. Well, a lot through developments that DIMPED's putting in, incentives for mixed-use developments uh, through the private market. That has not produced very much. It the, produced a tremendous amount of new zone, The zone, the zone, zone, whatever you call that. that, that they, I'm uh, not even talking about inclusionary zoning. Inclusionary I'm talking, zoning. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about all of these developments. I'm talking about all of these incentives for, for private housing that's being produced in the district. For Give the me workforce. examples. For workforce housing. We'll get you the exact amount. No, I'll get it before you announce it, you know. Well, I give me some exactly examples, around. Mr. Goulet. You know, you, you know, tell me now, off the top of your head, you've been at this for three years. Okay. What are some of those things that will ensure home ownership? Well, here's what I'll say is I know we were trying to get 10,000 units by 2020, new affordable housing that, units. That's rental. Produced. No, not just rental, it's both. It's both, both, both market rate housing. Uh, you know, that's available for the workforce well, and for people. The home ownership. How are we going to get home ownership? You say you have some ways to get it. Tell this public, tell this council, tell the chairman, how are we going to get home ownership outside of HPAP? 
outside of HPEP. What you do is you work with private developers. You provide incentives to create mixed use. What housing. kind of incentive, Mr. Goulet? Uh, either tax incentives, grants, economic incentives. What kind of tax incentives? Incentive? I, I, DIMPAD does a variety of these things. They've created, I, I, you know, we'll try to get before the end of this hearing the exact number of units. You are DIMPAD absolutely has created. You know I know housing, like the back of my hand, because I was chair of the committee for a while. I was mayor for 16 years, and I know housing. I know housing very well. And I know what is tax incentives is not enough. You know, I've tried to eliminate property taxes for five years. That doesn't work because they enough, it's not enough money to make people do this. They don't want to do it anyway. So we're talking about home ownership. I'll let this go, but I'm going to tell you just for the record, Mr. Goulet, you can't tell me and the public any other ways to get home ownership that has worked anywhere. Yeah. The, the, the private market is generating it right now in your ward, in other wards, through incentives that we've produced. I wish I knew the exact number of units off the top of my head. I hope I'll be able to put it on the public record before the end of this hearing. But we're, we're, we're well on our way to our 10,000 units by 2020. Some of those rental, a lot of them owned. How many of those are home ownership? We're going to find out. Targets. If, no. if we don't have it by the end of this hearing, I'll get it to you. How many are targeted? A, a, sig a significant number. I mean, you look at no, the that's what I'm saying. Eric, stop I, I don't know off the top of my head. You know, I'm, 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 I'm your friend on this. I'm not the enemy. But tell me that out of the 10,000 new units, I've talked to the mayor about this. He's the overwhelming majority of those are rental. And I don't want another rental property in Ward 8. Not one more, except for seniors. 75% of all the families or renters in Ward 8 compared to Ward 3 or Ward 4 in terms of income and class, it's over 65, 70 percent. Around the nation, black home ownership is way down compared to white ownership. So that's there are other people who've been trying to do this before, and it doesn't work. The way it worked here, which I was so proud of, you know, I enhanced, when I was mayor, the uh, HPAP. HPAP is an easy way to do it because it had income limits on it, which you could do. It means you're not giving money to rich people as mm -hmm. opposed to those who really need it. And so I'm going to be looking as hard as I can within this money and how much has been incumbent. I'm going to take as much as I can that I can get support on. I've talked to Ms. Bowser about home ownership. Uh, she's high on that list of high on ownership because she's going to be the next mayor, notwithstanding the race that's going on in November. So I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, your diligence in this area. And you're, you're, you're really pushing in this area. See, the problem that bothers me, I'm going to stop. If the council passes the budget, all of us expect the money to be spent on what it was intended to be spent That's for. Cool. And we have a reprogramming process which allows flexibility in both the capital program, program mm -hmm. and in terms of operating money to make some adjustments because yep. things are, are fluid. And I like that. Right. But I don't like the fact as the chairman would like, going to the contingency without any oversight, without anything, and get $75 million out of it. Because it hurts us going forward. Because we want to pay back that $75 million the next year, half of it anyway, you got to take it from some program or take it from increased revenue, which means it limits our ability to be flexible to fund new programs and two new programs. And so I want to thank you. I wish I could stay longer, but I'm, I have two things to do. One, I got to go to the Wizards game at 8 o'clock. <laughs> we'll be out of there by then, hopefully. And I got to, <laughs> to have dinner. So uh, I'm going to leave now. <laughs> go, go to dinner. Well, I hope you enjoy the game, and I hope they win tonight. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to go home and uh, put on my running suit so I can 
stress out. It will keep working <laughs> with you on home ownership because I think it's a priority both you and the mayor share, particularly in Ward you 7 rest, and 8. You put your money where your mouth is. And we did. Thank we, you. No, you didn't. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Barry, for staying within your 10 minutes. Um, can you, um, would you submit to us, get back to us with, um, on the past program in DHS, how, what the total budget is for it in FY15, because I think you said it was a million, and I believe that last year, meaning the current fiscal year, the, there was 900,000 transferred from the Deputy Mayor for Human Services, B.B. Otero's budget, additional to what they had, which makes me think that if there's only a million in FY15, that's actually a net reduction. So I'd like to, if you could give me the numbers maybe for FY13, FY14, and FY15. Let, let me just read it here, because I may just be reading it wrong here, because uh, they gave me these notes. So it says the past program, we have $1 million. It says this year of the one million, seven hundred sixty-eight thousand one hundred twelve dollars was allocated for pass, and two million three hundred one thousand eight 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 went to the Justice Grants Administration for evaluation and additional support for truancy work at elementary and middle school levels. Next year, the full million will stay in pass. So it sounds like there was a million last year, and there's a million this year, but we can check to make sure that's right. Well, when it says uh, next year the full million will stay, right? Because it sounds like we took. That would suggest like the net increase would remain, but that's not clear. It just looks like we used two thirty one eight hundred eighty eight dollars for the Justice Grants Administration this year for uh, that has nothing to some do with sort of pass. support. Well, it sounds like it was transferred over there to help with the uh, like the evaluation process. It looks like to me. Okay, well, if so we'll find out. Uh, I mean, it's uh, actual, not actual, uh, budget, FY13 budget, FY14 budget, FY15 for pass. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll pull it for you. That. Um, and uh, I think I want to just make a final point on this, um, these draws from the contingency. Even though at the moment I'm sounding calm, I, I think this is a very, very serious issue. And as far as I'm concerned, it does um, uh, fracture, if not break, the partnership that ought to exist between the executive branch and the legislative branch with regard to the budget. Not just the budget that's before us, but the totality of the budget throughout the fiscal year. The executive still retains the authority for reprogramming, but since for new initiatives you're not using reprogramming, you're using the contingency reserve, Basically, the council's cut out of new initiatives or new initiatives that you're afraid the council might disapprove. You mentioned the time-consuming time nature of the uh, supplemental, but that doesn't seem to have been an issue before. In any event, reprogramming is just left to deal with cutting initiatives that the council may have put in. So let's say I put a – I'll just – let me try to think. Let's say I put $5 million in for the film incentive fund. You'll reprogram that away, but let's say that you want to do, um, this is going to sound silly, the cartoon incentive fund. You'll just draw from the contingency reserve and do that without the council. It's a very bad, bad, bad process. Well, Mr. And, and I just want to highlight again that the, these draws from the contingency reserve, which are, uh, even though you have balanced it for this year mm -hmm. so far, sometimes these draws are not immediately balanced, and by law, these draws can be repaid over the following two right. fiscal years. So I'm correct when I say borrowing against the future for super cans, taxi cab color scheme incentives, sing, talk, and read program, funeral services, body cameras, attorney bonuses. Um, I am, even though my voice is calm at the moment, I am not pleased with this at all. And if we could legislate a change to the, um, uh, the law regarding this, I would do it in a, in a heartbeat. Well, and we will look for ways that we can try to constrain because I did have the conversation with you and the mayor mm -hmm. back in January saying that I would go along with the super can draw from contingency with the understanding that there would not be more and there have been maybe twenty, thirty million dollars in draws since then. Mr. Chairman, if I can respond briefly, we understand why you take this issue very seriously and we certainly don't want to make light of it at all. I think if you're right on the budget autonomy issue, which I think everybody is, you know, rooting for you, we're not sure about the legal issues that's being resolved in the court, 
But, uh, you know, if this budget autonomy issue is resolved and the district does have budget autonomy, this issue goes away in, in essence because the time period for having to move a supplemental budget could even be done on an emergency basis. It could be proposed by the mayor on an emergency basis if necessary to cover these expenses. That congressional layover period would be eliminated. We would have the control of our local money. So if you're right, if we do have budget autonomy, no amendments are needed to contingency fund because it will essentially become irrelevant at that point. If you've got current year money, as we do right now, to pay for these expenses, there wouldn't be any need to access contingency cash fund because you could simply send supplemental budgets you know, to the council that would be approved. Uh, without that layover, without this issue. So uh, I really don't, you know, you know, want to give the impression that the mayor or this administration is trying to take advantage of this to get around council approval. It really is the problem of the congressional approval that's delaying this. You know, another reason why I think this has been accessed more, you know, recently than in the past, it just really deals with the, there's, there's less fat in the budget right now. There used to be, you know, when we came on board before we right-sized the budget, a lot more areas you could reprogram fund from. We're running a much tighter ship right now. I'd even credit you for, uh, you know, during the previous fiscal year with you know, reducing salary laps in a number of agencies that typically is an area uh, that we do reprogrammings from. So when these unforeseen or non-recurring needs come up throughout the year, uh, you know, there's not budget authority to reprogram into these funds. So we've had to utilize contingency cash to cover these uh, needed expenses, uh, avoiding, you know, a lengthy uh, congressional layover process, you know, which hopefully uh, going forward won't be an issue anymore. We will see, because uh, certainly the mayor and you obviously both share a commitment to having budget autonomy for our residents, and uh, you know, we hope that we don't have to send any of our own money up to the Hill to get approval for it. So thank you. We'll work with you on this, and uh, hopefully, as we say, it won't be an issue going forward. Uh, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to turn to the errata letter, which we just received. That's um, the first time I've ever heard anybody say they're entranced with the errata letter. Is that what you just said? It's not usually that exciting. <laughs> actually, I did not say that. I said well, I'm going to turn to the errata. Oh, letter. you're turned to. I thought you said you were entranced by it. I was uh, I was going to say it's not that exciting. It's just technical changes to the budget, really. Um. The uh, identification of non-personal services savings in fiscal year 2016. This is the issue of the um, reduction uh, in um, the multi-year plan that I have questioned. And uh, what you have appeared to have done is to identify about 16 million in uh, savings in um, I should say reduction in spending. You've identified about 16 million, and then the remaining 25 or 26 million will just be um, projected savings in procurement. Yeah, I mean, this is similar to how we did this last year. We projected it on an agency level last year with these uh, percentage cuts for performance improvements. Uh, so we tried to give you a little bit of that now because we, you know, we understood you were concerned at the last hearing about having, a, you know, a high level Has out the there. The CFO that certified these. In fact. When did the um, when did the CFO get this errata letter? Oh, we just gave it to him yesterday, so I doubt they've certified it yet. And you know, it's so really, even though it says certification issues, these well, are these address issues. certification issues, potential certification issues. The first one being but they don't certify anything since the CFO apparently got it at the same time we got it. Well, uh, I, I don't think they would have certified these yet. And it's really it's up to you whether you put them in or not. This is just us kind of giving you a roadmap of how we're going to achieve those out year savings. So really, it, it doesn't matter to us whether you use the 8% number or whether you allocate uh, it to specific agencies. We just wanted to, uh, you know, out of respect for the process the council has, show you kind of what our thought process is and where we're going to start getting some of these cuts. Well, the um, procurement reform seems to be the biggest piece of this. Yes, yes. And uh, originally, the procurement reform was the all, all 8%, I think, and now it's just going to be... Uh, no, no, no. It was never all 8%. It was now never all 8 percent. Now it's going to be 6 percent of the 8 percent. Uh, and it says here, um, projected savings uh, for agencies that are receiving additional procurement staffing via procurement reform. Yes. 
Uh, Office of Contracting and Procurement is getting another 40 FTEs. Correct. Uh, which is roughly a 40% increase in their FTEs. 6.9 million roughly for the They're going to place those in the different agencies mm -hmm. so that they'll be working more closely with the agencies. I'm not quite sure how that results yeah. in savings. Maybe you could explain that. I, to I'd me. be glad I to. I think it will result in better procurement. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll spend less money on uh, fighting over some of these contracts that uh, where there's a question whether they were done properly. Um, but other than that, I don't see where you get a savings just because you have a procurement officer. Well, the point of this, of putting these people in the agencies, was to save money. I mean, we're not doing this just to make procurement reform faster. We want to make our procurements uh, get some cost savings. And by putting people in the agencies, rather than having general expertise, they're going to develop specific expertise in these procurements, know how to put it out there in a way that saves the agency money, uh, that better targets it towards the needed services. And well, we think I, actually 2% is a low ball. I don't agree with your premise. Uh, as you know, Community of the Whole has oversight on procurements, mm -hmm. yes. so we've been involved with this. Um, I don't think the reason for procurement reform is savings, not that savings is a bad idea. Yeah. It's because the procurements have been troubled. The procurements, we get the, the contracts retroactively. Um, there, are, there have been, over the years, a lot of appeals taken to the Contract Appeals Board. I'm trying to think the parking meter uh, procurement. Um, let's see, I think that went up to the Contract Appeals Board twice, uh, disapproved. Uh, these are delays. Yeah, that's a cost with the, the Contract Appeals Board. But... Uh, if they're savings, they've never been quantified. This is about having a better process. It's really both, because I think let's use the one you identified there, the parking meter contract. You know, if, if you're operating under an old contract and trying to bid out a more efficient contract that runs into legal challenges, that hits all these roadblocks, has to go through this lengthy appeals process because somebody didn't, you know, tie it down tight so there's not every... Uh, you know, every av avenue to block an appeal, you end up operating under a temporary contract, which is always more expensive, or you end up operating under the old contract while this new contract awaits appeal. So even if you can avoid one or two of these appeals uh, within the government, you're going to make your money back on the $6.9 million easily because you're not operating under old, less efficient contracts. You've got a new, more efficient contract by somebody that's, that's executed this document that actually has experience in that area of procurement. Well, you know, I'm thinking here, the parking contract, how much was that, $100 million? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. That sounds about right. Okay, and maybe uh, if it, uh, the new contract had been let more quickly, we would have saved $10 million? Exactly. Okay, that's 1%. Well, for that's that not, agency, but you multiply that across the district government. That's one of the bigger ones. And one of the bigger ones, but yes, that gets us there. That's only 1%, and you've got to get to... Um, you've got to get to... I get, I'm not quite sure how to read this, whether it's 6% or 2%. But but you've got I, to get, do more than that. I'm explaining to how we get there. So I think there was a misnomer that procurement reform was how we were, you know, getting these efficiency savings alone. I mean, we've never relied solely on one initiative to okay. hit our performance targets each You're year. You're relying on it 75%. Uh, oh, no, just in this instance. You're relying this on initial it instance. I'm looking at page uh, three of your letter. The executive has already identified $41 million, and this isn't even enough. I, the gap is a couple hundred million, isn't it? Um, $41 million in projected programmatic efficiencies, and of those, you identify $16 million, which is um, you specific, and then the remaining $26 million is procurement. 75% of your $42 million is procurement. Well, that's after just five weeks of work. We were able to give you a quarter of those You're savings already. You're still relying heavily. The bulk of, bulk of the savings are procurement. The bulk of the initial savings. Now, the other thing with procurement also that we haven't put, we put the 2% per agency. What we're going to see is well, once you we get these... Can we just take the 2% off of uh, next year's contracts? Well, that's what we're doing. No, that's next year, FY15. No, for 16, because procurement reform is going to have to take some time to get up and running. I don't understand. People are being hired this summer. It was right. one of the contingency draws. You're not going to be able to. <laughs> Mr. Goulet, it's one of the contingency yeah. draws to hire the 41 people. <laughs> Mr. Staten said they'd be on board in June. Am I correct? And, and Mr. Chairman. No, they're going to be on board in June. That's what I was told. In any event, they will not only have been hired but trained and have at least a couple months' experience in the agencies 
before the start of FY 2015. So why would we see these enormous savings not next year when they've already been around for a while, but the following year? Well, if we're going to see them the following year, something doesn't work here. Well, either, a couple of either, things. I almost said a bad word. Either this is BS in 2016, or else we can use the money in 15. No, let, let me explain this. Your contracts, first of all, do not neatly comport with the fiscal year, first of all. What? They don't, your contracts don't all start October 1st. So we're going to have contracts for fiscal year 15, which before these staff are even hired are still in effect. You have multi-year contracts in some cases. You've got contracts that are holding over. Uh, it takes people a couple years to get up to speed and to start understanding all the nuances and how they can save money through these procurements. We have these dedicated staff in there. I mean, can we get some savings in 15? Perhaps. Uh, that would certainly be the goal. But the fiscal year uh, starts in just a few months. But you're so. trying to quantify. You ought to quantify. Should you not? We have a financial plan. Do you take the financial no. plan seriously? I do. But okay. I so and it has got real numbers in it, correct? And if I remember, because I don't have it right in front of me, the issue with regard to FY16 is that the financial plan shows a reduction in spending of a couple hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay, a reduction in spending in the context of rising revenue growth. And we have said to you repeatedly, how can you justify that? And you say, oh, sure. And the best you can do is to say $16 million, this is out of a couple hundred million, $16 million from a few very specific uh, programs where you hope there'll be savings, and then uh, the rest of it is from procurement reform. Or maybe that's a little no, unfair. No. Seventy-five percent is from procurement reform. You, you. Seventy-five. This is what OCP told us. OCP is not in a position to quantify contract cost savings through procurement reform. Agreed. I agree. Not in a position, but you're quantifying it. But what we're doing is we're projecting. It. There's a big difference between when you're proposing a fiscal year, which starts October first, just in, you know, about five short months versus projecting out years of a financial plan, which there's a number of assumptions for. You always have to be more specific, and you've grilled us on this very, you know, stringently over the years, of making sure we can quantify with specificity those current year savings. Now, when you're looking at just projections in the financial plan, you have to look at a number of trends. One, you have to look at where the populations of the programs are going. We've done that. You have to look at initiatives that you think are going to take a year or two to realize the full savings. But the CFO, and I completely agree with this, is very careful to be very stringent in how they certify uh, performance savings for the upcoming fiscal year. Now, that level of specificity obviously is much more difficult when you're looking years out. I mean, that's 19 months away. In five weeks, we've been able to give you a, a quarter of the savings. How we would achieve a quarter of the savings? I know we're going to get well more than that. And you just look at the last fiscal year. This was raised last year as being a big problem. We solved it by December. It was solved by December. And then in February, we got $139 million more. So not only do I not think it will be a problem, I think we probably can close this gap to zero by December. I don't think we saw last year when we were doing the budget for this year that we, I don't think we saw this, this kind of a drop oh, we in can't. spending. There may not have been as much of an increase, but there wasn't a drop. I mean, you're showing a substantial drop in several of the uh, clusters. We, we carry Substantial drop. And they may have been allocated slightly differently. And that says to me that the financial plan is not a very serious document. Oh, it's very serious to us. We carried $96 million over last year. We carried 98 over this year. So it's roughly comparable. No, not what you're carrying over. I'm talking about the financial plan. Oh, exactly. The financial plan shows that there will be an 8% reduction in spending in FY16. Of NPS. Huh? NPS for non-Medicaid, uh, non-schools. We've asked for the itemization, and right. the best we have is the errata letter. And the errata letter says $42 million. Well, and you, of the $42 million, you punt on uh, I uh, gave 75% you, of it. I gave you a copy of our letter we sent to the CFO, which I think had that entire list of all the initiatives that we're looking at that we're going to use. And procurement reform just being one of them. looking at means that uh, you we're working on right you now. quantified it. Well, I mean, this is this is 19 months out. You this know, is before the financial this is even... plan that we're supposed to adopt. Exactly, and I think you use projections, projections on revenue, projections on spending, and, and what you don't want to do. Here's what you got to be very careful of. You don't want to be so conservative on your spending assumptions that you forgo the opportunity 
to put important programs in place this year. We're trying so then, to strike a balance. So then is that the rub, that we think the CFO is too conservative and therefore we're going to figure out a way around the CFO? I mean, maybe the, the real answer is, or the, the, the correct approach is to work with the CFO uh, so that his assumptions are not uh, so um, unacceptably conservative. We don't have a right to disregard the financial projections. We don't. That's how we got in trouble. And, and I don't want to sound here like I think you're being completely careless here, but, but there, th this is wrong. This financial plan is wrong. You can't just simply say, well, the way we're going to balance the out years in the financial plan is we'll just cut spending by 8%. And then after we ask you for, what has it been now? It's been uh, 50 days. Well, not quite. It's been over. It's been close to two months, Five and we weeks. still don't have a quantification of that 8% that is, well, a lot of it's missing and the rest of it's not credible. We yes. ought to have that quantification or else it's not a serious exercise. So what I'm hearing from you is, well, you know, we shouldn't be basing our budget on overly conservative projections or assumptions. O okay, but that's really not for us, either for you, the, the executive, or for us, the legislature, to just disregard the, the chief financial officer. Okay. If we think his projections are too conservative, then we should challenge him and make him change them. But we shouldn't change them by saying, oh, well, we'll, we'll just cut spending by 8% because we think we'll be able to make it up with revenues, with revenues that aren't shown because the projections are too conservative. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying, I mean, you may be saying, but I'm not saying that the CFO's revenue projections are overly conservative. What I'm saying is that we shouldn't hold the executive branch to being overly conservative in how we spend money. You don't want to have a situation where you're not holding our feet to the fire to get better. And that's what this is about, is every year, usually it was in the current year. This is the Georgetown incinerator. All over again. You know what I'm talking about? I, I actually, I was probably before 2002, which is when I came here. For, in the 1990s, before the control board, we would, uh, part of the way we would balance the budget was to uh, sell the Georgetown incinerator. But, Mr. Chairman. It didn't get sold for the 10 years, but uh, that's how we balanced the budget. Each of the last three years, we put aggressive performance savings in the current year, which, which you questioned. You, you, we were grilled on. We always hit the numbers. This year, you know, we have very few performance savings because we've achieved uh, a lot in the current year. We've got more in the out year, which is about equal to what we had last year, roughly equal to, to last year. And we have never missed our mark on savings, not once. And no, we solved this problem what, by December. I'm looking at what OCP sent, uh, sent me. Uh, let's see. At this time, OCP is not in a position to quantify contract cost savings through procurement reform. I agree. At this time, the primary focus of the reform initiative, I'm looking for savings in this paragraph. At this time, the primary focus of the reform initiative is to enable more responsive purchasing, develop specialized mission agency knowledge, mm -hmm. and to, that's T-O, and to, as a byproduct of the foregoing, improve the quality of our vendor pool. Yep. As such, we will need time to implement the DPA, that's uh, what the DES, Delegated Procurement Authority mm -hmm. model and attain operating stability in the first year. Exactly. That's exactly I, what sorry, I've been what, saying. I didn't hear the word savings in there. No, that's exactly what I've been saying is that they're not ready. They just said in the first year to project savings from this. Oh, but they, you can. They, no, I'm not projecting it the first year. I'm projecting in fiscal year 16. Dollars right here. In 16. That's, a, that's, that's 19 months away. No, we're projecting it in 16, not in 15. And what we're saying is that they need a year to get up to speed, hire staff, gain expertise. And what you can do is you can hold their feet to the fire to get this savings by putting those allocations of one-time funds in the MPS, in the budget. It'll reduce the concern you've got about performance savings not being uh, quantified. You can account for those funds. Uh, and then you can hold the agency's feet to the fire to actually hit the savings in fiscal year 16, and I think they will. I actually think they're going to get well above the 2% level of savings we projected in 16. I think that's conservative. I think we can help you know, hit a larger percentage of that uh, MPS cut through procurement savings, but we didn't want to overshoot uh, you know, on this initial run until we get some more data. You know, I think we will have an excellent mayor next year. And, um, but I also know that every time there's a transition 
Uh, there's a different set, set of priorities, different initiatives, and a lot of things start over, uh, and some things are discontinued. And that's also a concern of mine here, because um, if uh, Mayor Gray was continuing in office, I'm absolutely certain that the priorities he's been pushing and the initiatives he's been pushing would continue. That just does not happen when there's a, a new mayor. Well, we appreciate your confidence also, in us. And that's appreciate also that. a concern with regard to relying on these unquantified savings to balance the um, financial plan, the financial plan which is supposed to be a serious document. Uh, let me ask you about um, the, um, what do we call this? Are we calling this the social contract? Uh, Social bond? Yes, the, the pay for success contract. Yes. They're called social impact bonds, but they're not um, really bonds. As is, well. I've not looked at the legislative language. Uh, my staff has just begun to. Mm -hmm. Is the intent uh, of this subtitle that this would be, this process would be exempt entirely from the Procurement Practices Reform Act? No, that's not my understanding. We would still send you a contract once we select a. Uh, a, a uh, intermediary on this, so we would still have the that, that contract would still come to the council. But what this does is we need to have a fund, a non-lapsing fund in place, to put to kind of park these savings as they're generated, because the whole point of this is really that we're not setting aside money for this. Otherwise, we just do it ourselves. But people are giving us private money mm -hmm. that we pay back out of savings. So we need this non-lapsing fund, which we're requesting, to park that savings, make it non-lapsing, and give it back to the private entity after the contract period is over. Now, we, we fully intend to submit a, a well, subcontract once the intermediary is again, selected. I, I'm just, I haven't looked at this yeah. language, but uh, staff is pointing out to me section 7123 begins with notwithstanding any other law, the mayor may enter into pay for success contracts. Right. Well, notwithstanding any other law would, would exempt this entirely from all of the laws, well, including the uh, Procurement Practices Reform Act and uh, the aspects they're under. But you're saying that's not the intent. You know, I think well, here's what we should do. And we'll be glad to sit down with the attorneys because we're not wedded to whether we exempt this or not. We just okay. want a, a process that works on this. And uh, it was, okay. as I said, it was an initiative started by the council. Okay, so then you have to get back to us on this. And it also part of my question here is, is it the intent to exempt it from CBE requirements? Well, let's check on both, because this okay. would involve an intermediary, and that may be the reason that they're okay. writing it up the way it so is. Somebody's taking notes on what yeah. you're going to... And what we'll do is we'll have our attorneys at OAG who help draft this work with your general counsel's office and whichever other attorneys you want, because uh, certainly this is something we just want to work effectively, and we don't really have okay. any... Question um, exempt from PPRA, question mark, exempt from CPE yes. requirements, question mark. Why is a separate fund needed? Uh, here's the reason why, is because... The, the private entity loans us money. So this is basically additional private funding. The way they're paid back is in our agencies, we would uh, designate certain areas of savings. Uh, let me just give an example. This may not be the one that we select, but let's say that there's a number of factors that go into teen pregnancy, a number of uh, expenditures we're making out of the budget. Well, what they would do is they would uh, look at those areas, what we're spending right now, look at what you know, we're projected to spend into the future, and then look at, with these measurable interventions, the amount of money we would save. As those savings targets are hit, if the measurable events are achieved, funds would be transferred into this non-lapsing fund. So if we hit those savings, those funds would then be repaid to the person who loans us the money uh, for this at the end of the contract period. But you've got to have that non-lapsing fund to make sure the savings pass into that fund as they're realized. Also, I think it was your testimony earlier that this, um, uh, whatever the name of it is, is um, separate from the general fund. Well, you know what, I think we should work on some standard language for this because to, when they use the word separate from the general fund, what we really probably should be saying is separate from the unrestricted general fund because the, the, the general fund includes special purpose revenue funds and dedicated taxes. <coughs> So this would probably fall into, you know, uh, it would actually be a local non-lapsing fund. So as a technical amendment, we could simply say separate from the unrestricted general fund, because as you know, O-type funds and dedicated taxes both fall within the general fund balance, 
Uh, this would be no different. It would be a local non-lapsing fund because these aren't specific fees or taxes. So, I mean, that's just using standard language. We may want to change that standard language to separate and apart from the unrestricted general fund rather than from the general fund. Because it is part of the general fund, it's just not unrestricted. This will not affect the debt cap, and the intent no, is it will not affect the debt cap. It's not a borrowing at all, so it should not impact the debt cap in any way. It's actually just a private loan uh, that we pay back only if we get savings to pay it back. So the risk shifts entirely to the private uh, provider who's giving us the money, the private payee who's paying the money. And the reason why they're willing to take the risk is because the program is structured in such a way that they are confident that there will be enough savings that they get paid back. Well, I think, I think it's both. I mean, people aren't getting into this to guarantee a lucrative return on investment. A lot of these are, you know, they said younger investors, people who have a real uh, connection to uh, social improvement, and they want to invest their money in a way, uh, at least a portion of that wealth, in a way that improves outcomes for people. We actually had some of our, maybe some of the panelists who testified earlier at the BSA hearing, or you know, people they said of wealth who are young, uh, who want to better uh, social outcomes here in the city. Those would be the type of people who might want to invest a portion of their wealth in a social impact bond because it actually improves outcomes, although it's not you know, as lucrative as probably putting the, you know, it in other investments. No one's going to get rich off a social impact bond, but they do uh, better uh, the cause of whatever they're investing in. Do we have any other questions? Uh, I was given some information on um, PASS. According to the budget book, it's $1 million total in FY15. That sounds like it's a reduction from FY14. But again, you'll get back to... Yeah, I mean, that matches what we have, but we'll get you the full details on it. So okay. we make sure uh, we know what the numbers are. I think I asked for 13, 14, 15 in terms of yep. budgeting. We've been taking good notes, so we'll have it for you. Anything else? I think we're done for the moment. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your time. Appreciate you having me. Thank you. Uh, this, uh, let me just wrap up the uh, hearing here. This has been a uh, hearing of the Committee of the Whole on um, basically on the fiscal year 2015 budget, Budget Request Act, Budget Support Act, and the revised 2014 budget, otherwise known as the supplemental. Um, Committees are marking up their budgets next week. They're scheduled for May 13th, 14th, and 15th. Uh, the uh, particular date or schedules are available on the Council's website. There may be some changes because that typically happens during the uh, markup week. Council will be meeting informally the following week at work session to uh, discuss various issues, and we are scheduled for first reading on the Fiscal Year Budget Request Act and first reading on the... Um, Fiscal Year 2015 Budget Support Act, and the only reading because it's an emergency on the Fiscal Year 2014 Revised Budget Request Adjustment Act. That's uh, May 28, 2014. I want to thank all the witnesses who testified today. The time is 5.52 in the afternoon, and this hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Chairman.